Uh, so, good morning, everybody. Um, I think we can start. Thanks a lot for coming. So today is, uh, as you can see, is the first edition of uh, this event that we call Toddify. So it's an event dedicated to decentralized finance, blockchain economics, and cryptocurrencies. Okay. Uh, so this event try to promote these. Uh, let's say, new field and the most recent advances uh, in the academic research. It's quite a challenging uh, area, both in terms of uh, theory, in terms of new data analysis, in terms of policy and regulation questions also that arise. So um, I would really thank and all the participants, so the speaker and discussant for uh, their availability. And um, yeah, so I will then uh, just give the floor to the main originator of this event, that is uh, Lorenzo Schoenleber, and uh, thank him for all the effort in the organization. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the Tour DeFi 2023. Um, I want, also want to take this occasion thanking the sponsors, um, Zero X, Tezos, Algorand, Pool Together, and Zcash. Who, for their generous support, they basically funded the whole conference. And um, in line, I also want to thank uh, Paolo Campolonghi and the staff to help me to uh, receive these kind of donations. It was not so straightforward since the college, you had to get a crypto wallet to receive some of these donations. And um, I also want to tell you a bit about the conference. So the conference is basically split into four parts. We have two sessions in the morning um, till lunch. <clears throat> then there's lunch. During lunch, there's a Q&A session for students. Um, I mean, for everybody, but it's mostly interesting, I guess, for students. So the sponsors, five of them, they will present in person and online about career opportunities when you, if you want to work in DeFi or blockchain companies. Mm -hmm. So this is a really good opportunity to network with them and to ask questions. And um, <clears throat> yeah, after the lunch break, we will have a session about CBDCs and the regulator's view from the Bank of Italy. And the conference will end with the best PhD paper award and a discussion about of the best paper award by Julien uh, here. Thanks a lot, Julien. I also want to thank you in... Uh, taking this chance to thank you for agreeing to discuss to have this extra work to present and to discuss a paper and um yeah so the con and the the presentation will be like one slot will be 40 minutes 25 minutes presentation 10 minutes discussion five minutes q a and we would like to as it's i mean most of you know that during the presentation please only ask quick clarifying questions let's not deviate into big discussions during the presentation time we have a lot of coffee breaks and q a sessions to address more complicated questions or to dive into this um yeah i think that's it yeah okay and as it should be for a good host i will open the conference and start with the first presentation today, um, which is a project I'm currently working on. Uh, there it is already. Let me check if that works. So, uh, co Pierre, can you hear us? I, I guess he's online. So, so the discussant of the first paper couldn't make it, unfortunately, um, but he will present online. Uh, he will discuss online. Anyway, um, so the paper I'm presenting today, and I'm starting the conference with, is called Maneuvering and Investing in Yield Farms. It's with Tom Lee and Andrew Pepper Nicolau from the US and Sittard Nike, who is also in, in the audience. And um, I want to start the presentation with a quote. So yield farming provides access to many who need, who need financial services, but whom traditional finance leaves behind. It provides users with rewards for staking capital or using a protocol. Any user can participate, staking any amount of any size, regardless of how small and receiving a proportional reward. So this is a quote from a book from Harvey about DeFi and the future of finance. And the presentation to, 
in my presentation today, I will basically, we want to demystify yield farming. We want to explain what does it mean, yield farming, what are the risks, what are the rewards, and how can investors or agents navigate through that. Yeah. So we focus on yield farming by liquidity provision. So assume you want to trade a stable coin, for example, DAI versus Ethereum or the other way around. What you could do is you could trade this on a SEX, a centralized exchange, or you can trade it on a DEX, a decentralized exchange. A decentralized exchange is, for example, cheaper. And what is a DEX? A DEX is a P2P trading platform. So basically, it's running on a blockchain and you can trade tokens in a decentralized way. The trading happens not in an order book. It happens in an, we buy an automated market maker. So basically, you have a um, you have an automated market maker which sets the price of the coins respect, with respect to some rule. This rule is known. And this trading happens in a liquidity pool. And the automated market maker basically governs the prices. So due to the decentralization, DeFi, basically anyone with funds, me, you, can become market makers, so to say, and we can provide liquidity. And this is basically yield farming by liquidity provision providing liquidity on a decentralized exchange. How do you earn from that? If you trade on an exchange as a trader, you have to pay fees and you as a liquidity provider, you get part of these fees. So you basically get a reward, you get some APY and the APY, APR, for example, is the fees which occur in the pool divided by the total value locked. So how big is the pool? So depending on your stake of this pool, you get the, the reward. So this is a picture of it. The trader wants to trade DAI versus Ethereum. He pays a fee for doing it. The liquidity provider, the left-hand side here, he stakes, he, put, he pledges, he provides liquidity, his, his tokens into the DEX, into the decentralized exchange. And at the end, he gets back tokens, not in the same proportion most likely, but he gets some trading free reward for providing liquidity. And while many papers focus on this side in DeFi, this paper explicitly or more is rather focused on the left side here, on the liquidity provider. What does he do? How can he navigate this kind of new technology? Yeah, so this is liquidity provision by, uh, this is yield farming by liquidity provision. There are many other ways this focus really on that. And the literature is growing. Today, we will hear more about this. And um, they're not in there yet. But it's a lot about literature on tokens, token valuation, or it's about DEX versus SEX. So how is market efficiency looking like on different kind of platforms? We also contribute to the literature on transaction costs for portfolio management. And um, yeah, I will show you that in a bit. So what is the main contribution of the paper? It's basically, first of all, we want to explain and demystify yield farming. So what is it? I mean, I just gave you an introduction. We want to quantify transaction cost returns and risks using historical on-chain data from two major decentralized exchanges, which is Curve and Uniswap. Curve is one of the major decks for uh, stable coins and Uni Uniswap is basically for any Ethereum kind of token. And um, yeah, so there's an empirical part, and then we develop, and I show you the mathematical framework in continuous time where we, at the end, solve an optimization for an agent, how to invest in these kind of, uh, in this, in a yield farm, how to recompound. Our model is quite flexible. We have a derivation of the impermanent loss, which is the major risk driver in yield farming. And this optimization leads to the optimal portfolio allocation for an agent. And we thereby resemble yield farming, um, the investment process, basically. Okay, so let me revisit this. I want to basically point out two major differences of DeFi versus traditional finance. And this, the first one is that, as you know, in traditional finance, basically, interest rates or interests are continuously compounded. I mean, not continuously, but 
on a, on a monthly basis. So if you earn interest on your bank account in your bank, you get interest after a month and these are automatically credited and the next month you get interest on interest. I mean, we all know that this is the interest on interest. In DeFi, this does not automatically apply. Basically, in order to increase the interest rate bearing capital, you have to claim the rewards and you have to put them back into the liquidity pool. So um, we call this kind of action recompounding. And this is debated also online. So the compounding interest does not apply automatically. Saying that, in DeFi, every action also needs to be verified by the blockchain, by the decentralized um, consensus mechanism. So basically, whenever you do something on a blockchain, you have to pay for it. And these transaction costs or these fees are fixed. Fixed in a sense, they're independent of how much you transfer or how much you do. Um, these transaction costs are called gas fees. So basically, one and two, so these two points... They describe a trade-off because obviously you would like to increase the nominal in your pool or the, the one you get interest paid on to get more interest, but you need to pay transaction costs for this. And the transaction costs, as I show you later, they're not little. So this is the trade-off and these are the, basically the two main differences compared to traditional finance, that you have this not recompounding automatically and transaction costs. So this is a motivational figure. In if you assume compounding interests like e to the like exponential function kind of um how do you call it um yeah continuously compounded you get like that the the orange line is like not compounded so you could just get a coupon let's say and then the agent can basically decide to recompound he, they pay a transaction cost here so you have less but therefore in the long run you have more and that's exactly describing the trade-off an agent is facing <clears throat> as a motivation. What are the risks? So there are many risks. There are risks of scam and um, smart contract risk and so on. The major risk, though, in, in, in yield farming is impermanent loss. And it basically describes the, <clears throat> the opportunity costs. So it's always with respect to a benchmark between providing liquidity or holding the tokens. So it means basically if you experience impermanent loss, that the gains from buy and hold the tokens were higher than pledging them into the liquidity pool. Why does that happen? Because in the liquidity pool, the, the price is governed by a rule. And if prices diverge outside the pool, the traders will enter the pool and will arbitrage or will swap tokens in a way that it makes sense for them and what you end up having is a different ratio of the tokens because in the pool everything is quoted in tokens not in dollars let's say so basically just by providing liquidity with these rules which are governed by the price or the price governs this you will experience some impermanent loss um, yeah, so basically it means that you underperform a basic buy and hold strategy. And we are working on this even like in more detail now. The paper is not there yet, but I mean, it is a draft, but it's not online yet. But this is the major risk in yield farming is called impermanent loss. So now let me show you a bit of data. So quickly, um, we have daily historical APYs and transaction costs on curve from 2020 to 2022 on the six major liquidity pools on stable coins. And then we have Uniswap, the largest 100 pools over from 2005 to 2022. Um, we use this, we, we obtain this data via the graph. The graph is an indexing protocol to access blockchain, to, ex to access uh, chain data, and you can query data like SQL type of, um, in a SQL type of fashion. Coin data we get from CoinMarketCap or CoinGecko. So let's start with, with uh, curve stable coins. So this is the average, the curve pool. This is a, a pool, a an artificial pool we basically created. It's the average of these six pools in terms of APY. And I will show you the same plot in terms of um, transaction costs. 
and you see the API dynamics, they were really high. They're actually at the moment low. I mean, now they're increasing again, but you see on average, you get like um, four to five, yeah, 4% 4 of APY and you have a huge volatility in this APY. So APY is the reward you get when staking liquidity annualized. So let's take a look at the transaction costs though. Transaction costs, they are on average like $25 for pledging liquidity into this pool. So for providing liquidity to write on the blockchain, you basically need to pay on average $25. And you see that on bad days, you also pay almost $140. So this, um, coming back to the quote at the beginning, it's for everybody and so on. Uh, yeah, we can argue about that. Transaction costs are really a determinant of this whole thing, and they are quite substantial. What about the impermanent loss? The impermanent loss is in the basis point ranges here. And here, as you can see, on average, it's really low. So for stable coins, and this makes sense for stable coins, the impermanent loss is really little, it's negligible. So 10 basis points on average, but still you have some outliers here. <clears throat> so this was for stable coins, you see low APYs, transaction costs substantial, low risk as well. Now let me show you Uniswap where you can basically um, swap any Ethereum kind of token, not only stable coins. And you see here the impermanent loss is a different story now. We have on average 8% impermanent loss annualized, and it can go up up to 30%. So the for non-stable coin pairs, this impermanent loss is large, and this is also why yield farming is risky, basically, or it's one reason with extreme values of 30%. So you see here on the left hand side, this is the gross APY. So it's the APY you get without considering impermanent loss. And if you subtract the impermanent loss, you get the net APY. And you can see that the net APY can also become negative. So yield farming is not necessarily a profitable strategy, let's say. Um, it is on the first glimpse, but if you look at the risks, and this impermanent loss is one risk you're facing. Um, you can see that you can also experience a negative return, so to say. So yield farming is risky. And also, if you look at the correlation among these APYs, they're mostly positive, but there are also some negative correlations, which we identified. So this is about the data, more or less. How much time do I have? 10 minutes, okay. Now I want to show you the mathematical framework we developed, and we are then carrying this on. So as I, as I said at the beginning, and I unfortunately don't have time to, to, ex, to explain this in super large, um, in extremely detailed, but basically in these in this automated market makers, in these liquidity pools, the, the price is governed by a rule. The rule is here in most cases, or in many cases, it was the constant product rule. So basically you have a K, which is fixed, it's set, and then N1 and N2 are the numbers of tokens, the amounts of the tokens, and they're multiplied and you have the square root. So basically, the price of a token in the pool can be quoted via this equation, and one token can be quoted in terms of another token. So that's how the automated market maker kind of works. And if you decrease one, one token by some amount, the other one has to compensate for it. So this equation has always to be true. From this rule, you can basically back out some simple, some, sim, so some preliminary equations. For example, the relative price, as I just said, that's token two per token one. Or you can also do the absolute price, where you assume that the dollar per token one divided by the do dollar per token two, that's the ratio here you're facing. So this is really the, that's how the AMM works. And now the question is, how do we model this to obtain some insights? And we start with modeling the prices of the token. So we assume that these two tokens, for example, if you have two tokens, typically that they follow a geometric pony in motion with some drift and some diffusion. And um, we then apply Ito's lemma 
to obtain the ratio, one can show that the ratio is again a Brownian motion, and we can then write the dynamics of the number of tokens in this pool with respect to the rules and this ratio we derived. So here I'm, I'm, I'm not showing all the equations because it's a it's, it's a lot of Ito's lemma basically, but you have this sigma the tilde here which comes in here, which is basically the variance of the first token plus the variance of the second token minus two times the covariance. And you um, and this will be important also for later. Okay, but we start AMM, we have the rule, we then take assume that the tokens follow a geometric Brownian motion, and we can already calculate some quantities here. Then in the paper, we show that how can we express the impermanent loss? And the impermanent loss can be written as value staked minus value hold over value staked. So this is, as I said, what is it? Is it better or worse than a buy and hold strategy? And we show in the paper using what is staked, what is held, and so on, using DNDP, that this impermanent loss can be written as minus sigma square over eight, where the sigma square is that what I just explained to you. So it's first of all always negative, which is the main which is one of the main results, and and this is also intuitive. I mean, this is also if you think about it, it's intuitively correct that the impermanent loss is basically characterized by this sigma tilde. So it's higher; it's more negative for high variances or for high negative correlation. And this is what you, if you ever deal with yield farming, if the tokens in the pool diverge a lot especially in the opposite direction you ex you, uh, you experience the highest impermanent loss so you, what you don't like or how can you basically set this to zero it's basically zero if the if the variance of the tokens is really low which is exactly for example the case for stable coins stable coins have a low low variances so you have a low you experience a low impermanent loss so this is one of the main results, and we are able to characterize the impermanent loss here. Then we study a portfolio problem, which is kind of this PL, the gross profit is the reward from staking tokens into this pool plus the change in the stake tokens. This is kind of the impermanent loss, taking care of the impermanent loss, because what you get out if you enter the, the pool might not be the same as what you staked at the beginning. And we show that this PNL can be written as this kind of problem. So basically, the APY is reduced by this impermanent loss, what I just derived. And we have some stochastic term, which displays or which mimics the risk. We then solve this, or we then assume that the APY can be driven by some um, OU process. So we have a mean reverting process. We take the exponential of that because, the, as I showed you, the APY, the gross APY, is always positive. So the exponential of that will be always positive, and the <clears throat> and the the portfolio will be the what we have in the in the wallet plus what we have staked. So K here de denotes the process of the wallet and it changes due to the interests we earn. So basically we stake. So we get whatever is staked times A times the interest. That's what increases our wallet. And then we have two controls. So we can decide to recompound something or to withdraw something. So that's one process, the wallet. And then we have the staked account. So what is staked in the pool? And this is basically we have um what is in the pool the impermanent loss here and then what we what we recompound or withdrawal and if we decide to recompound or to withdraw anything from the pool we have to pay transaction costs so we pay transaction cost c whenever we do an action basically and then we have this risk term which is coming from the impermanent loss from the changes of the tokens basically so this is kind of the setting we are working on, and this resembles the yield farming problem of an agent, he, which is which is trying to optimize his utility, which is the next slides. We then basically roll out everything in a stochastic control problem, 
and the agent wants to maximize the expectation of the utility over k and s and the controls he has is again the recompounding do i recompound how much do i recompound or do i withdraw from the wallet or the pool and again the trade-off is you face impermanent loss you have um you you want to increase s because on s you get paid your interest in the pool you you get interest you get apy but therefore you also face transaction costs when you do so uh, we select this utility function because we can then substitute some state variable that's what we have at the moment and um, yeah we then apply the standard techniques HDB equation we solve that and the first kind of result which we derive from that which is also in line with the intuition is that we obtain kind of a bang bang type of control as in Davis and Norman which means if you decide to recompound you recompound the maximum amount you have this is w bar w bar is the upper bound of the control and this makes sense right you have a problem with fixed transaction costs so if you decide to put in more money you will put the maximum amount you have because you pay the same transaction costs anyway but we show this also here uh, formally that this is the optimal control and the same for withdrawal if you decide to pay transaction costs to do something you do the maximum amount also for the withdrawal so it's optimal to compound either everything or nothing yeah and in the paper we also extend this to multiple pools so not just one so what i just showed you one was just one pool i have two minutes okay so we then we have the model we model this we we, we um we take the data to 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 calibrate everything the parameters and what i then can show you is so this is the optimal w bar and um the optimal w so compounding or withdrawal of the pool depending on the initial amount you have and the apy so basically here you would always decide to recompound at the beginning so we have three years of horizon and you get this trading regions which are kind of similar to in the Davis and, Davis and Norman paper as you can see at the beginning it's always optimal to recompound so you always put more money into the pool while later you do either nothing or you start to withdraw some something from the pool so at the end close to terminal you basically only do nothing or you take out something of the pool and um also, if you change transaction costs, so in the base case, we have like $10, you see the recompounding with increasing transaction costs is basically getting less and less. So you do less action if transaction costs increase. So the model is kind of uh, consistent with the intuition. On Uniswap, we get qualitatively similar results. It's just the large impermanent loss gives lower recompounding regions. Um, we also do it for two pools. And here you see at the beginning, you always recompound in both pools. And as time goes by, you then jump into one pool or the other. You only recompound one of the pools. And at the end, you recompound nothing. So the, the framework is also flexible for more than one pool. Okay, so let me sum up. So in the paper, we basically demystify yield farming. I hope you have a better understanding of what it is now. We took Curve and Uniswap as data. We, we took data from Curve and Uniswap to give you some concrete numbers here about APYs like returns, risk, and transaction costs. Mm -hmm. And then we developed the mathematical framework, which I could only explain here briefly, obviously, to model returns and to derive the major source of risk, which is the impermanent loss. We then resemble the yield farming pro, pro the yield farming pro a problem, and um, it reveals basically. Our framework then reveals the optimal agent's decision in yield farming, and it's basically the trade-off between putting increasing the interests or pay and paying transaction costs for it. And it's in line with the economic intuition from the pictures you saw. And there are many more results in the paper. And um, now I'm looking forward to hear Co-Pierre's discussion. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me?
Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Lorenzo? Can you hear me? Ah, no, you can. Yeah. Okay, very good. Good morning, everybody. I wish I could have been with you, but much like uh, Silvergate, I had to be contained to prevent contagion in the crypto community. Um, so I have to give my remarks online, which is a pity because I was really looking forward to the conference because the organizers have put together a fantastic program. And I hope I can add some value by sharing my thoughts on, uh, on Lorenzo's paper, which I thought was extremely interesting. So let me just see if I can go into full screen mode here. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay, fantastic. So uh, thanks so much uh, for giving me the opportunity to present the paper. And I, I want to give a very like three point summary because um, the paper does three things that together are really, really nice. Uh, as Lorenzo said, the first thing is they explain yield farming by liquidity provision. That is a service uh, to the entire community. And uh, I, like, I knew about uh, yield farming and liquidity provision, but so sort of going through this with the rigor that they do in the paper is really quite nice because it clarifies so many things. Once you've sort of clarified what it is and what you can do, then they take the next step and they operationalize this. They quantify the returns, the risks, and the transaction cost as the sort of three main drivers of decisions um, whether you should recompound. And then they take both of these things and really drive it home by developing a nice, very intuitive model of, of reinvestment in, in liquidity pools. And once you're done with this whole exercise, not only have you learned uh, sort of when to recompound, but you end up with a really practical framework that um, people can use to actually make these decisions. Um, because of the numerical implementation. So I think this is a really nice contribution overall. Um, and I want to drill a little deeper into, into some of the, the results. So the, the core insight that I took at least from the paper is that it's optimal for the agent to either uh, recompound everything or nothing. The bang bang controls that, that Lorenzo mentioned. And then the paper goes further and says, well, you know, when to recompound depends on the staked amount, the APY and the transaction costs. And in fact, we can show you for which parameter, uh, for which part of the parameter space you should recompound or fully withdraw. That's fantastic. So that great. So that's something that you can take away from the paper. And then it ends up in, in really nice intuitive figures like this one, where you have the difference between the, the, the WT and the VT, which is the token amount that is recompounded back into the, uh, in, into the liquidity pool and the token amount that is taken out of the liquidity pool. So whenever you have something here in the red, um, it means that you're recompounding. Whenever you have something blue, it means that you are, uh, that you are taking uh, everything out. Uh, the only small thing that's, uh, that tripped me up is that the scale is the other way than I would have expected it. But, you know, never mind that. And then they sort of, they look at what happens as time goes on and they show this um, for, uh, for, the, um, for the APY basically and for the amount staked. So you can see sort of for, for low staking amounts at the beginning of time, it's always optimal um, to, to fully sort of put everything in. As time goes on, it becomes optimal to, to take everything out. So that's nice. So that's the, the, the first sort of key result really in the paper. And I, I want to sort of go a little further into the reasons why we have this result. And the, the biggest comment, I'm sure you've heard this before, is, is this just a transaction cost story? So here's, here's why I think this is so, so important. You have these results where you fix the time and then you vary the transaction cost. That's the graphs, the graphs here. Um, so as you vary the transaction cost, as you increase transaction costs, you can see that, the, so this is for very low transaction costs. You have you know, large areas where it's optimal to withdraw, large areas where it's optimal to, to recompound. Fine, great. Um, so, but then you vary the transaction cost as it goes up eventually you'll end up actually really quickly in, in, a, in a realm where um, 
where you shouldn't make any any change. Um, so as transaction costs go up, the recompounding the the area where you recompound goes down. So if you now look at the transaction cost for the curve, this is sort of the artificial um, equally weighted average pool that they created from the data. If you look at the transaction costs um, for this, there's an average transaction cost, but the average really doesn't tell the whole story um, for, for this because of the volatility. So there's uh, large periods where there's very high transaction costs for reasons that are exogenous to the liquidity provision in that, in that pool. Um, and then the, the authors find in the paper, and I, for me, that was really a, a key sort of key insight um, that you can only get from an, you know, quantitative exercise like the authors did. The insight is that in order to recompound facing transaction costs of 15 US dollars, the agent would require a large compensation of the APY being at least 25%. So even for just 15 US dollars transaction costs, you need an APY of at least 25%. The, the average transaction cost is uh, is over 20, uh, $25, I think. So th there's like 10%, 15% number of days in the sample where the transaction cost was lower than this 15 US dollar, roughly, whatever the exact numbers are. When you then look at the APY for the curve protocol, and you think back to this at least 25%, it's never 25%. Even for sort of the the lower days transaction costs that we have, let alone all those days with really really high transaction costs. So for me, the main question that I took from this is, why do we see any recompounding in practice? What is sort of the the thing that is I don't want to say missing from the model, but what is the difference between the model and the and, and practice where we do see some recompounding? And then since the authors have the recompounding information i believe because from the data you see whenever somebody sends like draws that like, takes money out of the pool sends money back into the pool you can all of, see all of this on chain well does the recompounding figures match those observed in the data if so how well for me as sort of any as someone really interested in this in this field that would be the single biggest question i think it's a really great opener for this for this conference and that gets me to the second comment I want to make, which is what, what is the right comparison? There's this nice little paper by Campbell, Tarun Ramadorai, and Ranish um, on Indian and uh, in stock investors, where, where they say, we find that investors on directly held stocks generate slower growth of account value for small investors than for larger investors, because small Indian investors are poorly diversified. So diversification is really key in wealth creation, in value creation. So for me, the question is, what if the agent actually wouldn't just withdraw from the liquidity pool, but actually sell all their tokens, get out of this whole crypto thing altogether and invest in a boring old fiat ETF? So that's the, the bigger question for me really is, should you even invest in a liquidity um, pool in, in, in DeFi? I think this is why this paper is such a nice opening for the conference, because it seems like this is like really the first order question that that should be answered and that the paper can, can answer. But then the comparison isn't just with the withdrawing, it's with the opportunity cost of investing in a fiat ETF. For me, that would be the right comparison. In fact, thinking back of Lorenzo's figure earlier um, with the compounding versus the withdrawing and recompounding, um, the return on the, uh, on the liquidity pool always is below the compounding, uh, the compound interest. So, should you even invest in DeFi? And the answer is probably not. And then lastly, just very briefly, um, third comment is which risks to include? Um, you include the, the impermanent loss, and I understand that this is a major driver for, um, for Uniswap. But for the Curve protocol, I would argue that uh, token price risks and stablecoin failures are just as big of a, of a risk. And in fact, we don't have to argue. You could just quantify it. We know how many stable coins there are. We know how many of them have failed. Uh, we know when they deviate from their from their peg because USDC, for example, deviated from from its peg not so long ago. Um, these are real risks that you could quantify, just as much as cybersecurity risks. And my feeling is that these risks 
um, will be significant for curve, even if impermanent loss isn't significant or isn't isn't very big. But that means that the question I raised in the beginning in comment one will be even more more prevalent. So I'm I'm going to end here um, with with some some small comments um, that we can go into in the in the Q and I. I don't want to take too much time from the from the audience. Uh, I thought it's a really interesting paper because it, it helps me understand one of the key things that I've been wondering about. Should I uh, invest in, uh, in a liquidity pool, yes or no? And after reading the paper, I think I understand sort of what the trade-offs are. I can gauge my risk aversion and that gives me uh, sort of enough tools to make that decision. So that's a fantastic contribution. Um, yeah, thanks for letting me discuss the paper. So thanks, <clears throat> thanks a lot, Kubier. Uh, so, uh, Lorenzo, you want to maybe answer, no? Yeah, thank you, Kopier, for the great discussion. I think you pointed out super relevant um, things. And yes, the transaction costs sensitivity is is existing. Um, and there are also papers showing that yield farming agents are basically return chasing, um, not rational agents. So. One thing we are working at the moment on is exactly doing this analysis. When do they recompound and how much and so on. It's just a lot of data work getting the, the wallets and so on. But this is certainly an interesting um, idea. And um, what else did you say? Um, yeah, the kind of mismatch with the APYs, transaction costs, and so on. So yes, the transaction costs are basically decreased, are decreased a lot over time. So we have a lower medium, like value for that as it is historically. Same do APYs though. So yes, from a rational standpoint, our model would basically say you almost never invest. But saying that, we also said the S, like the amount you have to a, a number, which is like retailer, like $1,000, $2,000. Obviously, if you increase S, and maybe we should also demonstrate that in the paper to have like $10,000, $20,000, Transaction costs are obviously less relevant, then you might not care about $25 anymore. So this is really the standpoint of a retailer here. And obviously, if you also set transaction costs to, a, to zero, you basically recompound all the time. But yes, this is something we should mention. The cybersecurity risk, yeah, we put it in the appendix, but it might be worth to put it back into the main part of the paper. It's just more difficult to quantify it than the yes. permanent costs. But yeah, I agree with most of the, I agree with your uh, comments and um, thanks again for the discussion. Okay, thanks both. So, is there any question from the audience? Please. It's, it's maybe a super basic question, but I'm, I'm wondering um, why, like, is there anything technical that prevents recompounding automatically? Why, why, why is it just that recompounding that block? Why do they have to explain this? And that's also crazy. I'm, I'm just struggling on seeing if there's something that's just an implementation issue, should say, that, that could be fixed, or is this something in or, or is this something inherent to the to, to, to blockchain based training per se? So as far as I know, is that Yes, it is. It is a technical technical issue. But now they're also like I saw some protocols working on auto recompounding mechanisms. Mm -hmm. So yes, I think in a few years so it's this could might be possible to, yes. to just somehow yes, okay. or you just go to a really cheap to cheaper blockchains. I mean, this everything is on Ethereum. Yeah. It's expensive, yeah. but there are already cheaper blockchains out there. But there is not much volume on these. So yeah. But right. yes, mm -hmm. there are auto compounding functions. Maybe the last one. Uh, thank you. Very, very interesting presentation. Um, now, related to the question, the discussion question about uh, should we invest in DeFi, uh, it seems uh, would be useful to understand a bit more uh, what are the determinants uh, of uh, of the returns that you you get in um, in, in yield farming. So not just uh, quantifying the returns, but also understanding the determinants. For example. Uh, the interesting question would be, is there a risk return trade-off uh, in, uh, in this market? And if you look, for example, the last uh, uh, few months of uh, 2022, 
it looks like uh, the API is very low, but there is a, a very large uh, impairment loss. So it seems uh, that uh, uh, there is a bit of disconnection there. Um, if you look at your charts, uh, especially the last few months of uh, 2022. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, one more question. Thanks. Uh, hi, uh, my question is about uh, uh, Uniswap v3. Uh, that uh, um, it works differently now. So, what do you think uh, the new approach of uh, Uniswap v3, where you can set the limit to avoid the impairment uh, loss? Yeah, we had a discussion about that actually yesterday. So, in the paper, we do not consider this. We just take the average, so to say. We do not control or consider this this bands you can set basically to do have this concentrated liquidity in the paper it's not considered because it would complicate it a lot actually the mathematics um what i think in general i think it's 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 becoming the new standard but i'm not too deep into it but what i read and what we discussed i it's it has high potential uh, so now um uniswap like approach with the Stablecoin is uh, the, the safer, uh, as far as, as I understand. The concentrated liquidity? Uh, I mean, if you want to avoid the impermanent loss, uh, if you use the pools with the stable coins, uh, yeah, it's the safer approach to have uh, yes. the, the good parts and not... Uh, yeah, they, the... With stable coins, you typically, as I showed you, you experience less impermanent loss. But, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so thanks again to Lorenz and Copier. We should go ahead. So, um, so the next speaker is uh, Ganesh Vizbanathan Natrai from War Business School. We're going to talk about interest rate in uh, DeFi lending protocols. Thank you. I, I I think they are they are preparing it. Great. Um. So thank you for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. Uh. So this is a project uh, joined with Amit, uh, and Roman. Um. So Roman's my colleague, and Amit um is works for Polygon. Okay. So um the subject of this paper is on DeFi lending protocols, and lending protocols offer a different way um of sort of intermediation to regular banking right so the main idea is through this idea of collateralized lending which is in contrast to banks that typically use credit scores so um the idea of collateralized lending is that it's regulated by smart contracts and so essentially these smart contracts you can think of as kind of code that's executed on the blockchain and that it basically um enforces a contract where you can only borrow up to a limit, right? So if you say deposit collateral in one currency, um, then you can borrow a fraction of that collateral in another currency, right? And so essentially what happens is that um, everyone who borrows in lending protocols are effectively supplying uh, liquidity in, in another currency. So in terms of how the protocol manages itself, Probably the most interesting thing that we focus on in this paper are the way interest rates are set. So interest rates are basically set algorithmically and through these uh, interest rate rules, which are set by the governance. So essentially, interest rates um, are going to vary by utilization, which is the fraction of assets that are borrowed in the protocol. But there are also many other parameters that are regulated by the protocol, such as uh, what's the maximum amount that you can borrow of a token um, is also these leverage limits are also uh, parameters that you can vote on. 
Okay, so there are two questions um, that we talk about. So the first question is thinking about the cross-sectional variation in interest rates. So why some interest rates are typically higher than others. And so as a general uh, rule, in, um, we find that stablecoin interest rates, say in USDC, Tether, and DAI, are typically higher than interest rates on riskier cryptocurrencies like ETH. And this difference in interest rates tends to correlate with the market. So in when the market is in a bull phase, typically these interest rate differences are higher and then they compress uh, during the bear phase of the market. And we also find um, there's a correlation between uh, interest rates, uh, differences and futures premia. And so this is essentially um, kind of speaks to interest rate parity because interest rate parity is essentially these conditions that relate interest rate differences between currencies and, and the futures uh, premia on these currencies. Okay, so this is essentially uh, fact one. Um, so basically we find that the interest rates uh, for Tether, DAI and USDC are typically much higher than the interest rates on ETH, Bit, uh, RAP, Bitcoin and ZRX. Um, so essentially there is this interest rate uh, difference between stable coins and riskier cryptocurrencies and that this interest rate difference has been uh, declining um, in the latter half of the sample. So we find that there's some evidence of a reversal uh, in interest rates in 2022. And that's uh, in line with uh, sort of a bear market in, in the crypto, uh, riskier cryptocurrencies. Um, so in terms of connecting it to futures premium, um, we have that uh, essentially the futures premium um, correlates positively with the uh, interest rate difference. So on the vertical axis, uh, in the vertical axis, we have essentially the interest rate difference and the horizontal axis, we have the futures premium. And so essentially there is this correlation between uh, interest rate differences and futures premia. And so the, the motivation of this is that we identify futures premia as essentially evidence of speculative trading, right? So when there is essentially a premium on ETH Tether futures, then essentially there's expectations that ETH will appreciate. And this is going to lead to um, more borrowing of stable coins in the lending protocol. So I'll explain why uh, shortly, but essentially this, this excess borrowing of stable coins in the protocol translates to higher interest rates on stable coins. And so that's why we find that higher futures premia leads to a higher uh, stable coin interest rates. Okay, so um, in terms of the questions, we, we're thinking about the cross section of interest rates. Um, what are the sources of risk? Um, what are some arbitrage conditions like uh, carbon interest rate parity? So we'll talk a bit about kind of how um, carbon interest rate parity should essentially force a link between futures premia and interest rates. And then uh, our main sort of message of the paper is trying to link the interest rates to speculative beliefs of investors. Okay, so um, this is how we th think that interest rate pro or these lending protocols can fuel speculative trading. Right, so essentially um, we have a two types of positions that an investor could take using a lending protocol. The first type of position is a long leverage position. And here um, the investor would deposit ETH collateral, um, borrow a fraction as stable coins, and then use those stable coins to buy ETH in the secondary market. So essentially, we call this taking a long leverage position on ETH. Co conversely, uh, an investor can also take a short leverage position. So a short leverage position is you will deposit a stable coin. Um, you will then borrow a fraction as ETH and then sell ETH in the secondary market. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with short selling in equities. So essentially, this is the equivalent of, of, of short selling. 
Okay, so in terms of uh, data uh, to test um, sort of the speculative trading, uh, we have data from Compound, which is the second largest uh, lending protocol. Um, Aave is, is the largest. And we have essentially aggregate data on borrowing and lending and interest rates for each currency. Um, then to link it to the futures premia, we have uh, spot uh, and futures data. Um, and perpetual futures we have for the ETH tether pair. And we use the perpetual futures um, mainly because one issue with uh, interest rate protocols is there's no term structure, right? So we wanted a very uh, essentially perpetual futures, um, as the funding rate on perpetual futures expire every eight hours. And so we can essentially hone in on a very short time interval for our analysis. Okay, so um, just some facts on the uh, lending protocol. So essentially, the lending protocol allows you to deposit um, many different types of collateral um, and borrow multiple currencies as well. So it's in, in a sense, it, it allows you to deposit ETH, uh, Tether, uh, USDC, and at the same time, you can borrow uh, in multiple currencies as well. Um, there is no term structure and interest rates are floating. So essentially, uh, whatever interest borrowing and lending rates are essentially accrued in block time. And um, the interesting feature of these lending protocols is that the interest rate is algorithmic, right? So, so the interest rate on borrowing and lending are going to be a function of utilization U where utilization is the essentially the fraction of an asset that is borrowed, right? So if, for example, you have uh, 1 billion worth of ETH deposited in the pool and you have 800 million borrowed, then that's utilization of 0.8. So essentially, um, the higher the utilization, the higher the interest rates. And so that's going to essentially be the driving force uh, behind the understanding interest rates, because essentially, um, if there's a lot of long leverage positions, then you will be borrowing a lot of sta in stable coins, and that will drive up utilization of stable coins, and that will drive up stable coin interest rates. Okay, so this is uh, essentially how these interest rate rules look like um, using the data. So essentially on the horizontal axis, we've got the utilization rate, so again, this is the fraction of the asset that is borrowed. And then on the vertical axis, we have the interest uh, borrowing rate. And so essentially the interest rates are uh, positively related to utilization. We also have this kink parameter here. So that, um, that kink parameter is essentially uh, coming from when utilization goes past some threshold level. And uh, the interest rate rules become steeper once you go past the threshold. And this is essentially, uh, think of this as a way for the protocol to in essentially ensure against uh, liquidation risk, where liquidations are going to be more likely when utilization is very high. Okay, so um, to motivate our empirical uh, test, we, we have a model. And the idea is to have uh, two currencies. We have a stable currency and a risky currency. And then we have two investor types. We have optimistic and pessimistic investors. And so the idea behind the setup is that we are going to have optimistic and pessimistic investors taking long and short positions in the lending protocol, right? And so essentially we will have... Uh, equilibrium sort of interest rates on the protocol. And in addition, we have a futures block where instead of taking your speculative positions in a lending protocol, you can uh, use futures to take your speculative positions. And you can also take long or short positions in futures. And so what we will find is there will be a relationship between the interest rates of the lending protocol and then the futures uh, premium um, through this interest rate parity conditions. 
And how we know that there will be a link between these two markets is that if there were to be a huge discrepancy between the pricing of futures premia and interest rates, then arbitrageurs would step in to make uh, carbon interest rate parity profits. Okay, so um, essentially we have uh, the wealth process for optimists and pessimists. So again, optimists are going to uh, deposit um, the risky currency as collateral and borrow stable coins, right? So essentially um, this is the profits that the optimists will make. Um, the unstable coin instead, uh, sorry, the pessimist will instead uh, deposit this, the stable coin and borrow uh, the risky currency. So that uh, WP tilde is the pessimist uh, wealth accumulation. And both are mean variance uh, investors. So this, this um, slide here is just summarizing the interest rate rules. So here we have a very stylized interest rate rule following uh, the compound protocol. Of course, interest rate rules can vary by protocols, but uh, for tractability, we, we use the compound version where uh, the utilization is just a linear function of the uh, amount uh, borrowed. Um, so, so essentially, so the sorry, the interest rates are linear function of utilization. So, once we get the optimal, um, once we derive the optimal holdings of uh, stablecoin and risky currency uh, in the protocol, then that allows us to calculate utilization, and then we can calculate the interest rates uh, on the protocol, which are functions of utilization. Okay, so um, this is our equilibrium uh, demand uh, by the optimists and pessimists. So here, um, optimists are going to deposit more ETH uh, collateral when, uh, oh, sorry, optimists are going to borrow more stable coins when they think that the price of ETH is going up. Pessimists are going to uh, borrow more ETH when they think that the price of ETH is going down, right? So essentially their functions are going to be based on these speculative beliefs. Um, and we can derive the interest rate difference between the stable coin and the risky currency as a function of these speculative beliefs, right? So this P bar is essentially capturing um, the average of the optimist and pessimistic beliefs on the on the currency. And we also have this additional term in the interest rate wedge that's essentially a risk premium. Now, these, this P bar is not observable, right? So essentially, this, this P bar is essentially the, ag, um, think of it as the expectation, uh, valuated expectation of the optimistic and pessimistic beliefs but we can proxy for it using the futures market. So in the futures block, we have um, essentially the, the utility of the optimist and pessimist. Now here, um, the utility of the optimist is essentially based on uh, payoffs of long futures contracts. So essentially they make uh, positive payoffs when the price goes up. Whereas the utility of the pessimists is when they take short uh, futures contracts. And we then can derive uh, this optimal demand, uh, phi O and phi P of the long and short positions. And in, if the market clearing condition holds, uh, then we have essentially a relationship between the P bar, so essentially this average of optimistic and pessimistic beliefs and the futures uh, rate. And this delta is essentially um, the, uh, uh, what we call a funding rate. And this funding rate is specific to perpetual futures that I will um, discuss in the empirical evidence. But you can think of this funding rate as essentially uh, a rate 
paid by long position holders to short position holders. So the funding rate is effectively, um, it will correlate with the futures uh, premium. Now, um, before I show kind of the test rule implications, one important thing in the model is that if the lending protocol and the futures uh, markets deviate too much from each other, then arbitrageurs have an incentive to make an, an, uh, a trade between the markets, right? So for example, one strategy could be to deposit the stable coin into a lending protocol and borrow the unstable asset and simultaneously enter a long futures contract. Um, so that is if, for example, um, the futures premium are too low relative to the interest rates. Um, alternatively, if the futures premium are overpriced too much, then you could buy the risky asset and deposit uh, into the DeFi protocol and simultaneously enter a short futures contract. So if the futures premium are too high relative to the interest rates in the, in the lending protocol. So this will create these arbitrage bounds. And so um, for tractability, the testable implications I will show now uh, when these arbitrage bounds are satisfied, right? So essentially, um, if we assume that our futures premium uh, within these arbitrage bounds, then uh, essentially there's integration between uh, the lending protocol and uh, the futures market. Now, so assuming that the arbitrage bounds are satisfied, we can derive a relationship between the interest rate difference between the stable coin and the risky cryptocurrency and the futures premium, right? And so essentially this is saying that the interest rates on lending protocols essentially um, correlate with futures premia. And so therefore um, they are essentially a function of speculative trading on, on lending protocols, right? And um, there are some, a couple of other terms there. The, the funding premium, as I mentioned, this delta is essentially uh, a, interest rate paid uh, by long uh, futures holders to short futures holders. So that funding rate also has a uh, correlation with the interest rate difference. And then we have this risk premium term. So um, essentially the higher the wealth of optimists, uh, all else equal, we should expect a lower interest rate difference. Um, the second implication is the UIP condition. So UIP is basically trying to link expected returns on the asset to the interest rate difference, right? So expected returns is going to be a function of the futures premia and also a function of the interest rate difference. Um, one key sort of uh, thing to note is that it depends on kind of the expected mispricing. So if for example, the, the actual expected price deviates a lot from the P bar, which is the average of the optimistic and pessimistic beliefs, that mispricing will affect the UIP coefficient. But if uh, phi is zero, then we have exactly the UIP uh, regression, which is that the expected return on ETH should just be a function of the futures premium and, and also the interest rate uh, differences. Okay, so um, now to the empirical evidence. So the first thing we want to verify is to what extent are the CIP arbitrage bounds uh, satisfied? So here the CIP condition um, consists of the futures premium, this funding rate and the interest rate wedge between uh, the stable coin and, and ETH. And Based on our model, we can construct these arbitrage bounds on the CIP wedge. And we can also account for gas fees as well. So the main um, sort of impediment to doing the CIP arbitrage would be gas fees uh, on the lending protocol. So we have to adjust our lower and upper bounds uh, by the gas fees. So when we do that, we find that um, indeed, our CIP deviations, though very large, 
So I should say that um, the funding interval is eight hours, right? So that delta is paid every eight hours. So that's why we use eight hours as our time horizon. And so we can see actually CIP deviations can be really large. They can be uh, go up to 100 basis points within an eight hour interval. So, so quite sizable. But um, when we look at transaction cost, we find that our CIP deviations are generally within the transaction cost uh, boundaries. So in other words, that after you account for transaction costs, there are very few violations uh, of the CIP wedge. So we can kind of more formally test the uh, deviations from CIP. Um, so gas fees, as I mentioned, are a big uh, indicator of, of high frictions in these markets. Um, but of course, we can look at volatility of the ETH tether pair uh, returns on ETH as well. And so we find that gas fees are the um, quite significantly correlated with our CIP deviations. And there's also um, CIP deviations are typically higher in periods of extreme returns um, and also uh, periods of higher volatility as well. Um, so then we move on to the implications for interest rates and futures premia. So we want to look at the difference between the stablecoin interest rate and the ETH interest rate. And we want to see if it correlates with the futures premium, the funding rate. Um, and we also control for volatility of interest rates, uh, volatility of, of the ETH tether pair, and also the the ratio of optimist uh, to pessimist wealth. So we find that our interest rates uh, do um, correlate positively with the four futures premium. So there's essentially feedback uh, from the futures premium uh, to interest rates. And so this is in line with the story that the interest rates reflect speculative uh, trading. Um, and we also find positive correlation with the funding rate. Um, we find that the wealth ratio is negative, which lines up uh, with our um, model prediction. So just going back uh, to this uh, term here, that so we have a positive relationship with the futures premium and funding rate and negative relationship with the optimist wealth. And so we find... Um, that the wealth ratio is negatively related. So when the wealth of optimists drops relative to pessimists, that tends to compress the interest rate difference. Um, so in general, we find support uh, for uh, the, the model. Um, so our final test is on UIP. So here we want to look at uh, essentially if the futures premium tends to predict uh, exchange rate returns, right? So essentially uh, this ST plus H minus ST, think of that as the um, H period ahead return of ETH. And here we use a short horizon of eight hours. Um, so in line with the fact that funding rates are paid every eight hours. And so we find there is some return predictability uh, for the futures premium and funding rate. Um, and there's some predictability for interest rates as well, but uh, not as strong as for the futures premium. But in general, um, there's some suggestive evidence that UIP does hold uh, more for um, kind of these uh, cryptocurrency markets, but not, uh, not to the point where it's one. So a coefficient of one would be kind of a perfect uh, UIP, but there's still some uh, evidence that uh, futures premia can can have some return predictability. Okay, so um, to conclude, uh, we looked at the determinants of interest rates on lending protocols. Um, we find that if long leverage positions dominate short positions, um, interest rates should be higher on stable coins. And interest rates should also be connected to futures premia. 
Um, so there are three parts to empirical evidence. The first part is kind of looking at uh, sort of this limits to arbitrage and whether the CIP bounds are violated. And we find that when we use gas fees, they typically uh, are not. Um, then we show uh, that the interest rates correlate with futures premia. And then we show the sum return predictability uh, of futures on, on uh, spot returns as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ganesh. So the discussant is Stefan Voigt from the University of Copenhagen. Thank you. Thank you. All right, cool. So thanks a lot for having me. It's, it's really nice to, to be in town and I uh, can't see you right now, but thanks Lorenzo for, for, for organizing everything and then for for, for, for gathering this, this, this super cool program. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm gonna have a great day here. Um, what is this paper is, is doing? So Ganesh just, just basically guided us through it. I think it's extremely interesting because kind of looking at lending protocols focuses on one of the of the core pillars of decentralized finance, right? I mean, alongside with, with DEXs that, that allow us to do spot trading, what lending protocols are doing as well, they, they allow us access to, to funds via borrowing and lending. And what's what, what's kind of the outstanding feature here, as, as Ganesh also, also shared with us, is that, well, relative to a traditional finance setup, where intermediaries take this role of basically doing the screening and the monitoring of your of, of the quality of the creditor. Um, lending protocols such as Compound are basically smart contract based uh, alternatives where, well, instead of you signaling credit quality in general, the only thing you can really do in a blockchain based world is providing collateral, right? And, and given that it's hard to, to seize assets that are not really locked. Um, the only way to really make this work is to, to provide over collateralized um, assets. So in other words, if, if you're going to borrow something, you have to provide something else, which is worth more than that, basically, to, to rule out any risk that, that basically um, the borrower, uh, the lender doesn't get, get his funds back at some point. And, and so in that sense, this classical idea, I guess, of, of, of default risk, which, which would usually i guess determine interest rates well this this is kind of ruled out here if we if we um um deviate from smart contract based risk and so on so so default risk in the classical sense is not really there in those lending protocols the way i see it and well then you may or the, the gut feeling may be that well what should determine interest rates well it's kind of a risk-free a uh, borrowing device. Um, however, what, what, what Ganesh basically focuses on as research is that there's this potentially puzzling or at least very interesting cross-sectional difference in, in interest rates, right? So, so what you see here, I guess it's, it's a very similar data set. Um, you do see compound borrowing rates for two different assets, blue being a stable coin. Um, and, and here you also see that well, in general, these are way higher than borrowing rates for Ethereum. Right, and you may say, well, if they are over collateralized anyhow, where should this difference come from? And this paper provides, I think, a, a really interesting potential explanation on on what determines these interest rates. And this is something to do with, with aggregate beliefs of investors and basically this main vehicle on how to use landing protocols, which in this case are levered positions. Right. So the the basic idea now really just the uh, Visualize is that well, if you're what you call an optimist in the paper, so if you have really bullish beliefs on the, the future development of well, ETH in that case, the, the, the risky asset, so you believe it's going up, well, naturally you're going to buy this asset, right? You want to have exposure to it, but you can go even further, basically store uh, the, the risky asset you just bought as, as, as collateral or well, you, you just deposit it at this collateral pool. Um, or the risky assets, and with that you basically unlock borrowing capacities um, to, to to borrow stable coins. And what are you going to do with it? Well, you, you just sell it and buy more of the risky asset in order to level up your exposure to the risky asset. The same way works the other way around, right? If you're what you you, you term the, the the pessimist, well, here the idea is basically again you 
you, you lend the underpriced asset and you borrow against the overpriced asset. In this case, if you if you think that well, ether is going to drop, then this is 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 the overpriced asset. So the pessimist in this setup or in the theoretical framework, which is basically storing stable coins as collaterals, uses these to um, to borrow ETA, buy it with the intention of basically buying it back at a lower price later on. So this is kind of this equivalent of, of shooting. And what does this have to do with these interest rate differentials? Well, in a setup, the uh, overall availability of stable points to borrow and, and also the, the risky asset to borrow um, determines interest rates. Well, we, we do we may see some form of asymmetry here, right? The idea being that, well, if, if optimists have a massive interest in, in, in getting stable coins to borrow such that they can buy actually more of those risky assets, well, there may be huge demand for stable coins. And then the big question is, are there many people available out there to provide you with these stable coins? And if not, well, then you are essentially forced or asked to pay a higher Borrowing rate, and this is is kind of the main mechanism here. That well, if we if you have all bullish beliefs, so those optimists ask for stable coins. Well, there are not many people filling up the pool for available stable points. Uh, points. The results should be something like this: where we do have a high borrowing rate for uh, for these stable coins, simply because there is huge demand relative to the uh, to the supply and. At the same time, well, if there are many available uh, risky assets, how do I move too much? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, if, there, if there are many available risky assets, well, then in turn, these interest rates should be lower. This is kind of the mechanism I understand it in this theoretical framework. And so what I would like to share with you in my... In, 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 Basically, my own take, uh, two main comments, one being related to the theoretical framework and then something maybe more suggestion towards the empirics. So the big question on, on how this model works really is, well, who are the people that actually provide these funds? Okay, And in the way the model is written right now, my, my take is a little bit, well, it it all boils down to optimists staying optimists no matter what and pessimists staying pessimists no matter what. So in, in some sense, well, we do have the situation that, well, pessimists are going to provide stable coins, thus determining essentially the, the interest rates for the optimists. But it should be intuitively clear that if we have these two agents in a model without pessimists, well, the optimists would not find any stable coins to borrow to take on for lever positions and vice versa, right? The pessimists do need optimists because, well, if we have only a world where, where pessimists and optimists are around, the only way that you can borrow ETA is that you find an optimist who is actually willing to, uh, to deposit ETA at this lending pool. And what, what I'm thinking or what, what, what I'm essentially very interested in is, well, why does no one really essentially care that eventually one of these two groups is going to be wrong, right? I mean, at the end of the day, the price is going to be higher, it's going to be, be low. And I would expect some form of, of learning going on, right? If I'm the only pessimist out there, I may reconsider uh, whether I should really be a pessimist or I'm, I'm, I'm just taking, taking a massive bet, right? And so in that sense, what, 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 what I'm encouraging you, or maybe it's more a question from my side, is to think a little bit, what happens if a, a new, real, really rational group of, of agents enters the game that's a standard mean variance agent, okay? We, we take the data we have, we build our beliefs, and what would these investors do? Well, they would obviously do some form of trade-off between, well, we're going to invest into stable coins and ether to, to maximize our certainty equivalent, potentially even levering up our positions. But actually, lending coins or lending stable coins or a risky coin, this is a feasible alternative for these investors. So what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say here is that, well, if the actual risk out there is we definitely not default risk because we have these over-collateralized positions. Well, what prevents 
uh, a standard mean variance investor from just putting your money into into uh, the, the lending pool such that you basically earn these high interest rates, right? In the theoretical framework, there's no need for that because the optimists don't care about just, just earning the money. What they want to do is they want to exploit the fact that prices are going to go up and same for the pessimists. But if you're just a mean variance agent, well, money lying on the table, basically a risk, a risk free interest rate, which is high, it may lead you to, uh, to just putting some wealth into this asset. And this is not going to be without consequences because if you do this, well, you are mechanically increasing this pool, right? You're contributing by earning interest rates. And what I'm asking is, well, how long is this going to go? Is it, is it going to be that, well, if, if you add such a third group, are they going to invest until interest rates are aligned anymore and just reflect no default risk? Maybe I'm, I'm overlooking something here, but I think this could be quite interesting because otherwise we have this uh, mismatch between, well, two groups that, that work together very well, but are not really learning from each other, right? which is something I, I would encourage you to, to look at. And I would not even say that this is going to, to speak against your results because I could definitely imagine that there is some form of asymmetric response because actually storing the... The, the risky asset is going to be a, a way different ballpark than, than just doing it with the, with the safe asset. All right. So this is, this is kind of my, my main point. The, the other point that I want to make is, is, is really saying, well, you, I think your link to futures is super interesting. You kind of use it to back out this, this speculative demand, right? We, 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 can, we can use this data to say something about this very open empirical question, do we have more optimists I mean, in a bullish market or in a bearish market per se? And it's in that sense, extremely important because well, there's some work that uh, focusing on, on future data is identifying this well, crypto carry, carry idea that basically says, well, we do see this substantial premium that indicate something that goes very, very much in line with what you see. So we, we have this, this bullish market, and that's something that's also reflected in, in future markets. What I'm wondering is, well, if all really rests, which is kind of one of your testable hypothesis on this idea that, well, we have this mismatch between optimists and pessimists, well, couldn't it be interesting to just, not just, to try to, to provide some additional evidence by basically exploiting this time series variation you do have. We, we do have some idea, I guess, in, in, in finance, in classical finance, but also in DeFi, when you just look at this paper, to, to tease out some moments that can basically lead to situations where basically this, this, this sentiment changes over time, right? So, so, so more recent momentum may be something that's typically associated with creating optimist behavior, right? Like if you have very recent gains, this may be something that generates some, some additional momentum such that you see exactly the idea you have. And then basically this time series variation should indicate that, well, interest rates of stable coins are going up during periods where we have this momentum effect. Or there may be some other ways of teasing out sentiment effects, which is exactly what you would like to see. And I don't really have a clock here, but I'm sure I'm talking way too much. Um, I have just two very minor comments. And, and the, the big takeaway really is, I, I think it's super interesting what's, what's, what's going on in this paper. And I really look forward to, uh, to, to see the, the, the next iterations of it. Uh, we, we can talk about these micro uh, minor comments uh, because those are a little bit more of a technical uh, point of view. So maybe this gives you some more time to also get some questions, but well, thank you very much. I hope this is kind of, of useful and I, I look forward to discussing further with you. So read the paper if you're interested in, in lending protocols. It's a very nice read. Thanks a lot, Stefan. Perhaps Ganesh, you want to reply? Um, yeah, th thank you, Stefan, for the discussion. Um, yeah, so I think in, so definitely um, this, quite a simplifying assumption there that the optimists and pessimists kind of balance uh, in kind of the market clearing. Um, but I do agree that empirically, 
um, it's very likely there are a lot of um, investors that just lend stable coins without doing any sort of leverage positions. So I do agree that to the extent they do that, that should compress these interest margins, all, all else equal. Um, but yeah, I think that we can we can look, and I think it's mainly for the stable coins that are doing it. So you have a lot more uh, lending of stable coins. Uh, you still have lending of ETH as well, but I don't think, I'm not sure at this stage to what extent um, that you just have pure lending of stable coins or pure lending of ETH. But this is something that we want to investigate. Um, and yeah, I think that uh, the sentiment also, uh, yeah, we do want to get more measures of sentiment and kind of related um, things. So I, as, I think we, we also work trying to work on this kind of investor level data and hopefully we can extract some measures of sentiment there as well. But I do agree that like kind of tech space uh, sentiment measures should correlate with, with interest rates as well. Um, but yeah, thank you. Great. So a question from the audience. It's nice. Uh, it was a very nice presentation. Um, in, in regards to what Stefan mentioned and just trying to fetch out of something that came across, we the, one of the assumptions is the funding rate is reconfigured in the granularity of every eight hours. Um, the interest rate quoted by the corresponding protocol might actually change at block height. Now, if one thinks of a very old framework, we have speculators and hedges. Let's take another, another um, setting, which is optimist and pessimist, but you have speculators and hedges, and they can last at different horizons, a different temporality. Stefan mentioned a micro, like a micro horizon where P plus and P minus, how can these coexist or something like this? I didn't read the last comment very nicely. Um, the thing is, in between these eight hours, you have your optimist slash pessimist, so speculators as hedgers, having different stop loss and stop win criteria. And all these guys um, might push the interest rate in one direction or the other before the funding rate granularity converges. I, I don't know how all these things play in because you also have another mechanism where you have this kink and you see that the CIP and the bounds are governed by gas fees, which is a very cool result. But the thing is you have malicious, or I would say extremely greedy, not necessarily malicious, um, liquidators, yeah, as a strategy, not from the protocol itself, who are going around fishing wallets in these guys and say, I don't care about the kink. I'm just out there to liquidate, and which is going to be independent of the gas fee because I, I might come out with a very large proportion pushing the protocol in that direction whose horizon might again be block height and not the funding rate horizon. I know it's very difficult to combine all of this in an analysis, but it's it's a very interesting problem. Just wanted to put it out there and would be cool to follow what's happening in the next months, years to come, if that makes any sense. Cool. Um, yeah, so this liquidation stuff, we, so there is like some um, work as well, focusing more on liquidations of DeFi lending protocols. Right now, we haven't integrated that into our analysis. And it's also, I think it's difficult to have. So I, I do agree liquidations play a role in, in kind of this interest rate setting, right? I think that it should have an effect. It's hard to figure out kind of which direction it would have, but I, I think, um, yeah, like my understanding is like, yeah, it would essentially a um, lot of these investors right at the threshold when liquidations happen, you will start getting some interest rate kind of effects as a result of the liquidations. And there's probably a bigger case more in the market when market volatility is high. Um, so, but yeah, that's something that I do want to look into as well. So kind of are there any sort of testable implications around liquidations and interest rates? 
So we're going to uh, start the second session now. Um, I, I am uh, Fabio Moneta. I'm a visiting professor here at Collegio. Uh, otherwise, I'm from um, University of Ottawa in Canada. And I'm going to chair the second session. So we have uh, two very interesting papers. And uh, the format is going to be the same. So 25 minutes presentation, 10 minutes discussion, and five minutes uh, for Q&A. So the first paper by Simon Trimborn from University of Amsterdam. Um, Simon is here? Yeah, thank you. That's mine? Yes. All right, thank you. Yes. <laughs> all right, um, thanks guys for being here. Uh, first of all, of course, thanks for Lorenzo for putting this program together and for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be here. It has been years since I was in Italy, northern Italy to be precise, so I almost forgot how beautiful the northern Italian landscape is. It was a be nice reminder of all of that. Uh, also, thanks, of course, to Daniello to discuss my paper later um, and for coming all the way from London here for that. <laughs> all right, then without further ado, let's look into what we have today. Uh, so this, of course, not my sole work. I'm uh, I'm joined by that by my colleagues Ying and Ray Bing. Uh, they are from NUS and NCKU, respectively. Um, so yeah, I'm obviously now with the Uva. That's uh, yeah, also as uh, as previously said. So that's where the three logos come from. So these are not my affiliations. These are my course affiliations. This course confusions before. Therefore, I'm saying that. Um, so how does this project in general fit into my work? So I do a lot these days with network models and complex systems. That's also um, uh, what were, uh, the projects with which I went to Amsterdam then. Um, usually how I do that is via dimension reduction techniques. So these two things we're also going to see today, how that works together. Uh, I commonly work on these kind of fintech uh, data, cryptocurrency, blockchain. So obviously it's in the title that's also going to be here and it's the theme of the conference. So it would be, yeah, uh, clear. Um, I do a lot in tax finding and sentiment analysis as well, but not today. Investment methodologies, same, but not today. And here I'm also saying that this will lead into some software creation at a later stage. I was already active in that uh, back in the past. Uh, yeah, but here I will still stay in future. All right, before I re uh, will now start with the slides, some little advertisement before, uh, since I know we have a lot of students also currently in the audience. Uh, at present, I'm looking for like two PhD students, uh, one in network uh, statistics, uh, with a particular focus on like social network analysis. So we will basically look at Reddit data and things like that. And the second one on ESG and uh, financial stability. So the uh, we're still accepting uh, applications. One of them closes 1st of May, the window, and the other one, I think, 21st of May. So if you guys are interested in these topics, uh, just check on the websites of the UVA for the opening or ask me later. <laughs> Either works. After that, now let's go back into what I'm actually supposed to talk about. So exchange networks, why do I believe that is interesting and what we actually can think about that? So we're having uh, commonly like a, like a situation where we see some cross listing of financial products via multiple exchanges. That's something you see all the time when it comes to New York and Hong Kong, particularly for um, Chinese and Hong Kong based companies that they list in both markets. So it ha also has to have to have to the direct exposure to the investors being um, being active over there. Um, what we can do then is consider each of this exchange as an individual in our market network, basically. All right, there already is the term network. Now you know why it's in the title. Um, these individual exchanges will receive then like local price information and also, of course, from their competing markets. If you look, if you uh, think then of the example of like Hong Kong and New York, that's of course a little bit difficult because they're never open at the same time. So they are receiving information from competing markets is a little bit of a troublesome situation. However, in crypto, that's completely different because they're open 24 seven. So there, we're again back in the situation that these markets can completely send information to each other without having these frictions. We're interested then in looking at influential exchanges, which, which we basically mean the ones who lead the future price movements. Uh, whom do we think uh, should that be interesting for? Obviously investors, when you know which exchange dictates the price, then basically that's where you either want to trade or you will want to, want to look to know what happens 
later on regulators clearly because that's not a good thing that's an inefficiency in the market you don't want to see that so when you have like dominant exchanges in this way you want to regulate them regularly and for the very same reasons i also believe policymakers would be interested in that crypto exchanges in general have quite some problematic properties and we know that since a while uh, Makarov and Shoa uh, were already documenting that there is quite some arbitrage opportunities in this market. Griffin and Shams right, wrote a very nice paper a few years out on price manipulation in this market, showing basically how on the BitPhoenix exchange, uh, the Bitcoin USD uh, um, price was, uh, let's say, supported via, via trades and pushed ever higher. And of course, the uh, one of the oldest problems when it comes to crypto exchanges, wash trading. There's a nice paper by uh, Will Kong and uh, co-authors on exactly that topic. So what do crypto exchanges have for properties and what kind of data do they actually have when, for this study? We are having commonly the situation that they trade Bitcoin against US dollar or some other, um, some other asset. We will consider here then also against the US dollar and against Tether, because Tether can be considered as a yeah, as the US dollar basically. Uh, the nice thing is that they trade in the 24-7, which is not the case for regular exchanges. So this makes it from a let's say a data and analyst viewpoint extremely interesting, up, um, apart from the fact that it's also interesting to work in the in the crypto markets. Um, interesting is further that these ones are distributed all around the globe. So you consider different kind of con uh, countries, uh, time zones whatsoever. And the leading question is then basically which exchanges lead the price formation. Relevant, we believe, is that for like the opening up of arbitrage opportunities. Um, it's, it's relevant for basically mon uh, monitoring where fraud you, to simply safeguard against fraudulent behavior in the sense of detecting it. And of course, uh, about market efficient, uh, efficiency investigations. What we mean with that is if you have influential exchanges which lead the price formation, the market is not efficient because it shouldn't be there. Because then you have automatically arbitrage opportunities, which naturally should not be there, but they are there. So if there's not present these influencer uh, networks any longer, we have, a, we have better, let's say, um, efficiency in the market, so to say. All right. What I want to do with you guys next, I want to look at my data, uh, look at the model we are designing for that. So uh, the, the team consists of statisticians slash financial econometricians. So usually we build a model to, uh, to um, investigate what we want to do also here. And then we look a little bit at the results. I still left synthetic data in the outline, even though I moved this for this talk to the appendix because we don't have enough time for that simply. But if you guys are really interested in that, I can always look into, uh, go into the simulation study. So let's look at my particular data. I fetched the uh, price series for 194 Bitcoin exchanges, literally all over the globe. We're talking BitPhoenix, Binance, all the big ones, Kraken, whatsoever, and a bunch of small ones, of course. My time period lasts from 2015 until mid of 21. This date is not particular. This was literally just the date I fetched from the last exchange. So that's, just, uh, that's the only reason why it stops there. I was able to get my hands on their the hourly price observation and I download then for US dollar, Bitcoin to, and Tether to Bitcoin. So now I have, of course, for some exchanges, two time series. Most of them use only either. So a lot of them decide to only use Tether against Bitcoin, but some do both. When I have both, then I will merge my time series into one by uh, making a value weighted average then I have one average for that entire exchange. Okay, of course, crypto exchanges have very different kind of liquidities. The, 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 yeah, the biggest in the market, of course, currently Binance, uh, Coinbase, and so on. And here, what I plotted on this one is just to give you a little bit of a feeling <clears throat> what we're talking about. I took, uh, I, I took the largest part of, this, uh, of the data set and uh, chose the average trading volume for 80 exchanges. Why not 194? Because not all of them are active over the entire period. However, 80 of them are fully active during this period. Uh, so I only chose that one to make it a fair comparison. And I just plotted literally the average trading volume against the standard deviation we are, we are seeing. So we have a lot of cluster down here, low trading volume, low standard deviation, and some which are really gigantic up here. So since I look for, yes, please. Hourly data, yes, yes. 
um since i'm uh, interested in like market leader activities somehow it wouldn't i would not believe myself if i find some exchange which has like statistically speaking leading activity but has it's a trading volume somewhere down here whereas the others are up here that is just just then a let's say funny result so what we're doing later on we are going to exclude exchanges which too little trading volume within a specific week so we're always making a dynamic comparison saying okay who is currently the biggest and then say every exchange we're considering right now should have at least five percent of the trading volume that's why we see at different time points um different sizes of our network sometimes it's just five exchanges sometimes it's 20 sometimes it's 30 varying on the current market situation then my next uh, question, of course, before I even dived into all of that was just to check if what I presume should be there, some kind of leader um, activity of certain exchanges is indeed in a data. So before building any kind of fancy models, I just took a simple VAR model and throw it on my data. And what came out is that. Um, this is just a heat map of the lag one and lag two parameter metrics of um of these 80 exchanges over a time period of what is that three years, right? Like one, like two. And if you see here like a red dot, that means there is a parameter between zero and one. The red means uh, the re its respective strength of the parameter. Blue means it's negative. Um, if it's blank, it means it's pretty much around zero. This is a VAR model. So none of these parameters is truly zero. They're just very close to zero. You will now, of course, say, wait a second, the parameter matrix kept to one and minus one. That is weird. Yes, of course. This is purely for um, illustrative purposes. When a parameter was larger than one or smaller than minus one, I simply brought it back to one and minus one, purely for illustration to show what we have. Our, your attention, I would like to have on these columns, because some of these columns show constantly parameters with darker, more intense colors, let's say to that. And that is basically an influence activity. So like that there's a time series coming from one exchange, which is um, influential for the, um, for the price information next hour on a lot of the others, not all, but a lot of the others. We see that here, we see that here, and we also see it basically over here in like two, in like one, we see it there, 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 and there. <clears throat> Pretty much like that. So now my next question, uh, my observation was, oh, okay, so it is there, but which of them is it genuine? Is it just like a statistical anomaly whatsoever? Um, and are all of them important? Because for some of them, the colors are very shallow, for others a little bit more intense. So here, this is not very well, well visible on the on the um, on on the board. I actually also columns, exchanges, which are very influential for all of the others, let's say persistently parameters, um, just very, 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 very small parameter value. So we ask ourselves, which, one, which ones are actually the leading ones? Which ones do we need? <clears throat> and that is motivation for why I constructed a model, which I will show you in the next step. So questions are, which are the leading exchanges? And let's say, are they even present? Well, we already have a good guess there are, plus I put in a title. Very good chance they are there. Either are there dynamics in them? And if so, what kind of structures do we see? And then, of course, lastly, relations to of these influences changes to arbitrage, market liquidity, efficiency, you name it. That's the model we're constructing. And it's actually not as complicated as it may appear on the first glimpse. The front part is nothing but a VAR, vector autoregression. Nothing else. It's just basically these squares in a time series framework. And then we added on here something, which is um, our penalty term. And you can think of that as something like lasso or SCAD, because in a nutshell, that's what it is. Just with uh, three um, regularization operators and not with one as lasso would basically give it to you. Why do we choose three? Because we separate by penalization for our legs, groups, and individual regularization. Individual regularization basically goes back to SCAD, Lasso, you name it, where a parameter is individually regularized <clears throat> and investigated for being either set to zero or not set to zero. Lex corresponds to <clears throat> if the entire parameter matrix is set to zero or not. This, this basically saves you in the end from having to go back and analyze with AIC, BIC, which Lex structure you need. 
we're basically building it into the regularization operator to say leg two is not important, leg one and leg three maybe yes. That's what we do. Um, the second one is then where, where I look for the leadership. Because this one is a group, uh, a group regularization, which we apply only on the columns. So this is one, this is one uh, parameter, uh, one, one regularization, which works on all the parameters of an entire column. So if this gets zeroed out, there is no leadership. If it does not get zeroed out, there is leadership. That's the idea behind the entire model and why we constructed it. Here yeah, I'm summarizing that. So uh, our legs look for the temporal structure of the exchanges, so which leg is important. Leadership of the exchanges via the columns and the respective regularization apply to it. And lastly, individual strength of the exchange to exchange relationship, which comes then over the regularization of the individual parameters, so to speak, lasso, SCAD, what you already know from your, uh, from, uh, your statistics uh, courses. All right, then after I introduce a little bit the model which we are using, let me look at our um, empirical application and how we're going to do that. So I have now data for 15 to 21, right? And some, these are 339 weeks. And I'm going to split my data into at least weeks. So I'm analyzing every week by itself if there are leading, um, if, there are le if there's leadership present between these exchanges. I will focus, as I said before, only on exchanges with at least 5% of the trading volume of the most liquid exchange oh, per week. Sorry, it says quarter, should be week. So within that week, the, um, um, exactly. So that's actually rather flexible, right? So we really only cut out the ones which have very, very little uh, trading volume for not being able to influence anything. Then since this falls into the area of like model uh, of, of machine learning, so you have to train your model somehow, what I need is to, after, after fitting the model, similar to a VAR, I have to still figure out which of these lambda parameters are the, are the real ones, which I need. So I need to def I need to figure out somehow which ones to work with, because these ones I have to define externally. I have to give them to the model. They are tuning parameters. So the way I do that is I will train my model on the first half of every week, Monday at midnight, going to Wednesday um, as uh, sorry Thursday noontime, and then I will take the take the second half of the week and will evaluate which of these lambdas gives me the best model by mean squared forecasting evaluation. So which of my many models comes out? You can tell already I have like three lambdas, so there are a lot of combinations. Usually it's about 30,000 models per week, which I have to compare. And then I go with the best one by MSFE within that week. Of course, this is like a model I just constructed, so I have to compare it. I have to figure out if I'm doing better or whatsoever against others, plus it could be that there is no influencer structure in a particular week. So other models could potentially figure then out the underlying structure better. So I have a bunch of competitors. I chose like Lasso and SCAD as the classics. There is this uh, T-Lasso, which, um, which is taking uh, into consideration also a tap, also like a lag structure regularization. They do not have this uh, regularization for the columns as we do, but they also consider the lag structure. Hence, I included them as a, as a comparison tool mm -hmm. since they already um, take into account two of, this, of the regularizations we also have, just not the third one. We also compare against, uh, against the Bayesian model, the classical one from Bambura, and a factor vector uh, autoregression um, since a factor model is also basically looking for like joint effects in the structure. And basically that's what we also somehow do. So we benchmark against that one as well. So we have like, yeah, the entire framework here. Uh, we compare against regularized, uh, regularized models, Bayesian, and we also have the factor structure. And then focus on the study, influencer detection and market efficiency. So. Now, after I trained that, uh, sorry, this is the last slide, I think, with, uh, with any kind of formulas. We're jumping very soon to some, some plots. I am now in the situation that I have my models, and I figured the best one was in that week, but I still don't know how it will do out of sample, right? And there we came to the following idea. We just use the next week after. So if in this week I'm training and evaluating my model, 
I will now take it and apply it next week. And I will do that for all of these models. Then the um, question leading me is, which of these models does best? So I'll need to somehow compare them. Problem is you get then out some number, mean squared forecasting error again or something like that. But is it better, like statistically significantly better? And that's what we use then um, the Vuong test for, where we basically, it's basically a likelihood ratio test, where you, um, also reg, uh, where you also control for the number, for, for like the number of parameters via an ASC or BSC criterion embedded into your test statistic and throw this in the end into your hypotheses. What I'm doing then is I'm comparing if the model we are constructing outperforms, statistically speaking, on a 5% level, all the other models. So if the H null of the other models being equally good in performance or better gets rejected for every model in that respective week, only if Tristner fulfills that requirement, then I say it really outperforms. So it has to outperform everything um, with that criterion. All right, now to some pictures and hear the nice advertising uh, statement. Out of my 339 weeks, in 104, Trisna is better. So we do have this kind of leadership structure. In a third of the weeks, it is indeed present. I took then the 10 exchanges, uh, the, the, what is it, uh, nine exchanges, which at least 10 times lead my structure, and just put them here on a, on a time series plane to show a little bit how this distributes. And some interesting structures came out. For example, in 2016, uh, Kraken, the blue one here, is influential for the uh, structure for, for, the, for the price discovery network 20, in 23 weeks. And a bunch of them, in particular to the end of it, exclusively. Only Cracker. <clears throat> also like Binance here after its emergence became uh, quite influential for the market. Uh, fair point. And we see a little bit of a tapering off structure. So in the beginning, way more influencer, uh, influential exchanges were present and then slowly simply things went down. This does not mean that was nothing back here. It's just that some exchange was influential once or twice, and that's it. You see no longer anything for 21. That's because in 21, we didn't detect a single influential exchange via um, our modeling framework. So things got much better in, um, in terms of market efficiency. I asked myself then next, okay, after having, after having found out that there is something, and in a statistical sense, I can say it's, it's indeed there, but what's the narrative behind it? Why is that even there? So I just dig back into the data and uh, try to make some sense out of it. I just plotted here like for, for five of these exchanges, their trading volume together with a feeling for it. And I would like to remind you back that in 2016, we saw that Kraken was super important in 23 out of 52 weeks. And I realized then when I looked at its time series of the trading volume, this increased it closed the gap to the largest exchanges at that time, which were Bitfinex, Bitstamp, and Coinbase. It increased and increased and increased. So that seems to be kind of a, a potential reason why it became more important. At the same time, we see a little bit of a decrease even in trading volume of the other exchanges. Okay, so incre increase in trading volume could be it. I saw a similar structure also for Bitfenix, uh, sorry, for Binance here, which totally jumped up in its, uh, in its trading volume after its emergence and overtook all the others. And in that period, it was super important in terms of leadership of the, um, of the, um, tray of the, uh, vol of the, um, nah, price discovery network. So, okay, there seems to be some kind of relation between these two things. Further, I was then thinking, oh, it should also be something with arbitrage, right? So, naturally. So I just put this on a plane. Um, what I'm doing here is I just, let's say, 339 weeks, I could not put this onto a table. Otherwise, this is like half of my paper is just one table. So I went back to quarters and plotted things into quarters by just looking at the spread between the exchanges on average in these quarters to get a little bit of a feeling for how the arbitrage was at these uh, respective weeks. So it's the first column, it's variance given next to it, and then like a bunch of numbers to the trading volume. Um, interesting, I found that in these, the spread was constantly increasing until the mid of like 2018, basically, and then slowly tapered off. It only increased again in 21, quarter one, by quite a bit. However, remark here, 
we didn't found influential exchanges, even though we did see um, some form of uh, arbitrage opportunities just via the spread. So there seems to be a relation somehow with the arbitrage, opportuni or arbitrage opportunities for like uh, this leadership of the exchanges to be present. That's a bit of a feeling I got from out of that from it. So what's next? Um, my next thought was like, and I haven't, I'm currently playing around with these data, but haven't, and therefore haven't put it on the, on the slides yet. The question I asked myself is, could I actually make use of these inefficiencies? So could I just like design a trading strategy from that, for example, to improve my, uh, my, my, my return structure a little bit for that? I'm currently at a stage where, well, you read the literature and see what's there and where you play a bit on just the data and see what works. And if you have any kind of comments and thoughts for that would be very much welcome. Intermediary, I can say so far looks like it indeed works with certain specifications. So there seems to be indeed some kind of misspecifications in the market one could have actually even made use of to improve, um, to improve uh, your portfolio value. Then uh, to conclude, what do we have? So we did like a study on the price discovery network for crypto exchanges, focusing on influence and detection and market inefficiencies. We saw a vast amount of influence exchanges appearing before 18, then somewhat the tapering off. And uh, market inefficiencies improved over time. And then, of course, the fact that we also like uh, suggest a model, which I introduced rather broadly, right? for influencer detection and market efficiency and all of this. And because it works fairly well, we're of course also gonna make it all available via GitHub, our package and so on. Um, I usually also say a little bit like what, what, I'm, what I will do next on network analysis, but I'm really out of time. So I will skip that and we'll give the stage, I think to Daniela next. Thank you so much. Thank you. To discuss it, uh, is Daniele Bianchi from Queen Mary University. <laughs> All right, so thanks, thanks a lot for having me and for uh, uh, inviting me to discuss this paper. I really enjoyed the reading uh, and uh, I'm gonna share with you a few thoughts um, on what I learned and what I think that the paper could uh, head into. Um, so uh, Simon did a very good job in summarizing, obviously, the results. What I want to give you first is try to tell you why I think that what is covering in the paper is relevant and how we should think about it. So what the paper really is about is about inefficiencies. And I guess it uh, goes without saying that there are widespread inefficiencies in Bitcoin trading market that comes from a variety of sources. Information asymmetry is one, the obvious candidate. Uh, and with, with that, adverse selection issues, but also market fragmentations. Um, um, uh, we have we have lots of different exchanges and trading platforms uh, and a variety of operators. So just to give an example here, I'm plotting the spreads in BTC USD in a series of large exchanges, and essentially this is the spreads that Simon was talking about. And uh, probably you can see much from the picture, but I'm highlighted for you large spreads, for instance, with, with respect to small exchanges. Exmo is a small exchange in the UK, a large one. You have almost four percent. Uh, technically arbitrage opportunity. Now, it's a different story if you can exploit that arbitrage opportunity, but on paper, those spreads are there. And that obviously tells a story of inefficiencies. So there are three key questions when it comes to market fragmentations and price spreads. Uh, the obvious one is, okay, uh, is, um, is a story of arbitrage, mispricing, risk premiums, uh, or uh, is uh, the implications for price discovery processes, uh, implications for how should we think about systemically important exchanges vis-a-vis -vis less systemically important exchanges. And what Simon is doing in this paper is basically focusing on the second and the third question. The first question has been addressed to some extent in the literature. There is a lot of work that needs to be done, but to some extent has been addressed already. So this paper is really about answer to question two, so price discovery, and partly to question three, which is about uh, network analysis and, and systemic risk to a large extent. The methodology is a sparse, is a sparse VAR. And for those of you who are familiar with the network literature, basically is a partial correlation network. So the idea that through partial correlations, you can characterize leading and lagging uh, players. 
So uh, if you look at the paper, there is a bunch of these pictures whereby on the x-axis you have, let's say, the price spreads at time t minus one. On the y-axis, you have the price spreads across exchanges at time t. And all you have to do, you have to, you have to essentially spot clusters of colors column-wise for each column, really. And that's the idea of a partial correlation network at the end. So I'm going to comment on three things, uh, the empirical implementation, in particular, the use that has been done throughout the paper on the methodology that has been proposed. Uh, and then I'm going to comment on what I think could be done uh, slightly better when it comes to the economic interpretation of the results. And then if I have time, a couple of comments on the estimation setting. These are more technical details. So uh, the use of the methodologies, this is a, a network autoregressive model. Uh, my understanding from the reading is that the main results are essentially built uh, upon these 104 weeks out of 339 available in which the methodology outperform competitors. This roughly corresponds to 30% of the sample. So the natural question is what happens to the remaining 70% of the sample? And I appreciate that. Uh, you want to isolate those instances whereby your methodology outperform competitors, but at the end of the day, it's not really a forecasting paper. So it would be interesting to see how the model performs in the remaining part of the sample as well. And in fact, the first exercise that I would do, which is seems something that you've done, in fact, at the very beginning of the paper, would be to simply look at the partial correlation, uh, the, the net structure from partial correlation from a standard sparse VAR without the... Uh, 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 grouping component without the uh, shrinkage of the lagging, just a simple sparse VR, and see if you can capture similar effects. Uh, that would be that would be something interesting to see, or at least give some sort of external validity to the empirical results. Now, still on the methodology, at the end of the day, uh, I'm simplifying here a bit, but the problem is uh, mean squared error plus penalty. And of course, the penalty is relatively complex. Uh, and the output of this framework is that you get a tensor, meaning slices of parameters over time. Uh, and then you see here uh, on the x-axis, you have yt uh, minus one, and on the y-axis, you have yt. Obviously, I'm simplifying here. This is just for one lag, and the paper is much more complex than that. But the idea is that you get these uh, slices of parameters. So uh, the beauty of it, if you like, is that if you fix a column in each of those slices, you can spot leading exchanges based on these partial correlations. If you fix a row, you can spot lagging exchanges. If you fix a row in a column, you can track lead lag relationships over time. And if you fix T, you have what is called a direct uh, uh, acyclic graph. So uh, uh, what, what I'm suggesting here is that in the paper you have, uh, you identify exchanges based on those that are essentially column wise. Uh, for those exchanges in which you have at least 25% of the parameters that are uh, non-zero, you associate that as a uh, influential exchange. But you have much more than that in this framework. You have, uh, for instance, at each time t, you can characterize the so-called adjacency matrix, which gives you the entire structure of lead lag relationship. So the natural question is, why don't you make plenty of use of, of, of the machinery you have and you figure out network centrality measures and there is a plethora of, of centrality measures that are available out there. So you can clearly characterize like the density of the network, uh, which of this network is in fact systemically relevant, uh, not just simply look at column wise, uh, but also uh, over time and, and for each time. Uh, now the, uh, the comment that I really want to make though here is about the institutional framework. So the underlying assumption is that you have this lead lag relationship in the BTC USD spread, and then the application obviously is for price discovery and for market quality. Now, uh, market fragmentation is there for a reason, and there are institutional differences across exchanges. For instance, they are pertain different geographical areas, and as such, they have different investor bases. For instance, what I'm plotting here is the 30-day change in the BTC-USD pair across different time zones. So all I'm doing is clustering returns based on different working hours, US, uh, Europe, and Asia. And the blue bar is US, the red one is Europe and the yellow one is Asia. And even just clustering according to geographical area, you can see that the properties of returns are different. And um, goes without saying that all of your exchanges are not in a single jurisdiction, so they're spread globally. So this lead lag relationship might be uh, some sort of natural, uh, um, uh, uh, natural consequence of how they're spread uh, throughout the, uh, uh, the, the working times. So throughout the... Uh, the, how, how returns behave within the day. Uh, this just one 
facet at the end could be many other. For instance, if you look at the uh, uh, balance on exchange, which means the number of Bitcoin that are held on a given exchange, relative to the total that are held on exchanges, uh, one thing you should keep in mind that the relative amount of Bitcoin on exchanges is roughly between 50 to 18%. Everything else is outside exchanges. So here I'm plotting the relative of that relative part across some of the major exchanges. You see Coinbase is roughly 32%, uh, Binance comes second, and then you have Bitfinex, the usual suspects. So the whole point of this picture is just to tell you that there are different qualities across exchanges. So some, some exchanges are more popular than others, some exchanges are more solid than others, and all of these institutional aspects are not investigated enough in the paper. And obviously those speaks directly to centrality, right, within the network ecosystem. Another thing that perhaps you could look at, uh, now we have data on the so-called proof of reserves, which is essentially how many Bitcoin they have in their, you know, in their, in their, in their, um, uh, a given exchange as reserves. And there are differences, even among largest players, for instance, you see Binance, uh, they have, you know, almost an order of magnitude higher uh, reserves that beat me, BitMEX, which is the uh, red uh, red line, and beat Fe beat Phoenix is something in between. So again, all I'm saying here is that uh, I'd love to understand more about the institutional framework, and if I can use your sort of network uh, analysis to uh, try to understand if that can be partly explained by, you know, all of these differences, which are objectively there. Um, now, the third comment that I have, yes, I'm not. The, the third comment that I have actually can be split in two, and it's really about the estimation. So uh, one thing that I, that I notice, uh, in fact, I think is, is, is hidden in the appendix of the paper, uh, is that you're not doing cross-validation, really. So you have this procedure that uh, perhaps we can discuss about it offline, uh, but which is not cross-validation. So um, cross-validation, especially in a time ceiling sense, um, can be done. Uh, and I appreciate that you're working within a week. So maybe the time span is short, but perhaps you can extend on a monthly basis. The analysis wouldn't suffer much, at least the economic intuition. The reason why I'm asking is because time series cross-validation is effectively the gold standard when it comes to time series forecasting, which is the, the, the other side of the coin of what you're doing. So perhaps it's something that you can uh, motivate a bit more in the paper. And then the last comment that I have is about cross-validating, in fact, all of these three penalty parameters. My understanding from the paper is that you kind of cross-validate or you calibrate those sequentially. Uh, that's the nature of the model because it goes from individual to group to lags. Uh, but sequences play a role. And we know that, uh, you know, in the machine, machine learning literature since, since a while, for instance, if you simply look at elastic net, you have two parameters to cross-validate. The sequence of cross-validation affect how those parameters are calibrated. So perhaps this is something, it's a small technical point, but something you could uh, discuss a bit better. In the paper, other than that, uh, really interesting reading, and I recommend everyone to read it. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, Simon, you want to respond quickly? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, just real quick, I think uh, one comment one you were you were saying what happens uh, in the other seventy percent panel. Um, when I when I looked like manually through the results, uh, what we quite often saw is that still like. Um, uh, two or three of the more of the competing models get still outperformed by us, but one not, and not just like a little, but not at all. It was simply better. So I was not not uh, not quite confident then to make that kind of statement. Yeah, we're still somehow a little bit better than the other, but it's it's this is a fair point. It should somehow be reported. I think if I remember back, quite often the uh, Bayesian framework was then outperforming. Um, which is underlying, a, uh, I think, uh, a, 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 basically a rich regression framework. So, but in a, in, a, in, a, in a Bayesian form. So I think that is a valuable point where we should make, uh, make some statements on. Um, point two, that, that is really great. Um, I would love to, I would love to uh, yeah, dig into that. I would also love to, uh, love to hear a bit like where you got all these different data from, where, where, they, where they, they hold, uh, how much the exchanges hold. Um, this is exactly what I what I would also like like to exp um, explore a little bit more. How the what are the econ connections of this entire thing to this entire framework to the economics, and also the the comment on the um, on the network um, measures in connection with our adjacency matrix. That's, that that I, I liked a lot. I would definitely look into this. Um, this was a, a very nice thought, uh, which hasn't crossed my mind yet. I think part three we can discuss really offline because that is then truly technical. Yeah. Thank you so much. So it was a really great discussion. I appreciate that a lot. Thank you. We still have time for, for one or two questions. Uh, are there any questions? Yes. 
um, microphone. Uh, do we need a microphone? Uh, very nice presentation. Thanks a lot. I've I've just one question regarding your your channel motivation because it, to me it sounded a little bit like um, you claim that if we have like influencing exchanges, that's maybe more a sign of market inefficiency. And and I'm I'm not entirely sure I understand this because I think we we know that cross exchange trading is plagued by by frictions but but what about i mean in the most extreme case where if there's one leading exchange and we all know that and all trade at this exchange i, I don't i wouldn't see this as a market inefficiency i would right. see this as the the perfect case basically mm. so, so i'm i'm i was struggling a bit linking market inefficiency and so why is market fragmentation desired basically mm -hmm. <clears throat> Fair point. Uh, from my perspective, it, I, I started into that because I was thinking to myself, if I have like an exchange which is like leading everything, that exchange should also have like all the trading volume, at least like very, very high percentage. But I don't see this in this market. The other ones are also having reasonable amounts of trading volumes and still experience somehow these spillovers. And um, I did not make this very clean presentation, but from time to time, it's not the biggest exchange which has the leadership. Um, the the influencer activity it is one with like uh, yeah the second or third or fourth largest in trading volume but still we see these uh, kind of effects and that I found um, yeah um, appealing and that that lead me then to looking more at the trading volume where I realized that there seems to be some kind of connection with the uh, increase in trading volume which seems to be like somewhat linked with kind of structural appearances of uh, of all of that so this was kind of the motivation where i came from no that's that, that's fine maybe if i just uh, one final thing i guess maybe it's interesting for you also to look at the i mean we have market fragmentation in equity markets as well right and yeah. i fa think fair you could see something different which then more hints at different trader types choosing different venues and and right. and then it's it's not necessarily a problem right i, I don't know informed investors may go to dark pools or institutional investors mm -hmm. may may choose to trade the dark pools while while others choose to trade somewhere else, and then you have a, a similar setup. So maybe just to, to keep this in mind, it's 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 just a just a comment. That's a nice point. Thank you. <laughs> um, nice presentation. Um, I just have a couple of questions. Uh, first is how does your measure compare to sort of alternative kind of information shares um, of exchanges, kind of like sort of Hasbrook style information shares like whether it's this exchange detection is kind of saying something about which exchange is the most informed um and also uh, about um this kind of value weighted price between bitcoin uh tether and bitcoin dollar could could it potentially be affected by say tether uh prices moving around a lot and so mm -hmm. Would an alternative to just compare Bitcoin tether prices only and right. Bitcoin dollar prices only? Uh, thank you. Good points. Uh, to the second one, sorry that I wasn't there. They're too clear during the presentation. Be, uh, be before I merged the two time series, I um I I kind of corrected the USDT to Bitcoin time series for the um, exchange rate between US dollar and it. So to offset that effect. Sorry, that wasn't clear on that. And then I merged them value weighted. Okay, so great. Yeah, that one we should be safeguard against. The first one, um, I'm sorry, I think I would need a little bit more of clarification of your exact nature of the question. I think I did not fully get okay, where so you're coming from. I guess I was thinking of this kind of Joel Hasbrook's kind of information share met metric where you have many markets and then you're saying what's the role of price discovery mm -hmm. from each market. And so is your exchange detection measure is it a different way of getting an idea of which exchange has the most information about the true price or is it a bit different i think this goes into that direction that we build like a statistical measure to figure out purely based on the data which exchange for reasons we are we are trying to to, to still like uh, dig out somewhat has structurally impact on the uh, price discovery on the price discovery and in some cases really like persistent uh the, the 2016 for example with like kraken and later with binance 
So I believe that goes in the right in the same direction. I will be a little bit careful by by making a very clear statement between these two between these two frameworks because I'm I will be honest with you I'm not hundred percent familiar with it. So I would have to look that up. That's therefore also a great uh, comment for me because naturally I would have to uh, yeah make uh, should make some statement to that. We'll mm -hmm. look into this. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, let's postpone the other question to the okay. lunch break. Uh, uh, so let's move to the next uh, next paper uh, by Julian Pratt from Ecole Polytechnique. Yes. Okay. Hi everyone. So thanks a lot to the organizer for the invitation. It's great great to be back in Torino. Um, so this paper is a joint work with Michele Fabi. At, with a postdoctoral student uh, at Ecole Polytechnique. He will be on the market uh, next year, so just uh, a shout out to him. And, and uh, so what we, so the good thing of uh, being in a workshop on DeFi is that I don't have to explain you what are decentralized exchanges and why we should look at them. Now, the question we ask in this paper is more, why do decentralized exchanges all look like Uniswap? to some extent, not exactly, but they are all kind of clones of Uniswap. Because in principle, automated market makers could come in all shape and forms, right? They are just algorithms, so people could have come up with many designs, but this design seems to be the dominant design. And what is very puzzling is that we don't really understand what they do when you think about it deeply. I mean, we can describe how they work, but what type of market structure they generate, what type of arbitrage they create, and more fundamentally, how should they be designed? These are more or less open questions, okay? Because they have arisen very recently. So, I mean, we are not the first to work on that. We are making fast progress. I mean, the, the profession is making fast progress. We are starting to, to answer this question and we hope to contribute to, to this effort. Um, now, in a sense, you can think of our paper as participating to a research program that has been outlined by Tim Roth Garden a couple of years ago. And uh, his vision was to understand automated market maker. We first have to, I guess, yes, we first have to clarify the design space, which is basically construct a language and a methodology to describe what they do, which is not so easy. And then once, only once we have that, can we start to build economic model to identify the different economic trade-offs that they generate. And eventually, once we have this, a good economic model, we can talk about mechanism design, basically um, propose well-defined objective function and optimal IMMs, right? Because right now, the way DeFi works is all through serendipity, people are Darwinian. It's a mix of serendipity and Darwin. So people come up with ideas. We don't really know where they are cool, but we don't really know why they work. They're non gem and uh, many of them fail and some of them work, okay? But uh, as scientists, we prefer to like, you know, first know why it works and, uh, okay? And, and the hope is that this will be a new phase for DeFi where instead of proceeding this way, we will really know what we are doing and maybe come up with better design that we have seen right now, or at least understand, understand what is happening. So uh, yes, let me go back. Honestly, we are not going to get to stage three. Our paper really belongs to stage one and two, and we hope we are going to make we are making some progress on one and two, as you will see. Now, what are our main findings? The first one is that the design space of constant function market makers. I will explain in a minute if you are not familiar with the term, but it's basically uh, Uniswaps and, and all its clones is naturally described by standard microeconomics. So this was very striking to us. So this, this is not really a deep paper I'm going to present, but one thing we were very surprised is that if you use your micro textbook, actually you can explain everything. It's like explaining a, a, a CFMM is a bit like asking chat GPT, translate a, a Mascolel textbook in a IMM language. And it's going to take all the theorem and it works. I mean, it's kind of amazing. And you will see why, because at the core, an IMM is a bit like a consumer. Uh, and consumer theory is really very nicely, uh, it's very easy to adapt. And then we, we're going to show that CFMMs are basically two sided markets with cross market externalities. So it will clarify what's happening inside a CFMM. And finally, we will be able to connect this ex externality, which opens the way to optimal design of CFMM. So if you don't have questions at this point, I will uh, proceed with the presentation. 
on the Wednesday. So uh, maybe I will be very quick on, on this because you know, I mean, it's, they've already been presented, but uh, a typical CFMM like is uh, like Uniswap is you have a pool, you put two assets, they can be n-dimensional, but typically they are two-dimensional. You have LPs that provide the assets, okay? In, normally in proportional shares, but not necessarily. And then you have the liquidity withdrawer or the trader that take one asset and against the other. Now the question basically, Okay, very simple here up to now. The question is, of course, at which price? So what is the exchange rate between, let's say, here USDT and Ether? Okay, at which price should you quote? And the idea is that you take a function, and if you take a, a very small trade, the slope of the function will be the price of a marginal trade. And if you take a big trade, you, you, you should remain on the function pre-post-trade. So pre-trade, you are on the, on the curve, the bonding curve. You do the trade, let's say you... You, so here, what do they do? So they put some ether, so they take some USDT. So you're going to move here, but exposed to the, you should remain on the function, right? And of course, it gives you how much ether you get in exchange of the, no, how much USDT you get in exchange of the, uh, of the ether. So it gives you the exchange rate, right? Implicitly, staying on the curve gives you the price of any trade. And, and hence the name constant function market maker because the function remains constant pre and post trade. Again, I mean, you could have do, done many other things, no? You could have done a pool and come up with many other pricing rules. This is just actually a suggestion from Vitalik Buterin in a blog post. That's where it goes back. He posted it with other people. I forgot the other, the co-authors. And okay, and people run away with it and it worked. Okay, so why, why, why is this and what does it do in practice? Now, if you think about it, okay, we have a two-sided market. Uh, we have a market with two sides, and we will show the cross externalities, but the liquidity withdrawers, they move along the curve. Okay, that's exactly what I've explained. And the liquidity providers, they shift the curve. So if you remember the way uh, long time memories from long time ago, when you did micro 101, that's how you got explained micro 101. No? The consumer, you have the substitution effect and you move here and you have this wealth effect and you shift and then you combine both and you get your total effect now again we all did that we got all tortured by this thing but the other thing is that it's not one guy it's like it has been split on both sides of the market which is kind of like amazing like one guy do wealth the lp do wealth and uh, traders they do substitution so now i mean basically you're going to take your micro theory and but it's going to apply on each side of the market and uh, make sense of what's happening so once you get this notion, so then formally, um, that's a constant function market maker. I don't know, the pointer is really a bit like, a, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, so you, so you have this function, R is the reserve before the trade, and then you have the input. So the input is what you put inside, and the output is what you get as a trader. And as you see, it has to be superior or equal. In practice, it's going to be equal because otherwise you will lose something. No. And... Uh, now the question is why, what, so I, we use you just to outline the similarity, not with Uniswap, but with consumer theory, utility, utility function. And uh, the question is, then you can have any shape, no? Which you is good? And what is the impact of the choice of you on the behavior of the agents, right? That's the open question. Can we take any function or should we, focus on a subclass of function. I mean, you already have a guess because I told you it's like consumer theory. So we're gonna impose standard assumption from consumer theory to get something well behaved, okay? But then we have to define in which sense something is well behaved, the MM is well behaved. So the first way to think about it is that you will have arbitrageur in this type of market, why? Because um, the Uniswap is on chain, is on Ethereum, for instance, so it's, it is updated every 10 seconds, 15. So it's lagging, okay? You have centralized market where they update every, I don't know, under, like um, inside the second many times. So the price on Uniswap will typically lag, but you will have arbitrageurs that observe the reference price on the centralized market and come to bring back the price on uh, Uniswap in line with the centralized market. But are we sure of that? That's the question. Are, we, are they doing their job? And micro... Theory tells you yes, because what is the problem of an arbitrageur is to optimize the reserve post-trade given the constraint, which is the CFMM constraint. You remember you air prime the reserve post-reserve, you should remain 
on the function. And if you remember your micro theory, it's compensated demand or Ixian demand, it's exactly that. You optimize your demand by keeping your utility constant. And we know it's a well-defined problem if your preferences are convex. So you take your mass collel and you get this theorem, which tells you that the price will be proportional to the gradient of the utility function, okay? And this tells you that arbitrage will indeed synchronize off-chain and on-chain prices whenever the trading set is strictly convex. So that's the first natural uh, restriction you want on uh, CFMM. Because if they don't have a strictly convex trading set, then you won't have synchronization because you may have multiple prices or not even well-defined objective. So we went from any function to function with like standard utility function, okay, which is a restriction already of the design space. Now, can we do better? Can we restrict the design space further? Uh, so first thing you notice, also from consumption theory, you know that uh, utility representation uh, Preferences are not uh, cardinal, they are ordinal. So if you take a utility function, you scale it up, it doesn't change anything. That's also something we learned very early. So this is also true for CFMM. You can take a CFMM and scale it up, it doesn't matter, okay? Any monotone transformation of the function of the CFMM yield the same behavior, they are irrelevant, like representation of preferences. So an example, if you take balancer with equal weight, okay? You can show it just a rescaling of Uniswap. So balancer with equal weight. Uniswap is just R1 times R2. You see, it's just the square root of, of a Uniswap. They are the same. Okay, they will generate everything. Everything will be identical. Well, it's maybe obvious, but I mean, I don't know. It's good to know. Now, what is more interesting is what you would like is that, uh, can we so reduce the space, the design space? So what you would like is when an LP comes in, Sorry. So let me go back. When it comes in, so it shifts the curve, you would like the price to not be affected, right? You won't like traders to take care of the price and LP just to determine the liquidity, but not move the price because you will have scrambling, no? The, you will have scrambling in the data, in the noise, in the price revelation process because a guy's provide liquidity and he shifts the price. It's probably something you don't want, okay? Now the question is which type of function give you that? And again, micro tells us the answer. It's homothetic class of function. So homothetic, if you remember, again, it's uh, when you take the expansion path. So if you go, if you take two consumers and one is richer than the other, they will consume the same bul bundle. The proportion will be the same, just the quantity will be higher. So expansion paths are linear. I don't know if you ring the bell. It's very useful for aggregation in macro. So then you ask uh, ChatGPT, what does it mean for a CFMM? And it tells you, if you want, uh, your liquidity provision to leave the price unaffected, you want the same restriction, which is homothetic. So here, what, what does it mean? If you take a ray from the origin and then you take the slope along this ray, the slope is constant. And this is true only for homothetic utility function. Now, what are homothetic utility function? It's a monotonic, monotonic transformation of a function that is one homogeneous. But I just told you that transformation don't matter. So all the CFMM that where well, you don't have the LP affecting the price must have a, utility, a function that is one homogeneous, which is a huge reduction in the size space. We started from which function can you use? And I'm telling you, most likely you want a function which is one homogeneous. Okay, so then we, it's a, they are much less candidate. And as you will see, if you look at the space, that's what they are doing. They are trading all the, <laughs> all the functions are one homogeneous in one way or another. So it's, it makes sense because this has the one that works. So I don't know how long do I have? 10 minutes. Okay, so that's the basic thing. So here it's really talking about the design space. So you can show more things. So I'm gonna go. So now what we're doing is, okay, now we have defined the design space. How can we connect both sides of the market and especially identify the cross externalities between both sides. So if you focus on trader, what trader wants is they have to have lower slippage. So this I'm going to skip a little bit. So slippage means if I execute a trade, okay, of this quantity, by how much will the price move? So if you have very little liquidity, okay, you have a huge slippage. If you have more liquidity, the slippage is smaller. So in principle, um, they like to have a big pool because they can execute bigger trade in a more liquid environment. Okay, we know that. 
Now, is it true in general? It's not true in general, but what we show is that if again and again, if it's homotetic and strictly quasi-concave, then indeed LP provisions do reduce slippage generically for all functions in that class. Okay, so, and it's not true for all functions. It's again making sense to have this restriction. Now, so that's a cross-externality, no? Why? Why is it a cross-externality? Because if I am an LP, I put more liquidity, it's good for the trader, which are on the other side of the market. You understand that it's an externality, right? I do something on one side of the market and the agent on the other side benefit. Okay. Now I want to look at the other externality. So what is the externality that going from trader to LP? So to look at it, another thing which is uh, interesting is that it's more natural to look at the problem in the dual space. So you have to shift from the primal space to the dual space and you define the, value, the portfolio value as a minimal reserve, the reserve that minimizes um, uh, the value of the portfolio, okay? So it's really the dual. So, and then you can use a series of lemma in, uh, again, consumer theory, Shepard's lemma allows you to recover demand and things, separability and concavity. You can establish everything. So the cool thing about the, this is that it's much more easy to talk about liquidity, alors, impermanent loss. I call them divergence loss. I don't want to talk about it now because I don't have five minutes, but I think there is a reason why divergence loss is maybe a little bit less misleading. And, uh, but it's the same concept. So as you explain, uh, um, the idea is that you start from here and now you have a price that changed to P prime and you have lost your portfolio. You should have stayed here. It was worse, it's worse to be in the IMM. Why? Because your portfolio has been rebalanced unfavorably, okay? You start here, okay, that was your original portfolio. The price has changed. Now your portfolio is like this, okay? Because it has to be, tangent to the new price, uh, but um, which means that you have more of the asset whose value has depreciated and less of the value of the asset whose value has appreciated. So you should have stayed here with a passive position. Now, what is the value of the passive portfolio? You just take the same, the new price and you pass it through your original portfolio and you go here and that's what you have lost, right? Visually, by being in the AMM instead of being passive. Now, the thing why it's not so nice, that's in the primal space. It's not so nice because H of P are just optimal point, no? Tangent to the set. Can I find a function where I can directly express the, the value of the portfolio? Yes, in the dual, you can do it. So in the dual, you solve your dual. Okay, that's your, uh, sorry. That's your dual, your value function. Uh, okay, I'm going, your value function here, but you can solve it. Uh, I mean, if you compute it, it's you can solve it even explicitly for Uniswap and you can plot it. So that's the value as a function of the price, the value of the portfolio. And now what is the in, in divergence loss? If I take the plane, the hyperplane that is tangent, no? At my initial portfolio, and then I compute the value of my portfolio after the price change, and I compare it to the value on the hyperplane, and that's the distance, okay? And why it's more practical is that V, everything is already encapsulated in V. I don't have to re-optimize V. The function, the portfolio value gives me all the information. Okay, so that's your divergent loss. Another way to look at it, if you look only at the two assets, so a relative price, you take the value, again, which you can compute analytically in many cases, and it's just the difference between the slope and the new value of the function at the new price. Okay, so that's much easier to compute than in the primal space, okay? So the dual space, so that's kind of cool too. So the primal space is a space for the solution of the trader, problems of the trader, and the dual space is a good space for to look at the problem of the LP. So this beautiful like analogy between the structure of the market and the structure of the mathematical optimization problem. Um, now, okay, so this I'm going to skip. So there's this famous result that you can always recover one problem from the other. So by applying, so if you are familiar with financial conjugate. Uh, for, I think it's so financial conjugate. So uh, you can always recover one problem from the other, that, which is cool. So yeah, I can get from the original problem, the, okay, the portfolio value and vice versa from the portfolio, I can recover the original problem, which means, and that's not, we did not prove that this was already proven by Angeris and co-author. Uh, um, so, which means that if you give me an objective, so, okay, so when I give you a, a constant, Function, uh, a CFMM, I give you the function. It doesn't tell you anything, no? 
I tell you the function is R1 times R2 or square root of R1 times square root. Okay, what does it mean? What would be nicer is give me a portfolio value. So this I understand, it's in dollar, and give me the CFMM that generates this portfolio value. It's nice, you see what I'm saying? Now you don't start with the, from the UT, you don't start from the CFMM, you start from the portfolio. So tell me a portfolio that is the value of, of this as a function of my reserve, and now give me the CFMM that will generate it, right? Much more economically sound and, and intuitive. Is it, I feel like, a, a, do you follow me? So can you generate, find the function that give you the portfolio value you want? And you can, because it's objective. So by applying this operator, you take a portfolio value, you apply the operator, you find the CFMM that generates it. So for instance, you want a CFMM that generates an American option? Give me the payoff of the American option, I give you the CFMM. Okay, it's generic. If you can do it, if there is no solution, there is no solution. But if there is a CFMM, it's gonna give it to you. It might be hard to do the operator, but numerically you can do it generically. Is it clear what I'm saying? Okay, so that's not us. So now, what? but this theorem gives us one thing that is useful is that since they are deeply connected by duality, we can show that there is a fundamental trade-off between slippage and liquidity. So here, I it's here in that graph. So here, if you look, that's a, CFMM with so much more slippage than here. Here there is, uh, there is no slippage, okay? It's like, it's very, oh, what you get is that if you have more slippage, the, your, the loss for the LP is, is smaller, okay? But you have more slippage for the trader and vice versa. You can reduce the slippage for the trader, but you have more loss for the LP. And we prove that it's generic. So that, that's the fundamental trade-off. There is no optimal CFMM in general. What you have is, if you put more slippage, you will attract LP because they will make, divergent, make less divergent loss. But you will have less traders because they will face more slippage. If you reduce slippage, okay, you will have less liquidity provision, but more traders. Okay, so you have the tension between the two. It's clearly there is an optima. The optima is to attract LP, no, it's to attract trader with slippage, so that you get some fees, but not too much because you discourage the LP. And this is a trade-off that has to be solved if you want to design an optimal CFMM. Now, what we've proven is that you cannot avoid it. It will be for any CFMM, okay? There is no CFMM that will solve this problem by making uh, you know, more slippage and uh, reducing in divergence loss. If you, in, in, uh, no, it's the other way one, like decreasing slippage without increasing uh, in divergence loss, okay? If you do that, you're going to necessarily increase divergence loss. Maybe it's obvious. I mean, I don't know. So, but this clarifies what we have to solve now. So that's, a, but, so that's the end point of the analysis. So let me, me repeat, is that microeconomics is a very natural language to de describe CFMM, really like the proposition of the paper unfolds very much like the proposition from a standard textbook. Um, once you do that, you are able to narrow the choice of function. So from any function, we didn't know what we can use. Now we know that probably we have to focus on functions which are constant return to scale and are complex, okay? Or homogeneous of degree one, which is, so then we are still have many candidates, but it's much less. And uh, it, we have identified the economic externality, cross externalities between both sides of the market and the fundamental tension that will have to be resolved if you want to optimally design your CFMM. Now, the next task is the one I showed you, step three, how do we do mechanism design on CFMM? For that, we need uh, to, uh, okay, solve this tension I just talked about, but this tension is anchored by the belief of the agent, okay? You need, I mean, if I believe, for instance, so it's called impermanent loss because if the price goes, change and comes back, you don't lose anything, right? So that's why I don't like the word impermanent loss because it's based on the dynamic of the um, price, right? Divergence loss, they just tell you that anytime you move away from the price, you lose something. But if you come back, you have lost nothing, right? But this is a dynamic model by definition. So to capture this type of tension, you need a dynamic model like yours, right? So what's needed now is a dynamic model because our model is basically static or two period if you want. Uh, and and then you have to embed the belief of the trader. So traders that believe the price will come back or LPs that believe the price will come back, they don't, they don't care about divergence loss, like in, mostly in a stable coins, CFMM. 
So what needs to be done now is to add to our model, uh, as I said, a dynamic model and embed the traders' beliefs and for different beliefs, find the CFMM. So the message, which is clear from what we got is that different beliefs about the price dynamic will generate different curvature. So there won't be a perfect CFMM. There will be a perfect uh, optimal CFMM given market belief about the dynamic of the price. And probably what we expect now, and that's what Uniswap V3 is trying to do, is to have the curvature that shift over time, right? Like an order book change slope, you want a CFMM that change slope based on the belief of the agent. Okay, but that's for future work. And we are working on that, but uh, okay, maybe next time, but yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, the discussant is uh, Nicola Borri from Luis. Uh, thank you very much uh, for um, you know giving me the opportunity to read this paper and uh, and discuss it. Um, so so I organized my discussion. So I'm gonna uh, actually I'm gonna give you a short overview of SACS and DAX. Uh, then I'm gonna talk a little bit very briefly about the contribution of Julian uh, and Michele's paper, and then add uh, um, a few comments. So let me let me you know. So I actually you know learned a lot by reading this paper, and you know this uh, paper. Uh, brought me to, to, you know, to read other stuff. And, you know, maybe you all know very well, I didn't. Uh, so I thought that uh, that was really nice. So, um, um, so let me just like uh, uh, recap how people uh, uh, trade, uh, you know, uh, cryptocurrency, right? So, uh, you know, traditionally, you know, investors trade in uh, um, centralized exchange and they trade, uh, uh, off chains and uh, these centralized exchange are organized uh, with the limit order books. Okay, so for example, we saw in uh, the previous paper, right? And um, uh, we know that uh, from uh, uh, the recent uh, work uh, by uh, Igor Vakarov and Treshwar that uh, a large part, actually the largest part uh, of the on chain uh, on chain flows, uh, is actually due to trading between. Uh, exchanges uh, exactly due to arbitrage activity, okay? And uh, what's the problem with the central like exchange is that uh, they in expose investors to counterparty risk, you know, from uh, exchange acts, uh, uh, default, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, we all saw what happened with, uh, with FTX, right? Um, and, uh, uh, you know, more recently, you know, starting in 2018, uh, the recent uh, uh, diffusion is that of uh, decentralized exchanges that uh, allow investors instead to trade on chain by combining basically liquidity pool with uh, uh, an automated market maker. Okay, and uh, an automated market maker is basically a smart contract that um, uh, allow investors to provide liquidity, DLP in, in, in Julian's presentation, or to take liquidity, like the liquidity takers. Now. In terms of relevance uh, at, the, at the moment, uh, um, trading volume on uh, central like ex is exchange is basically one order of magnitude larger than uh, the central like exchanges. Okay. However, you know we can imagine a future uh, in which uh, uh, DAX might replace SAX, and so you know that makes uh, the problem uh, really uh, really interesting. Okay. So this is from uh, um, a working paper by. Um, Barbon and, and Ronaldo. And so yeah, you can see the uh, trading volume on uh, uh, basically centralized exchanges in yellow and uh, uh, DAX in, in, in purple. And so you can see this is the log scale. And so you can see that uh, the difference has been, you know, relatively constant uh, at about, uh, uh, you know, one order of magnitude. And I was checking yesterday and, uh, you know, for example, on Binance, uh, uh, trading volume, uh, daily trading volume was 11 billion, and um, and on uh, Uniswap uh, V3, which is the top uh, uh, DAX, uh, is about uh, is less than basically one billion. Um, now, how do uh, uh, CX work? So they require deposit or crypto asset to the exchange, okay, and then investors will have to pay uh, exchange fees, uh, uh, gas cost when they have to, for example, withdraw the deposit. Uh, and they uh, cause delays, right? Um, they are based on an electronic limit order book and they are based on off-chain trade, 
Okay. So the delegated custody is the feature that expose investors to counterparty risk. Okay. So what about uh, the centralized exchange? So here, so this is important, uh, uh, custody remain with the users and uh, the trading is on chain. Everyone, you know, possibly can provide uh, uh, liquidity. Um, differently from uh, uh, sex, trade and settlement uh, coincide. Um, there might be execution delays depending on uh, uh, the chosen gas price and uh, on the congestion in the moment of the of the network. Um, now, at the core of uh, um, uh, DAX, uh, there is an automated market maker, okay? Um, that um, um, uh, is basically built around uh, a liquidity pool, which is, uh, as we saw in, uh, in, in, the, in the picture that Julian looked, it's basically it's a um, set of uh, supplied coins with some given uh, different quantities, okay? Um, liquidity providers can increase the size of the pool, but typically, typically they leave constant the share of each uh, component of the pool. Traders instead, uh, they exchange uh, one coin, say for, the, for another from the pool. So they alter the composition and um, the rate at which this uh, composition changes is actually the, the price that is set by the uh, AI. And uh, the trading function, uh, which only depends on the reserves uh, in uh, in the pool um, and uh, make sure that basically the uh, AMM only accept trade that leave the value of the trading function unchanged. That's why uh, constant uh, function marking may CF CFMM. Okay, for example, for Uniswap uh, uh, V2, which was, you know, the one that, uh, you know, everyone, everyone I guess, no, it's, uh, it's simply, you see, X, Y of the two quantities of two uh, coins equal to some constant, uh, constant value gain. Now, what does this paper uh, do? So it studies DAX from the perspective of economic theory. So if you read the, a lot of the papers that are out there, so a lot of, their, a lot of them are written by computer scientists and engineers, okay? So what is really nice of this paper, okay, is that if you have a background in economics, then you can understand, you know, the mechanism much better. Um, and uh, um, and it shows that we can learn a lot about DAX, actually thinking uh, in terms of uh, uh, consumer theory, in terms of, say, the mass color. And, uh, and so what are the, you know, the main uh, uh, take-homes from the paper? Um, in terms of optimal design, um, the uh, CFM should be homothetic functions. Um, uh, there is an analogy between, uh, say, the bonding curve and uh, um, um, the uh, indifference curves, you know, in the uh, in the consumer theory, and for example, price impact, you know, it's simply a marginal rate of substitution. Uh, so, you know, a lot of the things that we know, we can apply or we can use to understand uh, uh, these um, um, these markets. Uh, and finally, there is a trade-off between liquidity providers and takers that is actually encapsulated by the by the slope of the uh, bonding, bonding curve. And so, um, you know, there is the open question of uh, uh, how to design this optimal slope, uh, taking into account, of course, of course, this, uh, this state of. Now, I have three comments, uh, very simple comments that I have for, um, uh, for Julian and, and, and Michele. So first, uh, um, uh, so they, they, you know, in, in their analysis, they really focus on, uh, um, uh, uh, CFMM uh, like uh, the one in uh, Uniswap V2. In fact, they write, uh, uh, we restrict our attention uh, to CFMMs that quote prices only as function of their reserves. Uh, um, thus, we do not call the recent uh, CFMMs that fed, uh, feed additional data to their pricing algorithm by implementing on-chain oracles like Uniswap V3. Now, uh, of course, the, the pace of uh, you know evolution in this uh, in this market is very fast, and so for a researcher, it's difficult to you know to 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 keep the pace. However, um, you know Uniswap V3 uh, right now is basically one third of the market, okay, and then Uniswap Arbitrum One is uh, about one fifth uh, in the last few days. Uniswap V3 was not completely replaced, but is uh, less than one tenth, okay. So um, uh, I think it would be important, you know, to discuss also. Uh, these uh, uh, these functions in the in the in the paper. Um, uh, by the way, so Uniswap V3, uh, as Julian you know mentioned quickly, so let liquidity providers concentrate their supply 
around given price uh, uh, price uh, uh, price ranges. Um, then comment number two in, in this, this this section on no arbitrage equilibrium. Um, uh, that basically, you know, take the price uh, from uh, uh, CX that uh, are assumed to be updated more frequently, right? Than 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 DEX. Okay, so that these arbitrageurs they go from CX to DX. So, however, in reality, you know, there are several frictions uh, uh, that uh, will limit this uh, this activity. In fact, uh, you know, going back to the paper of uh, Barbon and Ronaldo. Um, they actually they document uh, a lot of uh, a violation of triangular um, arbitrage within a DAX, not even across, uh, say, a DAX and an SX. Why? Well, because of the exchange fees, of course, and especially the gas cost, uh, which uh, are uh, uh, not predictable. Um, and uh, you know, uh, you know, in terms of em empirics that one could do, it would be actually very interesting to sort of. Uh, repeat what the Makarov and Shor do for the Bitcoin blockchain uh, uh, to, to, to look at the flows between sex and dex. And so last comment, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, this is about writing the paper. You know, I know that modesty is a vir can be a virtue, but I would be more ambitious, you know, because this is a really nice paper. I mean, I, I you know, I really learned a lot. And, um, and you know, in some part instead, it's, it's, it seems that the authors, uh, you know, put it down, right? And uh, I would uh, push it more up, actually. So that's it. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, Jan, if you want to res quickly respond, and then we will uh, move to the questions. Oh, OK. Thanks a lot for the comment. So on the V3, uh, the short answer is like maybe a bit lazy, but uh, the real one is that uh, it's pretty messy, actually, the architecture of V3. Uh, when you think about it, like, uh, because what you get is that people can concentrate their liquidity. So you don't have like now, you don't have a curve. You have like, I don't know, you should imagine a series of steps now going on both sides and so on, which can take any shape. So yeah, it's becoming, it's becoming much more, uh, you cannot apply a micro theory so cleanly. So maybe we, we should be more explicit about that. Um, and I mean, clearly what V3 is trying to do, though it's connecting to our message is that the idea is that if you take an order book, the slope of the order book incorporates information, right? Getting more, less or more steep depending on the fear of the market. It's an index of the fear of the market. If you take Uniswap B2 or a static, a standard CFMM, the slope is independent of the volatility, for instance. In V3, because people can adjust their range, clearly the, the slope around the price will be affected by information today. And that's, they want to, go in that direction and uh, mimic the property, the nice property of a limit order book. Um, this varying information, varying slope of the CFMN. I'm not convinced that they, they found the best way to do it because it's a bit messy, but uh, yeah. So the violation, of, it's a bit cheap answers, but the violation of arbitrage opportunities, uh, yes, I mean, the model is very theoric, theoretical, sorry. So, I agree that in reality, we look at, let's say a perfect arbitrageur, it will bring back in line. Now, in reality, you will have arbitrage opportunity, delays, whatever. So you will be kind of, you know, there might be a delay. And actually I have a PhD student, she works on that. But here, since we are looking at the general problem, like in a frictionless environment, what we want to say is that if the environment were frictionless, synchronization would be perfect. In reality, it's not. And maybe you're right. Maybe we should add some information about this. Okay, but at least document that it's not perfect in the data. And finally, we have modesty. What can I say? It's too late. It's too late. <laughs> it's gone. We'll see. <laughs> maybe too. Yeah. So maybe I'm, someone will ask another question. Yeah, are there any questions? Yes. Uh, can I... Hi. Uh, nice presentation. Um, just a question about sort of this mechanism design part. So I was thinking like the optimal bonding curve depends on this trade-off, as you mentioned, between kind of liquidity uh, providers and um, the slippage costs for traders. And so is it fair to say that for stable coins, you want a flatter bonding curve, whereas for more risky pairs, a steeper one, because there's more divergent loss? So for this is already what we see in the market. So I think the, probably the, to me, the coolest of all uh, CFM is curve. Okay. Be with this function, which is like uh, 
Uniswap very far, but close to the price is pretty um, flat. I don't know if you know it works actually. If you look at the, it's very confusing the working paper, and uh, and so curve does that. No, it, it's pretty flat around the price, and it gets more sloppy around the, because at some point you want to avoid crossing the axis, so you cannot be flat everywhere, right? You see the problem. So if you're linear, you cross the axis, so at some point you will deplete the CFMM. So that's what curve does, and it's it's a cool design. And uh, now I think the future of CFMM will be CFMM that with uh, this flat portion change, you know, over time, depending on information that is gathered either by a, a, an oracle or by a participant that will ma make it more or less flat, you know? So if you have less fear, it's more flat. If the market has fear, if the LPs start to have fear about price drift, they should make it more, you know, increase the slippage. Like like an order book, that's what we observe in an order book with the slope of the order book. Is it answering your your, yeah. your point? Yeah. So that's that's where we're going, and that's what Uniswap V3 is trying to do. But the way they have done it, I think, exposes the, the LP to a lot of risk. Does, that does, might be the best way. I don't know. Does Does that mean there's no real optimal rule? It kind of just depends on like state of the market. So I think there is. A, my feeling is that there will be an optimal way to incorporate information in the slope. There's no optimal, you see the slope. If, the, if let's say the, we are in an environment where we the price move a lot, it's the VIX is very high. Then you, from the LP side, you want it to be the slope to be high to protect you. If the environment is pretty stable, like let's say you have stable coin and nothing is zero gone, then you want it to be very flat to maximize trading and fees collection. So did you see what I'm saying? Having that, and V3 is, is going, that's what they try to do. No, if you think about it, because people change the slope by, Coming in, in inside the IMM, no? It just makes it very non, non smooth, and the LP are very exposed to risk because when they submit a trade range, if the actual trades fall, the price falls outside of your trade range, you are really uh, arbitrage completely against you because you get the worst asset. You only get this. So you, it's very risky uh, the way it's designed for the LP, I think. Thank you. Yeah. There is a question at the back. Yeah, at the back. So, hey Julian, you began. I think it's a very cool, uh, very cool contribution. Yeah. You began with saying that for some reason Uniswap got copied. Well, there was a very good reason actually because Sushi yeah. retroactively gave the LPs a lot of incentive. Yeah, I think the contribution in terms of saying oh, ex post, I have axioms from macro that fit the homothetic one homogeneous structure is very cool. I think it's the, the way the curve comes into place is because of the asset custody and asset listing preferences of the liquidity providers and liquidity takers simultaneously. So if you look at curve.fe yeah, and how, how this straight line and uh, structure works yes. and what they call bonding slash binding curves in their extremely ugly white paper, yeah. they have Two kinds of tokens. They have the LP tokens, which are CRV, and they have a voting token, called, which is called CCRV, yeah, yeah. which you allow the LPs to change the APY. Now, what you're saying is if you want to get towards a more optimal homothetic one homogeneous function, you can have a vector voting mechanism instead of a scalar parameterized voting mechanism, where the LPs then say via CCRV every quarter, not only what is the API I want to harvest, from the liquidity takers who are the traders, but I'm in a position based on how much I stake to change the homotic function to what I think is optimal for the next trading horizon. This would be cool, but I think it's too theoretical. And then again, I agree with the other person who gave feedback. I think the paper is really cool. You don't have to be so humble. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So on, on, your, on your point, yeah, yeah. So, but the CCRV token, so voting token, it's too slow. So in me, I'm talking about like changing the slope, like in Uniswap V3, it could be like uh, in a minute or so. I mean, I don't want, I mean, I have an idea, but like, okay. So I think we wait, but I'm it's just an idea and we start to think about it, but and so other people are thinking about it. You could have a second token that controls the slope, a second pool that controls the slope. I don't know what is going to be the... I mean, and we're not going to come up with the optimal <laughs> CFMM right now on the spot. What I'm saying is, you're right. I mean, I think, and I think Curve has a lot of the answer because when you look at Curve, it's not obvious at all that it's homothetic. It took us, actually, we had a proof in the first version of the paper where we show it was not homothetic. 
And then a guy told us, no, you're wrong. And then we went back to the white paper and we had not understood the white paper, like 90% of people, it's, it's very obscure and it's homotetic, but it has this beautiful flexibility. And I think that would be a good, uh, that's one way of, but now the voting thing for the slope is too slow. It's every, uh, no, they can update the slope, but it's a governance voting, no? That's what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I think that, I think that, yeah, I think yeah. it should be continuously. Uh, yeah, yeah, we can talk about yeah, it. Yeah, it's one o'clock. Maybe we yes, can continue yeah, the discussion yeah, yeah. Uh, over lunch. Um, I say thank you very much uh, to the discussion, the presenter, for uh, this uh, uh, excellent session. Thank you so much. So the first presenter of the career Q&A um, will be Helen from Tezos, I hope, yes, Tele Helen from Tezos. So basically the career Q&A is about, is for the students and it's, it, it should give you an overview about what is currently going on in the DeFi space. How can you apply? How can you get in touch with our sponsors? So the, as I said, the conference is sponsored by five sponsors, 0x, Tezos, Zcash, Pool Together and Algorand. And um, yeah. So uh, Helen, I'm 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 happy that you could make it to present something about Tezos, and I'm looking forward to your short presentation. Thank you, thank you for the invite. Um, it's it's a, a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you to Lorenzo for the organisation. Um, I'm just going to start by sharing my screen. I've got a number of um, slides to run through. So can I just check you can see my screen? Okay. Yes. Excellent, thank you. Um, so my name is Helen Roberts. I'm based in Switzerland. Um, I'm a member of the operations team uh, for the Tezos Foundation. So um, yeah, we're based in, in Zug in Switzerland. I'm very new to the organization, so uh, or the ecosystem rather, so please um, bear with me. But my um, previous role was working for an insurance-based private permissioned blockchain. And prior to that, I worked for a global bank and a global insurance um, company. So I'm conscious of time. I'll try to, to go through this quite quickly. Um, so I'm just going to give you a brief overview in terms of what is Tezos, um, to have a look at some of the use cases that we currently have in our um, ecosystem. And then obviously the main discussion point, which is uh, potential career opportunities uh, within the Tezos ecosystem. Um, so what is Tezos? Uh, we're a security focused, self upgradable, energy efficient proof of stake blockchain with um, on chain governance. Um, and we have a very broad ecosystem. So we have five ecosystem teams um, on five continents. Uh, we've got uh, hundreds of projects in the Tezos ecosystem. So there's, there's too many to go through. Um, they're very varied. Um, but the four verticals that we mostly um, have use cases in are the sort of art, NFT, collectible space, uh, gaming, DeFi, obviously, hence us attending here today, um, and then the infrastructure space as well. Um, so generally, we're seeing very strong network usage and an increase in um, NFT sales as well. Um, so this is just an example of some of the non-financial based use cases. Um, so, for example, we have um, Electus, which is e-voting, um, the ability to launch a digital voting application in the ecosystem, uh, vouchers and, and coupons so that you can create uh, coupons and vouchers to be spent. Uh, gaming, I, I obviously mentioned, so it's um, we have a, an NFT playable AAA game. And then um, other examples like Gap, for example, uses NFTs to engage the community and market their, um, their clothing in new ways. Um, but just to look at the more financial based use cases, just to give you um, a flavor of what we have in the ecosystem. Um, so in terms of um, uh, the DeFi structured products, uh, they range across lending and borrowing. Um, investment strategies, interest, business, funding, liquidity pools. So there's basically several platforms which offer uh, decentralized structures products uh, that rival traditional finance. 
So allowing users to invest in financial products linked to various Web3 based assets. Uh, so common assets include FX trading pairs, crypto options, um, and then in terms of the AMCs, the asset management companies, uh, they're on the rise and they allow the easy um, investment opportunities to reap staking rewards. And the structured products also help to solve um, the uh, liquidity challenges. So the, the why here, Uves, um, this is a tool for asset creation and management. I'll just call out this one example uh, due to time. Uh, it's a really nice platform to show what our DeFi platform, sorry, portfolio offers. Um, it does have an AMC and several investment products, for example, borrowing against crypto and uh, yield generating assets. But, um, but yeah, check it out. Have a look. It's very, very fascinating. Uh, so in terms of tokenization, so for example, representing ownership or investment in a real estate in the form of um, a blockchain based um, token, uh, this real estate tokenization is just one of the um, tokenization use cases. Um, so Equisafe here on the right hand side is an example of a real estate tokenization platform. And we also have Society Generale, uh, which is obviously a large institution which is using Tezos uh, to launch security tokens um, and other structured products. And sorry, I should mention here as well that under Swiss law, tokenization of equity and debt securities is legal. Um, so the regulation is favorable towards DeFi, which is important for the Tezos ecosystem um, as the foundation is based in Switzerland. Um, so just to move on to the core cool part of um, today's presentation, so how to enter the, the Tezos ecosystem, um, there's no one direct path where an ecosystem which, can, which consists of um, a number of entities, um, so there could be various different entry points for university graduates. Um, the whole ecosystem was launched in 2018. And we operate more of a, an international ecosystem of startups rather than um, established companies. Um, we do foster values of continuous learning through educational budgets. So we're very much encouraged, uh, encouraged to do professional development, um, external certification courses, um, and obviously conference visits where we have the opportunity to network and, and learn more about um, the ecosystem. So there, we, we've differentiated the sort of three pathways to become a working stakeholder in Tezos. Um, the first route is, is where I'm based, which is the Tezos Foundation um, and its closest partner entities. For example, we have um, another entity in the ecosystem called Trilitech in London, uh, Nomadic Labs um, in Paris, um, and we're here to help everyone find the right place in the ecosystem. Um, and those roles and positions, I mean, I, for example, found my role on, on LinkedIn, uh, so we do advertise and, and publicize either on our website or through social media channels for potential um, job openings. And we have a mixture of uh, remote positions and, and hybrid positions with obviously the you know, flexibility of, of working conditions encouraged as well. Um, and then in terms of the ecosystem projects, there are many different um, startups and projects in across all the verticals, so DeFi, arts, um, gaming. Um, so you, there is an opportunity to enter the ecosystem um, by approaching one of the, the ecosystem projects directly. And then the, the third track for those who, who are more on the entrepreneurial side is to build your own project. Um, and the success of Tezos ultimately depends on the size and the continuity of projects in the ecosystem. Um, so we would, of course, encourage you to have a look at your own projects and become an entrepreneur within our ecosystem. We have two different or three different types of funding available, but the, um, the, the funding route, which is the most common, um, is the grants that we offer. Um, and the purpose of a grant is to um, support projects. Uh, which are for the wider benefit of the Tezos ecosystem. Um, there are also um, investment opportunities as well. So if your project is more on the full profit um, side of things, we do also consider investments into startups as well. Um, and then banked is a, a more for discrete uh, one-off projects. 
Um, so yes, those are the, the three different tracks. I hope that was helpful. Um, in terms of getting in contact with us, if you're interested in joining Tezos and becoming an active part of our ecosystem, you can either contact the Tezos Foundation directly. Um, I've put a link there to our website, but also happy to, to have any emails. And I know that I'm probably one of the, the, the ones that can't stay um, longer in this session today. So if anybody does have any specific questions about Tezos, DeFi, or the broader ecosystem, then feel free to reach out to me directly. I will share my email address. Um, the grants platform I mentioned, if anybody was interested in um, applying for a grant, we do have an online grant platform uh, where you can apply online directly to us. Oh, sorry, my, my email address is below. And also for my team members, um, and apologies that Jacob and Raphael, um, who focus more on the DeFi side, couldn't be with us um, today. And of course, follow us on, on social media. Uh, we didn't mention LinkedIn there, but it is um, a, a, a very regular go-to to, to look at um, various vacancies as well. So I'm gonna stop sharing at this point. And um, yeah, very sorry that I couldn't stay longer for this session, but I'll, I'll happily take any questions um, via email afterwards. So I'll let you hand over to the next speaker. Thank you, Helen. This was really informative. Thank you. Hope you enjoy the rest of the session. Thanks, yes. <clears throat> All right, then now I guess it's uh, Gabriel, it's your turn from Zero X, the main sponsor of the conference. Yes, hello. Hi. Yes. Um, Hi. My name is Gabriele Rico, and uh, I'm here to represent uh, Zero X DAO today. Um, in fact, the, the sponsor for the conference is uh, Zero X Eve, which is a subcommittee for the Zero X DAO. And um, I'll just make a brief introduction, uh, share my screen. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Yeah, now we can. All right. So basically, um, just to um, clarify, Xerox is a protocol for exchanging value. So with the aim of facilitating the swap of token on public blockchains. It was originally developed by Xerox Labs, which is a centralized company. And uh, it is currently on the path uh, to complete decentralization. So the DAO comprises a set uh, of organizations and subcommittees, um, which are in charge of specific tasks within the network. And um, as you can see from the screen, um, we have a set of uh, organization, which is the Zero X Treasury and Zero X Eve. The Zero X Treasury was uh, initially funded by Zero X Labs and is currently owned by the Zero X holder. So uh, the active Zero X holders um, have voting power, and the Zero X Treasury is uh, it's it's uh, it it it. it operates on a smart contract, on a treasury smart contract, and is, uh, its uh, operations and grant distribution is fully uh, managed by the Zero X holder, holders. And Zero X Eve is a subcommittee which was funded by the Zero X uh, treasury through uh, a public uh, community initiative, which was voted upon by the Zero X holders. And uh, the Zero X protocol itself is managed by uh, as the Zero X governance, which is now, if you uh, follow the the actions on GitHub and on the public social media, you'll find out that uh, Zero X governance is currently in the process of um, switching to fully decentralized. So now the Zero X governance is at the same level of the Zero X holders. But uh, in a few weeks, uh, it will be below them. So the zero X holders will be um, fully in control of the treasury, 
the protocol and uh, indirectly of uh, other initiatives. The Zero X Eve initiative, for example, is a subcommittee of uh, five signers that is um, uh, in charge of evaluating smaller, smaller projects, so smaller grants. Whenever a project um, wants to build some, whenever an individual or a project uh, wants to build something on top of Zero X, uh, uh, or with something uh, that benefits the zero X communities or some tools uh, for anything that regards the zero X ecosystem, then um, they can apply to the zero X Eve for an amount up to $50,000 uh, equivalent. And the conditions are stated on, uh, on the zero X website under docs.zerox.org. Um, and so also the functioning of the zero X treasury and the voting process uh, as well. The DAO is uh, fully decentralized, so it doesn't uh, directly um, hire, uh, but most of the entities contributing to it are private companies or, or individuals. Therefore, the DAO does not directly offer job positions. However, uh, contributors to the DAO are funded, among other sources of funding, through DAO grants. Um, the Zero X uh, Treasury operates fully on chain. So, every single, and this is also relevant for uh, individuals that want to apply for a grant for a project on top of Zero X. Um, it's um, there's a, a process which uh, uh, entails a, a public forum discussion and then a subsequent uh, on-chain, uh, off-chain vote, uh, so-called temperature temperature check to to see whether the the on-chain vote uh, has uh, high success, uh, high probability of being successful, and finally uh, there is uh, an on-chain voting. Zero X Eve, on the other hand, uh, works on a more streamlined path uh, where the subcommittee has uh, has been pre-allocated some funds uh, and has the mandate to spend uh, on uh, projects that benefit the, the Zero X ecosystem. So there, the 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 whole process from uh, grant proposal to grant receival is is much much faster. Uh, the Xerox Eve evaluates projects on a discretionary basis, and the principles uh, by which it abides are clearly stated on the forum and have been also voted, uh, uh, voted on by the community and approved by the community. So, grant candidates should visit the governor section on the docs.zerox.org website and uh, uh, can also redirect to Professor Lorenzo Schellenberg. Um, uh, as a closing remark, uh, um, I would like to uh, stress uh, a few points, actually two points, that are relevant to uh, working with DAOs uh, for a prospective uh, job applicant. And is uh, A, that uh, DAO participation can provide unique experience and credentials uh, that could uh, help get a job after graduation. And two, um, we're seeing a, a trend, a proliferation of university blockchain clubs in the US that had been delegated the voting power by protocols and venture capitals um, that actually give them real power in the voting. And this is um, very significant in my uh, opinion, because the purpose of having a an efficient and effective um, on-chain governance uh, is to uh, achieve decentralization, both technically, technologically, and um, uh, effectively. This means that uh, normally the voting power tends to concentrate, and uh, these initiatives of delegating voting power are aimed at uh, giving voice to uh, groups that can actually bring forward, uh, forward uh, proposals and discussions that uh, benefit the community and uh, 
yeah, that's it. So I'm 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 open for questions. Nice, thank you. Does anybody have a question? Online, maybe. I'm not sure if I can see them. Actually, I have a question. So, are you do you are you currently searching for some applicants in the graduate applicants or? So uh, there's a few. Uh, there's actually a whole ecosystem of company that built on top of Zero X. The Zero X Lab. Labs uh, has some open positions that are available on the, the careers.0x.org and they are senior positions. Um, uh, other companies might. There is uh, actually, I think the best thing for me uh, would be to send you a slide with all the projects that are building on top because some receive funding from the treasury, some or receive funding independently. Some are exclusively focused on building uh, front ends uh, uh, or tools for zero X. Uh, some are not exclusively building on top of zero X. Uh, uh, but uh, these companies, of course, they are private companies, and they, and they are actively looking for uh, for candidates. So uh, there's no central hub for checking what open what open positions are available, uh, but definitely checking on the websites of all these companies that um, that work on uh, on top of zero X uh, will be beneficial. As I mean, zero X is uh, pretty known in the community. It's a it's a it's mostly a protocol. So there is also Matcha a project that is privately developed, which is an interface. There's Trader dot X Y Z. There's a ton of projects that are built on top. There's a ton of decentralized exchanges that pull from zero X API. So it's really difficult to um, also not working directly for zero X labs. It's really difficult to uh, to tell how many uh, job opportunities there are. But definitely, it's um, the, uh, probably the best place is the Discord where we all meet for. Uh, for discussion and communication. And there, there will always be someone who will be uh, available for routing anybody, even junior candidates to the right position, to the right place. Perfect. Okay, thank you, perfect. That clarified the question. Cool, then uh, thank you, um, Gabriel, for this introduction and the, the, the uh, your, yeah, your short presentation. Then I would continue with uh, Zcash, Jason McGee, and his um, his colleagues. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Nice meeting you guys. Nice to meet you as well. Do you want to? Okay. Yeah. Then the stage is yours. You can share the screen. I hope it works. And um, yeah. I can't hear you. Uh, Jason, so muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, I think so. We're going to give you first an overview of what Zcash is. Um, and Amber, who's a member of the Zcash Community Grants Committee, is going to start. Hi. Yes. So the way I think of Zcash is it's the fulfillment of the original aims of cryptocurrency, which of course at the time had nothing to do with investment or making profit. And I think this just happened as a natural consequence of people realizing its value. But the original aim was to create a payment system, a monetary system that could work over the internet. But the people who were working on this internet money in the 90s and the 2000s were cypherpunks. And the value system that was motivating cypherpunks was uh, centered around human rights and specifically freedom and privacy. So the goal in creating cryptocurrency in the first place was twofold. It had to be decentralized so that entities like governments 
should they be taken over, for example, wouldn't have the ability to interfere or take away an individual's ability to use money. But it also had to be private so that people can't be discriminated against because of their financial choices or targeted because of their financial positions. And so when Bitcoin was invented, it was really exciting because it solved one of these problems by being decentralized. It makes it so that transactions are made directly from person to person without needing the consent of a specific agent. And then everyone who's participating in the system becomes a witness to a transaction. And so you get this guaranteed kind of agreement that you would otherwise require a central entity like a bank to be the arbiter of what did or didn't happen. But it didn't actually solve the second half of the goal, which is privacy. And that's really necessary for preserving individual freedoms. And not only did it not solve it, it actually exacerbates the problem because the whole design entails that everybody has a record of everybody else's transactions and their wallet contents. And so of course this was understood by the people who were working on it at the time and it was considered a crucial problem to be solved before Bitcoin could be used for its intended purpose. But we just didn't have the technological ability or the solution uh, to be able to do that part of it. And so what Zcash did was to take Bitcoin otherwise exactly as it was. So having all those decentralization properties, the fixed supply, um, the ability to prevent double spending and everything that you would want out of money. But it added encryption right on the blockchain using zero knowledge proofs so that every participating node would still be able to witness and verify that all the transactions are correct and come to a consensus about that, but without having to learn who sent how much to whom. And so it is really what Bitcoin aspired to be in the first place. Okay, um, I'll go next. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for having us. Um, my name is Jason McGee. I'm a member of the Zcash Community Grants Committee. Um, this is my second year serving on the committee, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Zcash Community Grants Program. Um, so, so one of the things that differentiates Zcash from other proof-of-work coins is that we have something called the Development Fund. And what that means is that um, for every block that's mined, 80% of the block reward goes to miners, and then 20% goes to this dev fund. Um, and the purpose of the development fund, it's, it's to support ongoing development of the Zcash protocol and the Zcash ecosystem. And there's three recipients. Um, the first recipient is the Electric Coin Company, um, and they are the primary contributor um, that develops and maintains the Zcash protocol. Um, the second recipient is the Zcash Foundation, and they do things like research and development, um, education, and community governance. And then the third recipient is this grants program, the Zcash Community Grants. Um, and, and the grants program receives the largest allocation. It's 40% of the dev fund, which is um, you know 8% of the block reward. And over the course, course of four years, that means that the grants program will accrue a total of 420,000 ZEC. Um, and our, our objective here is to fund independent teams to perform major development for the public good of the Zcash ecosystem. You know, basically, like our objective is to bring in new teams into the ecosystem, give them some money so that they can help build on top of Zcash. Um, we primarily fund projects that um, advance the usability, security, privacy, and adoption of Zcash. And these projects can be both technical, such as like new wallets that support private transactions, or they can be non-technical, such as you know, education or, or marketing initiatives. Um, the grants are selected by um, a five-person committee, and you know, four of us are here today. Um, we're elected to our spots by the community on an annual basis. And we really see ourselves as representatives of the community. Um, in fact, community sentiment it, on grant proposals is a factor that we consider when we're reviewing and deciding whether to approve or reject a grant. Um, we have this public forum where community members can comment, provide feedback, um, all before we make a decision. Um, you know, we're, we're also bound to some pretty strict transparency requirements. Um, we have biweekly meetings where we make decisions on grant proposals, and those meetings are memorialized um, in detail um, and published on the forum. 
Um, our financials are also public so the community can see the history of what we funded, how, how much we spent, and then how much money we have left for future projects. Um, so, so just to sum up here, you know, I think the Zcash Community Grants Program, it's this really cool collaboration with the community um, that provides Zcash with um, sustainable funding from block rewards to fund development of the protocol and ecosystem. Um, it's also a great way for people like yourselves um, to get involved with the community and to get paid to work on interesting projects. Um, so I'm going to hand things over to Michael, who's going to give you some examples of, of grants that we've funded in the past. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, like J Jason gave us a really good rundown. It's a very open-ended program and uh, very experimental, and we are trying to do exciting things with the block reward. Let's take a look at the sorts of things we've funded. So you can see here's the mining reward, and it's coming into us, the grants program. We've funded some private from some public privacy infrastructure via Tor. Tor is building a Rust implementation of Tor, which should be very good for network privacy of a lot of projects, Zcash included. We funded several wallets, Y Wallet, which is currently our crown jewel. It's very fast. If you want to try out Zcash, I would thoroughly encourage you to install this and give it a try. We've also funded a new wallet called Zingo, as well as Nighthawk, which also provides some other uh, in ecosystem apps. They do a block explorer. They provide light wallet infrastructure, and we really value them. And our heart goes out to them for the great service they provide. Uh, we also have uh, Zcash Media, pretty interesting grant we funded. Uh, they um they made a AAA super high quality glossy documentary about the origins of Zcash. And if you've ever wondered how Edward Snowden ties into the origins of Zcash, I would encourage you to check out Zcash Media's productions. They did a nice job packaging up that compelling story. Uh, additionally, we will of course fund any kind of extensions to the protocol. Uh, at the moment, I think the largest grantee and most exciting is Kedit to that end. Kedit is building what's called ZSAs, which are shielded assets, which would be other assets than Zek that are transferable and live on the Zek blockchain. Sort of similar to what you see with ERC-20 tokens. Um, these would be a token that represents a different crypto asset or something else. Uh, this is the first step towards DeFi on Zcash and a lot of other really cool things. Hopefully we end up with smart contracts, but uh, these are exciting things for us that we would love to fund uh, people to do. That all being said, these are exciting things we've funded. They're, things we, they're the categories we expect to continue funding, but we are open to all kinds of creative and exciting ideas. If you think that you can bring value to the, uh, to the Zcash uh, ecosystem with whatever project you have in mind, I would invite you to submit a grant. Go to zcashcommunitygrants.org. Uh, click get started, click submit a grant. I forget what the button says, but please uh, reach out to us and uh, make a request for your project. Uh, we would love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, that was a really lively presentation. I like that. Is or Are you finished? Or I think we have one more. Uh, Brian? Oh, okay. uh, yes, I was just going to um, share my screen here real quick if I can. Um, so yeah, I just want to, uh, show everybody a few links real quick. Um, the first here is zcashcommunitygrants.org that Michael was talking about. Um, if you click through the website in various locations, you will find information about our grant program, our funding sources, uh, what we're ready to fund and the grant application process. Um, one thing that also I don't think was mentioned previously, but if you go to zfnd.org slash grants, um, there is a new initiative that was started by the Zcash Foundation, which is called the Minor Grants Program. And the Minor Grants Program uh, exists to fund smaller initiatives uh, that contribute to the, the Zcash Foundation's goal of financial privacy, which includes the Zcash's, uh, you know, the mission of Zcash. Um, so this is a great opportunity for folks that are looking to uh, get funding for smaller initiatives, uh, like $25,000 or less. Uh, the next website I'd like to discuss real quick is uh, wiki.zechub.xyz, and that's Z-E-C-H-U-B.xyz. 
this website is a project that was funded by our committee months ago. Uh, it has a range of decentralized resources that are created by multiple independent uh, contributors in the Zcash ecosystem. Uh, the site is intended to be a hub of knowledge for the Zcash ecosystem. You can find information that's been compiled about Zcash ranging from the basics about how Zcash works to learning about how to engage with various social and organizational aspects of our ecosystem. So you'll find links to uh, different aspects of social media, uh, the forums, uh, different um, Telegram and Discord groups, uh, various Twitter pages for the different organizations like the Electric Coin Company, the Zcash Foundation, Zcash Community Grants, uh, and different thought leaders within the Zcash ecosystem. And then finally, uh, the last site that I'll bring up is forum.zcashcommunity.com. Uh, this is a great uh, place to go to check out what the current discussions are surrounding Zcash, um, the various grants, the state of the ecosystem, and to engage in discussion about the strategic direction of Zcash. And that's all I had today. Perfect. That was uh, more than enough. Thanks. I, rem I remember the few slides I was also applying there for the grant to organize this conference and the process was smoothly. So thank you guys for presenting and representing your DAO slash company here. And um, yeah, we keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you. So then we can continue with pool together. Uh, I think it's Tiark. Can you hear me? Hi, yeah. Hey, Hi, perfect. everyone. Let me hey. quickly share my screen. Um, can you see it? It's starting, it's coming, yes. Awesome. So yeah, I'm here to speak about Pool Together. Um, that's a protocol promoting financial security by making the funds safe. Um, I'm Tiak, I'm community builder for Pool Together. And there are some links where you can connect with me. I'll drop a link to the presentation in the chat afterward anyway. Um, I'm a contributor to Pool Together. I'm getting grants for contributing to Pool Together. Um, and I'm a token holder too. And um, I'm here to speak about Pool Together. So what's that? Um, it's a blockchain protocol for price savings. Um, and when I say that, um, there's often... The more obvious question, um, what are price savings? And I want to talk about that for a moment. Um, price savings are basically no loss savings account that offer the chances to win prices. So instead of an APR, um, you get the opportunity to win outsized returns. Um, the idea is not new. It comes from traditional finance. It was actually introduced way back in 1694. Um, it got bigger in the 1960s and still exists all over the world with um, hundreds of billions of dollars um, deposited globally. Um, a prime example are the premium bonds in UK with 150 billion deposited and more. Um, every one in three people in uh, Great Britain actually have one of these accounts. Um, and they're distributing 1.35 billion in annual prices. Um, which is quite a lot. So it's an it's an interesting financial primitive, but it's an idea that unique, works uniquely better on the blockchain. Um, the question is why? Because it's proven to be fair. Everyone can verify who won when and why. So um, like in a traditional lottery, it's not like um, someone who works there maybe um, can, can have an edge by manipulating the RNG. Um, Everyone can verify it. It's globally accessible. Um, we know all around the world, um, not everyone has access to, to building, building wealth, to sustaining wealth. Not everyone has access to, to stable currencies. Um, the blockchain protocol can change that. It's fully non-custodial, so um, no one else has access to the funds. Um, and it's decentralized and you their own. And also on the blockchain, it can be very efficient. Um, Put together as open source software. It's free forever, built as a public good. And um, 
basically available for anyone to verify, validate, or adopt. So you can take it, make it better, um, or use it, use it for your own. Um, there's a study on price savings. A weird crypto, so it's a weird crypto use case. Um, there are many DeFi protocols. Um, not everything does something that that the real world person needs. Um, put together actually has a real world use case. Um, the study here I'm linking um, said that price link savings account are very popular. Um, so they're growing fast. They can replace wealth destroying um, alternatives. So in this example, um, it's called Mama. Um, it was a great substitute for gambling. And with that, help people to create wealth that wasn't there before. Um, this is basically the meme we write. Um, usually you have to risk all your money, put it together, um, helps you keep all your money. Um, but I want to zoom in on put it together a little bit. Um, I talked about what's the mechanism behind it. This is how the app looks. Um, it works in a way that prices are made up of the interest that accrues on all funds that are put together. So users can deposit into a price network, yield accrues on all those deposits, and this yield is then randomly awarded to the users in the form of prices. Um, right now, put together is live on four networks. Um, it's expanding on other layer twos like Arbitrum and um, DK. It's limited to the yes stablecoin, but I'll talk about that later. And our underlying yield source is Aave. So it's a modular DeFi protocol. It builds on top of others. The largest grand prize right now, you can see it here, is $5,000. Um, and the price are distributed differently across the networks. Um, one thing we're very proud about and what makes Brew Together so special is it's no loss. Even if you don't win, you keep all your money. Um, you can withdraw in full whenever, because as I said, the only thing that's being used here is a yield. There are no fees for using the protocol other than the transaction fees. Users have full self custody. And since Brew Together is live, there's zero hacks. Um, so summing up Brew Together is a 10 times better version of price savings account. It's a perfect DeFi on ramp for beginners because there's no other financial narrative that offers you low risk, but um, the chance of outsized returns. So it's a perfect place for beginners. And um, I'm biased, but it's a perfect place to deposit your stable coins. To speak about history, um, Pool Together was launched at the peak of crypto winter in June, 2019. It decentralized and open sourced all the code in February 2021. So we are still on the road of decentralization. Um, the version four of the protocol was launched in October and the luckiest winner ever um, deposited $76 and won 43,000. So it can be pretty life changing. Today, more than 11 million were won. We have um, currently over 50,000 unique depositors, people using it. And as I said, zero money lost. The path to decentralization, a lot of folders, over 800,000 pool has been distributed to user and there are zero admin keys. So um, the protocol is decentralized and no one can interfere with it. Um, the only way you can change parameters or upgrade the protocol is put together governance which is a fork of the governor alpha smart contracts. It's fully on chain and controlled by the pool token. We've heard a lot about this today, um, contributing or getting involved in a protocol is not that straightforward. There are many ways um, because there's a big community behind it. Our vision, just want to quickly, I see I'm short on time, so I quickly skip on that. And um, the, the vision, is that we will be the underlying infrastructure for price savings with the protocol. Um, it has a simple, secure, non-speculative use case. It's designed for social good. It works with small and big deposits. And um, the addressable market is huge. Um, you can see the flywheel behind it here. Um, if large prices attract a lot of people and they deposit more, that creates more prices. Um, and we hope we can kick it off. So what's next? 
um, a real world use case plus the next million people coming on chain um, creates impact. And this is what Proof Together was created for. Um, the protocol is um, shipping the next version pretty soon. The Proof Together hyperstructure that supports any asset. So it will not be limited to USDC anymore, um, which will be in our um, what I think a huge factor for growth. Um, it will be fully permissionless. So anyone can, um, can add pools. It will be autonomous and fully automated. So there's no central governance control over the protocol and the protocol will automatically incentivize corporations. Um, talking about how you can get involved in this, um, you can, if you're a developer, you can check out our developer portal on dev.pooltogether.com. You can um, see all the open source code there. You can see how to interact with it. Um, we have APIs and, um, and everything accessible there. Um, also, you're invited to build with, on top or around the Pool Together protocol. Um, there are grants accessible. We have a grants protocol. You can um, access it via poolgrants.org. We are happy to fund um, all the creative ways to um, make Pool Together um, do good. Um, and you can check out the user guide on docs.pooltogether.com to learn more. Um, I invite you to do that after this. Um, yeah, and I'm happy to, to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you, Tiark. This was really informative. Um, any questions in the audience? No, but uh, maybe they will follow up with you individually or on your Discord channel. Sure um, thing. So yeah. yeah, as said, there's no straightforward way, um, as others said before, to get involved. But there's a ton, a ton of ways, and um, we're happy to incorporate. Um, any of them on a personal basis. Um, there's a huge community of people that are involved. There's no central entity. Um, it's a protocol. So there are many, many different entities contributing to it. So um, for whatever you are trying to do, there might be ways um, to do it. Perfect. Thank you. Then we will continue with the last speaker in person. It's uh, Eva from uh, Algorand Foundation. Should I go here? Yeah, perfect. Okay, all right. Amazing. Well, first of all, thank you. Okay, I'm going to talk about Algorand and how can you find your own path, your own way into this amazing ecosystem. Well, first of all, I will introduce myself. Uh, my name is Evangelina Rodriguez Machado. I am from Argentina. I am currently living in Spain. I am a student engagement lead of the organization. And my role over here is to guide thousands and millions of students through the Web3 ecosystem. And of course, bring all the resources required to build a community of students and uh, to develop students, things like uh, clubs, events, a uh, different type of engagement and things. I encourage you to follow on me on, in, on Twitter, please. Then this is our main initiative for uh, from the Algorand Foundation for the students and of course for student clubs. This is Algorand Blockchain Clubs. We will be changing the brand right now, very soon. And I encourage you to, to follow us because we, will, we are like a, a we are having like a, a lot of resources and partnerships and things with students around the world. And of course with uh, communities and different organizations like BAF in the US and Cryptosphere in France and, and, when, and soon in another uh, communities like Middle East, China and yeah, mainly. And now when well, you already know what is, what is Algorand. Uh, Algorand is like a, it's a blockchain. It's like a, a world-class tech. Was built for scale 
and of course uh, to bring like a uh, millions of millions of users without any problem and without any type of issue and technical uh, problem. Our main characteristic of this, uh, this blockchain is about to scale the resiliency and of course the security. It was built by Silvio Micali, he's Italian, I love him, he's amazing. And thanks to him, he's a Turing Award and we are like uh, scaling and bringing more resources into the Algorand blockchain. Algorand by numbers, uh, we have like a, a lot of uh, transactions right, right away, like uh, by 7,000 uh, from, uh, from 10,000 TPS, which is very fast and allowed us to, to make many transactions without any stops. And of course, without uh, any issue or, or problem into the, the security of the blockchain, which is amazing. Another thing is like the low cost of the blockchain is like a, right now is 0 0.001 algo, which is less than the less than a one cent per transaction, which allow you to make like a millions of transactions with $1 or less. And now I'm going to talk about like a, the most important thing right now, but what about your career? What can you do in the Web3 ecosystem? And principally, what can you do in the Algorand ecosystem, which is like a, a wonderful ecosystem where you can find many options right now. First, nobody told you how hard it is to find a job in Web3. It's many things that you can came over and of course many difficulties and challenges that you are like a, about to overcome. I would like to take a time to talk about like a, two things that are very important right now. First, it's about to be part of the ecosystem. How can you start like a growing in any ecosystem that you're not part of it. So this in this in this moment, you have to be like a, a contributor or a builder into the ecosystem that you are part of it. So in this in this scenario, uh, you can belong to different communities, you can learn and bring like a different resources, you can also do things that are good for you and good for another people that follows you. Another thing is learn every day. In crypto, you know like a, how many things are around, how many, how much information, how crazy is this ecosystem? Sometimes it feels like a roller coaster. It's like a, sometimes it goes up and goes goes down, and then you find like a the sector to say something, and then you have China doing another thing. It's like a, you have to keep yourself posted. But of course, learning about like a, the different innovation and different things that came came up every day about crypto, not only Algorand or Ethereum or Polkadot or another blockchain, but what is going on right here? And of course, feel comfortable with that, that you're not here doing something normal. You are here in crypto, which is a madness. Another thing is find your soft skills. I would like to make some like a random comments about here. Before COVID, I used to be a lawyer in, in the government and I realized that being like a, a normal people, like a behind a desk uh, doing paperwork every day wasn't my real thing. So I just start like a going deeper in what I would like to do. And then I say like, a, yeah, I would like to change this. I'm jumping into crypto, learning about what is DAI, what is Bitcoin, what is like a cryptocurrency basically. And then I just start writing by myself learning by myself and start like a, getting some approach to this, this content. And then I jump into my first crypto job based on my soft skills, which was like a writing, talking to people, analyzing a lot of documents. And that was the way of how I jump in into the ecosystem. Of course, I start like a developing more my community in skills, learning English. I am learning Italian right now. <laughs> so uh, this is what I see. I, I mentioned you about like a, how can you grow over here? And lastly, is like a, don't be afraid to change your mind. I mean, if if today you are you are young and you want to be I don't know a researcher or an important scientific or a business developer or something, and you start doing the what you want, but one year after you realize that you don't want that, and you want to be like a, I don't know, an NFT collector or an artist or whatever. In crypto, we change every day. There is, no, there is nothing wrote in the stone, so you can change very easy. So 
this way I encourage you to do it. And of course, to find what you like, what you like to do. And of course, the final thing is like, a, just be the best version of yourself. Here in crypto, we are to make a real change into the, the world, to make a real change in the community, to change the financial philosophy, to change how art is going to grow, how we can exchange information of us. We are here to the open source world, and that's why we're, we have to keep it in mind and be very mindful about what we are building. And then, how can you start specifically as community builders, as developers, and as business developers? For example, for being a community builder, which what am I now right now? It's like a, you can be part of any community. I can even start moderating a Discord, or you can start like a posting information on Twitter, or you can start engaging or over social media. You can start creating content, learning resources, many things that you can do for your community. And that, that way you can be part of the ecosystem very actively. And of course, with a lot and a lot of attention. Then to become a developer, if you are technical, if you understand, how to write a smart contract, how NFT work, how DeFi work, how the architecture is built, and all of that, share. Share with the community what, what are you learning every day and what are you doing. That way you will create your personal brand, you can become a, a developer relations, you can become an architect, you can become whatever you want, but share, be, be, your, be your own boss. And lastly, as a business, if you are very good to build business, if you find an opportunity everywhere, if you have, I don't know, any entrepreneurship or any like a feeling of you can build whatever you want, you can be in crypto very easily. So these are like a, some minor examples. And then I have another story, for example, last year, Fred Estante, he's like a, a very good friend of mine. He's from Brazil. And Two, one and a half year ago, he joined the foundation as a Reddit moderator. I mean, a Reddit moderator. I was, he was like a, a very good guy who was like a, talking to a thousand of uh, users in Reddit. And the foundation talked to him and said like, hey, we need you because we can deal with this. He said like, okay, let's go. Three months later, he joined the foundation as a community manager, community manager of Brazil. Managing the Twitter, managing the community in, in Brazilian, of course, in Portuguese, sorry, in Portuguese, eh, in English, and it's like a, doing a very good job. And then three months later, he got an, an upgrade into his, his role, and now he's the head of product marketing in one year and a half. So imagine you can change your own path just being a good professional, just being look, just to keep in mind that you are doing a good job. So my, my thought over here is like, a, we are here just to support you. If you're very good, if you're good, if you want to be a champion, an ambassador, if you create content, if you want to help us to spread the word, or if you want to, if you want to help us like up, upgrading our learning resources, we are here for you and we are we will be more than happy to help you in your career. And then, of course, we grow with you, we build with you. And thank you very much to all for coming here. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if any questions, any thoughts. Happy to hear you. But you're around, so maybe they, if there's a question later, they can come up to you directly. Yes, of course. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter or write me on Telegram. Uh, I'd be more than happy to help you. And of course, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, sorry, there was a question. Can you just pass? Of course.
Yes, exactly. He's one of But well, I thought there was one in, in Torino, no? Or maybe there is one in Rome for sure. Nobody is there from Algorand. Okay. Is there a, because Silvio Micheli is Italian, so he has like exactly several in Italy. Okay, so they are not there. So we are we are the one in uh, so I'm leading the one in, in France and we are hiring. Amazing, amazing. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yes, the Algorand Center of Excellence, this is another different story, but it's something very cool. And imagine that having thousands of researchers and investigators doing cool stuff around the world, that is something that is very valuable for us. So yeah, join the foundation. It's like a, a wonderful place to grow. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, yeah, thanks again for the sponsors to present here. We will put the videos online and um, yeah, this will serve also in the future for um, students can read about it and listen again to the presentation. Cool. Then I would say we continue with the conference. Um, so we have a, the first, the next session is basically about CBDCs following, followed by the decentralized finance, a central bank perspective, the view from the regulator. And um, we start with Massimo Morini from Algorand and Bocconi to learn something about inside digital currencies. So here's the, there's, it's uh, there, the microphone. Yeah, here's the. So, uh, yes, actually, I am uh, from uh, uh, Algorand Foundation and from Bocconi, but as I was saying during lunch, <clears throat> I've been in, in Tesa San Paolo for almost 20 years. Also, in a sense, uh, I'm giving a perspective on, on this topic, which puts together a little bit of my experience in banking and my four-year experience in, in, in a public blockchain as, uh, as chief economist. I always think uh, that, uh, in a sense, uh, these two pieces of my career are totally consistent with, uh, with each other. You know? Because in my opinion, they are part uh, of the same story, which is an incredible long story, which is uh, the longest story we can talk about, because we actually give the name uh, history to what uh, uh, essentially happened after men started to write. And we may think that the first time that men decided to write, they wanted to make, maybe make some fantastic poem, you know, to the stars, to love, to the gods. Or maybe we think that they wanted, you know, to write something incredibly important from a, a scientific point of view, something about the movement of stars or any discovery. Not at all. The first time that men started to write, they were doing accounting. History starts with accounting. No matter if you look at Mesopotamia or China or South America, where writing started independently in different moments of history, the first records, and particularly the very first in Mesopotamia, deal with goods that were coming in and out of a temple. And essentially, men had to invent symbols for things, letters, essentially, and words, written words, and symbols for numbers, because that's the way you do accounting. So also mathematics started from accounting. And in a sense, we have a technical way of defining the kind of accounting they were doing, which is essentially single entry accounting a list of things that were going in and out. In Italian, we will say partita singola, even if it is an expression that we don't use. Why we don't use it? Because we as Italians, uh, or, or and also for those that are not Italians, but we are in Italy now, uh, uh, we, we are remembered for the second big uh, evolution in accounting. Even if to say the truth, the foundation of that comes from uh, Arab mathematics and economics, which 
could have not existed without Indian numbers that were the, the other big innovation that comes with the innovation that I, I'm gonna mention. In fact, there are essentially no other big innovations in accounting uh, until the Renaissance. In the Renaissance, uh, uh, Fra Luca Pacioli introduces partita doppia or double entry accounting. No? Double entry accounting, uh, and by the way, at the same time, he introduces Indian or Arab numbers uh, to the Western uh, uh, reality. And the reason for that is that doing mathematics with Roman numbers was crazy. You know the term abacus, at times we use it for a thing that kids may, may use uh, uh, to, to help them understanding numbers of mathematics. But originally abacus was a machine that you needed to have to make even the simplest computation in a way that was not too cumbersome if you were using Roman numbers. So it was impossible to make computation on a piece of paper as we do now with, with Arab Indian numbers, you know? What's the idea? The idea essentially is that you have no more one single entry. You are two entries because essentially for everything that happened in your economy, in your uh, temple, in your um, factory or whatever, you want to have recorded who is the giver and who is the receiver. They may be two, two accounts, you know, or they may be a, a client and a specific place of the temple where you decide to store a, a, certain, a certain good. And people who are more expert of these things than I am uh, actually claim that double entry accounting was fundamental for, for the birth of modern capitalism. The timing is perfect, you know. In particular, one thing for sure, uh, was allowed by double entry accounting, so more modern and much better ledgers uh, that in fact started immediately after, uh, immediately after and in the same places. It was modern banking. Banks that already existed as custodian started to use these ledgers. The beginning was essentially Venice or Genoa, then Florence became particularly famous for that, then Milan, then Amsterdam, then London, you know? Uh, essentially, bank ledgers based on double entry accounting create some magic. And this magic is what I tend to call the first digitization of money. Because essentially, they transform money from uh, gold or silver, physical gold or silver, into a record in their ledger. So much that moving money from uh, Florence to Paris stops requiring setting up a big cart full of money, but simply requires the headquarters of Medici Bank, for example, in Florence to send a message uh, in Paris that says that, the, I don't know, the King of France requires some money that is actually lent by the Medici family for example, to him. And therefore, we have actually to make a change in the ledgers of the Florence headquarters and the Paris branch. And money moves, wealth moves. The day after, after the message has come, the king can withdraw gold in, uh, in Paris, you know? Some people say that uh, the third big innovation in accounting is much more recent. And surprisingly, I I'm putting the Bitcoin symbol because then obviously Bitcoin is what made it implemented and visible. But to say the truth, the innovation had a real accounting technical background. In the 80s, a few researchers, and the most famous is the Japanese professor I'm, I'm mentioning, introduced triple entry accounting. It was a very geek topic, you know. It was the idea of using the relatively recently invented digital signature. RSA is from the 70s, you know, so essentially it was uh, uh, just invented uh, in accounting, adding to the giver and receiver their own signature. The signature of the giver to prove as a sort of contract change of property, 
and the signature of the receiver as a receipt, essentially. Notice that Bitcoin will be able to use it and build the system without the second signature, because on a public blockchain, that's not necessary. You see that money was received, you know? And uh, uh, yes, it was already in the dreams of Professor Ijiri that once this was implemented, all the economy would have been in the ledgers. Everything, the whole foundation, all the relevant events and their legal basis, essentially, you know? And we have seen this implemented in Bitcoin with some uh, un unexpected additions, you know, the fact that the ledger could be public, could be shared and immutable, you know, but more importantly, everyone could act there freely without intermediaries, thanks to the digital signature and then the idea of a consensus algorithm. Then we know the shortcomings of Bitcoin consensus algorithm, but we also know that in these years, uh, there has been incredible inventions, you know, that could allow us to go beyond proof of stake, obviously for me, particularly pure proof of stake uh, created by, by Silvio Michali, allowed, you know, to have consensus uh, without having waste, uh, uh, waste of energy, basing that on stake and not on, uh, on work. We had smart contracts, incredible innovation of smart contracts that extended this incredible idea of a decentralized ledger saying the things that were happening in, in the economy and how they had to happen to the implementation of sort of contracts, but actually economic agreements in the, in the blockchain. And then for me, the other most incredible thing that we have recently seen in blockchain is certainly DeFi that shows how smart contracts can be used also to create a real advanced financial market on, on blockchain. Um, uh, I mean, obviously, uh, unfortunately, in this presentation, different from the, the, the last ones that, uh, that I gave, I'm not talking about DeFi and I'm not talking about decentralized finance because I think that there is partic something particularly interesting for, uh, uh, for today, you know, also because how much uh, uh, regulators and so on are talking about that, which is the first apparent will of many regulators and institutions to actually realize this third big revolution in accounting and bring it into the reality of money. You know, that's the central bank digital currencies that they are talking about uh, so much, uh, of course. And I believe that maybe today is not so necessary for me to go through these slides, probably not for everyone. And that's, as, in a sense, a confirmation of what uh, Evangelina was saying about the importance of education. When I started talking uh, uh, about these topics, uh, probably 10 years ago, for me, my initial interest in blockchain, uh, most of the people did not know how money really works. Even people working in a bank like me, but in a, in a department different from a transaction bank. Uh, nowadays, there is much more information about that, thanks to the, the fact that blockchain put a little bit these, uh, uh, these facts under, under discussion. Uh, money uh, is done essentially of a triumvirate of uh, uh, types of money. There is one that, in a sense, we know pretty well, which is... Uh, uh, Cash, essentially, we know it because we use it and there's not so much to know. We know that cash is not even backed by gold, you know. So it's actually a, a, a physical thing that we have agreed to give a value with, with some form of support from the government, you know, if it is, if it is fiat money. But then there is the really relevant part of, uh, uh, of money which is commercial bank money. More than 90% of the money which is used by, by the public. And commercial bank money is a completely different beast. I'm pretty sure that everyone here knows that uh, commercial bank money that circulates as deposits is not made up of deposits representing money that is really in a vault. You all know that it is lent out, you know, after you, 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 you give it to the bank. It's a little bit more subtle, the fact that uh, 
not only it is lent out to, 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 uh, to borrowers, and therefore, in a sense, our deposits uh, are IOUs, as we say, you know, at times in, in English, that means I owe you. So they are debts, essentially. And so, yes, this, with this money, there is for us potentially a, cre a, a, re a credit risk. So if I, may, if I wanted to withdraw everything in the other form of money available to us, which is cash, I may have some issues because my money is not really stored anywhere, but it's been lent out. More interestingly, we have to notice that at times we have the idea that really, in a sense, our deposits are lent out uh, for loans. And this means essentially that, uh, uh, you know, if at some point a bank has used all of its deposits to make loans, if Joe comes and asks for a new loan, the bank has to say no for a balance sheet constraint. That's totally not true. And would hide a fundamental role of banks, which is not only to provide credit to the economy, is also essentially to create money, to take most of the decentralized decisions about money, money creation. Because what happens, guys, think of a, a, every time you have received a loan. Maybe some of you are young, have not yet bought a house by a loan, but it's likely that it's going to happen to you. You will realize that the day they give you the loan, and maybe you have gone to a bank you didn't have a relationship with because a friend told you, come on, these guys have a much better interest and better conditions, are more open to give loans to young people. And what happens the day they give you the loan? They open an account for you and they create a deposit equal to the loan. Their balance sheet equilibrium is maintained and they have completely created this money for you, totally. Essentially, money today is created through the decentralized decisions about how much credit to offer taken to ban from banks. You know. It maybe under some points of view makes more sense than a central bank that in the center of an enormous nation decides magically how much money the economy, uh, the economy needs. You know. But certainly, this is not said very often. There's this fantastic idea uh, the central bank controls the supply of money. The central bank controls many things. Look at, read the, read the, the old the paper that I'm mentioning almost uh, uh, nine years ago that explains how money already nine years ago was completely different from textbooks. And this was uh, its, uh, uh, its reality. Additionally, uh, they also point out that reserves uh, and the idea of fractional reserves uh, that in principle should be the way for uh, central banks to control the amount of money, you know, because the central bank requires that if you have, I don't know, 100 deposits, you need to have uh, something like three in cash. So the reserve is something like this, you know, three, four, five percent nowadays. Even this is not particularly effective because it's totally normal that banks every night require more credit from uh, uh, the, 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 the central banks that becomes liquidity, central bank money, using usually their assets as collateral. And therefore, central banks have never used this to stop banks to create money. If a bank requires more money because they have to make, to give loans, this always happens. If it doesn't happen, probably that, that bank is as will be. You understand what I mean, you know? So this paper says, guys, we do not control directly the quantity of money. We control it indirectly. For example, by imposing strict risk management criteria to give out loans, we limit supply. But that's the way we do it. And then, do you know how traditionally uh, money is moved by banks? It's not hard to understand how it is moved by myself with my Intesa San Paolo account to Lorenzo's Intesa San Paolo account. It's simple because it's one ledger. So in a sense, there is one, let me say an Excel worksheet, maybe something better, maybe not. But in any case, there is a macro that changes to entries, you know, reduces mine, increases this. Thing can be instantaneously and unexpensive. For some reason, banks, charge uh, uh, us steal something for this. It's a little bit ridiculous. In, in terms of Paul, it's not the worst. Second, what happens instead if we don't have uh, uh, an account at the same bank? Usually banks use an interesting techniques where there is an Ostro and Vostro account. 
And you may say, come on, Massimo, why are you still speaking Italian? Present in English. No, no, I'm using the English words. These two accounts are called Nostro and Vostro because the algorithm comes from the Renaissance, come from Northern Italy. Therefore, they use Nostro and Vostro everywhere. Yes, they are still using an old idea that basically means if I am bank A, let's say my bank alpha, and you are bank beta, let's say my client is A and your client is B, how can I, alpha, allow my client A to move money to B? We need to have reciprocal accounts, in which case I can give you money on your account with me and send you a message that say, please credit B. For me, it's not a problem because I reduce A. And for you, it will not be a problem because you have more money on my account and you can give it to this, uh, uh, to this guy, essentially. This starts becoming crazy when the two banks do not have the Nostro Vostro account. Uh, this means that they have to find one or more intermediary bank to create a chain of Nostro Vostro. And essentially, at every hope, to use the same term that you use in the internet for, for, the, for the, 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 the spreading of messages, at every hope, there is KYC to do, AML to do, but more importantly, there is credit risk and liquidity risk to do. That's the reason why banks prefer doing this transfer at a net level at the end of the day. And this explains to you because some of these transactions can take three days and have a very high fixed cost, like $50 which makes sense if you're moving billions and not if you're moving little money. Here in Europe, we are in a paradise. It's not so many years that we are in a paradise, you know, it's, it's probably 20 years, but we are in a paradise because we have an obviously an alternative way to move money, which is the fact that in uh, 20 countries or so, we have the same currency, which means the same central bank. In this moment, we are all alike in the initial simple example. There is one ledger. You need to change two entries at the same time with a script. It's real time gross system. Every order is executed in less than five minutes without having to do any netting, any controls, uh, um, anything at all. You know? I mean, not, not refer to this. And obviously you will have to do KYC of the, of the two clients and anything, but once you see, you, you see the difference. And also, in this way, banks actually settle a transaction among them in a different kind of money. Because the money that they hold and they only can hold at the central bank is not commercial bank money. It's central bank money in a digital form, something that they only can, uh, can use. You know? In any case, certainly is a sort of paradise. But there is something interesting because we understand the properties of the different forms of money. And we realize that commercial bank money does have some issues. Actually, it's low in settling, it's not credit risk free, and it actually has one big bullet to be digital. And that is why it needs to be king even in spite of its limitation. It's, it's 500 years that being digital makes it incredibly superior to the rest, you know. Uh, what about cryptocurrencies, you know? And the cryptocurrencies instead technically have the same features of central bank reserves, central bank money. No credit risk, uh, rapid uh, settlement, and they are digital. Unfortunately, I have not so much time to remember that essentially cryptocurrencies solve the free problems that do not allow, do not make it easy to actually create a form of uh, economy on the internet. Because in the internet, there is no identity for us. Cryptocurrency do this at the first level, a stable identity, not yet associated to a name and surname using digital currencies. Cryptocurrencies with consensus algorithm give a unique ordering in a decentralized form to messages and Therefore, also to messages that represent transactions. In the internet, because of the way it was designed for efficiency with the routers, uh, with the dynamic IPs for many machines and so on, there is not neither a unique identity that you can use. You, we could do that with digital signatures, but we are not. So that's the fact. Only the blockchain is doing it. Uh, yeah, we, we, we have uh, speed, thanks God. 
but we will may discuss also why speed should be given by providers, while instead the digital signature is something I can use on my own. I would only need uh, probably the government to associate my signature to my name once. See, I shouldn't go through someone to prove my identity in any case. And, uh, um, and with the distributed network, uh, they also avoid uh, that crazy centralization that as Google or uh, Facebook show, always happens when you are in the internet and you use a client server models. There is only one owner of the servers, we are all clients, and there is a natural centralization around one entity. Uh, the blockchain for something important like money eliminates that a digital form of money is owned by one single owner of servers, you know, but decentralizes it. Okay, what's the problem of CBDCs? CBDC seems a fantastic thing. You basically listen now, in particularly in Europe, but not only, uh, central banks saying, guys, we need to give uh, digital money to people. And so there will be CBDCs. And so you say, guys, we have eventually, you have eventually understood that uh, bank deposits are an issue because if you give people central bank money, not more credit risk, uh, immediate settlement, everyone will want that the deposit will not exist anymore. It be possible. We will see the limits of this, but could be possible. No, 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 come on. We have built a system based on banks. Uh, we will solve the problem because we will give banks this money to manage and they will do the transfer of this money exactly as they do now with bank deposits. And then we will put uh, quantitative limitations. And the, the limitations are coming out now. We, we go from 20,000 maximum for per, per person in UK to a proposal of maximum 600, 800 euros from the Italian Banking Association. What, what are the issues like this? First, such limits would be incredibly hard to really implement. You know, we are in a free economy. We have never tried to limit how much you can own of a certain amount of money. You know? uh, secondly, uh, in spite of this, this money could become more valuable than bank money. If it is technically superior or if it is uh, simply backed by the central bank with no risk of credit uh, losses. Maybe even merchants in a time of crisis will favor it, breaking a little bit stability. Maybe the problem is in the other point, this idea that if you create a CBDC, which is digital in the modern sense that it should be essentially with the cryptographic techniques that we, we see in digital currencies, it makes sense to give to banks the same operational operations for transferring money. What's the meaning of that? The, 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 the power of the blockchain is that it allows you essentially to actually do things in a, in a new way, which, is, which makes uh, the, 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 the individual autonomous. They don't always require the intermediary. So everything is more efficient. Everything is much less expensive for banks as well. So there is probably still some education to do on that. At the same time, killing banks is not something we can afford. Let's go pros and cons, you know, or cons and pros of, of banks and bank deposits. We may hate that they are subject to, to credit risk because in a sense they are based on a reserve. But in this way, they provide essentially the large majority of credit to the economy. In a sense, they do this magic of transforming uh, their assets that are essentially credit to the economy risky into a liquid form of money. We hate that they are controlled by banks that can stop withdrawals. But still, in a sense, there is an, this is really something that we may hate, but there is a positive fact. They are many decentralized institutions. Everyone, in a sense, taking his decision also on, on a geographically spread, uh, uh, spread network. So it's probably a good idea to start thinking of involving banks as well in the modern digitization of money and supporting or asking banks to become modern in their way to issue money. It's probably a good idea to actually think that uh, stable coins uh, are not the solution for tokens that represent fiat money. First of all, because their model 
is the oldest possible, is the model by which you, in the fair West, you really have an amount of money and you issued money that could be withdrawn, an, an amount of gold, and we issued money that corresponded to a specific amount of gold. That's not efficient money, not at all. I mean, it's in, we are running at a 3% reserve. In my opinion, that's too low, but we are still running and we have created capitalism. So there is some power you know, in, this, in this idea. And uh, even worse, now stable coins, as the story of SBB and USDC has revealed, most of the times have liquidity in banks. So in a sense, they are st still carrying the, 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 liquidity, the, liquidity, the liquidity of banks. Why not starting tokenizing money? Uh, tokenizing money uh, would, could potentially change dramatically our experience. Obviously, we could manage the reserve in a completely different way, more transparent, more programmable, but really the experience of using money would be totally different because we could actually make much more efficient what are now the standard ways for banks uh, actually to settle money among them. Uh, also, if you, if you notice in one of the previous slides, I'm also mentioning what uh, Algorand did with Bank of Italy, which is the possibility to make one leg in central bank European money and one leg of a digital asset on Algorand to be essentially atomic. And uh, uh, we also could do something much more disruptive, I admit. I'm sure, I mean, there was a, a paper from the Bank of International Settlement that was exactly, that very good paper because they understood this fact and they were uh, frightened. They say, guys, but if tokens remain really free to exchange, what is happening is that if there is a situation like a bank run, it may be that there are no problems uh, with banks, uh, with clients of the same banks. There are no problems when you have an efficient uh, smart contract thing to settle in, in, other, in, a, in other ways. But in some cases, it may be that people sell tokens issued by a bank and the counterparties do not take it at full nominal value. That's possible. Guys, I do believe that that will be the topic of a deeper mathematical paper that we have a trade-off. If, if money needs to keep its nominal value, you will always have bank runs. If you give to the market some possibility to solve things in moments of crisis, you may lose singleness of money. What's better? If in SVB people uh, try to uh, sell assets, sell, sell their liabilities, represented the asset at a lo lower price. And in that way, we would have avoided I either the failure at all, or in any case, a failure with uh, taxpayers uh, having to pay everything. Wouldn't it be better or worse? A matter for, uh, uh, for analysis. But what is relevant is that there will never be CBDCs until they are presented as they are now. Because either you try to issue 600 for each of us, and then how do you control that we don't have more? What does it mean? How do you avoid this becoming much more valuable than Bitcoin because that's the most crazy application of scarcity that I've ever seen in my life. And at the same time, you try to keep the, the system of banks into a very old technology, logic, risk. It's impossible. The two things ne necessarily need to move together. And uh, that's uh, the biggest message for me of this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Massimo. Um, discussant is uh, Federico from, from the Collegio, the University of Copenhagen, and the HEC. And uh, yeah. So thanks a lot, uh, first of all, to Massimo for the presentation and to Lorenzo and the other colleagues who organized the conference. Uh, it's been, uh, I think these are great events. Uh, and it gave me the chance to delve into a topic uh, uh, which I'd seen only from one very specific perspective. I have been uh, for a long time um, uh, advising uh, the board uh, of the Central Bank of Denmark and uh, before coming to Collegio. And one of the issues uh, that uh, we faced was uh, what position to take uh, when the Libra project came out, which meant, uh, well, everybody was going to every central bank asking, well, 
are we going to issue a central bank digital currency? And uh, so that, that's, where, that's the perspective where I'm coming from. And there were two, two main reactions. So, so the board hated the, the idea of a CBDC. They said, you know, this is not going to happen. Uh, and they were wrong. They had to reverse their position uh, a few years later. Uh, but the objections were essentially true. One is we already have means of uh, uh, electronic settlements, uh, which are not connected to the traditional uh, uh, payment uh, uh, system circuits, you know, Visa, MasterCards, uh, Nets, uh, and so on. So it's already here. And the second one uh, was uh, we are an institution with uh, a, a big power. We have a monopoly on issuing currency. And there's no reason why we can uh, engage uh, in financial intermediation or providing payment systems in any way better than the private system can. So they didn't want to engage uh, in any way in competition with the banking system. So these were the two, the two issues. And you'll see that they'll, uh, they'll uh, come up in my presentation over and over again. So I'm not going to discuss C CBDC in itself eh, because that's more a decision about who should issue digital currencies or should it be a private, uh, uh, private issuer or should it be the government? And there there's a lot of philosophical debate about whether there is a right to have a safe asset issued by the government backed by taxation that can be collected by the government. So let's not get into that for the moment. And that's not really what the paper is about also. It's about describing a system called uh, um, inside the digital currency. So inside the, uh, and outside money is what Massimo discussed. So central bank money and uh, money produced uh, by commercial banks uh, through the process of uh, um, uh, getting deposit, uh, uh, lending money, and issuing uh, their liability. So giving people uh, loans and saying, okay, now we loan is not really a sack of gold. Uh, it's uh, me putting another entry on the ledger, which says you have a deposit with us. So this inside the digital currency uh, is uh, a way, uh, it's something that it's built to interact with the existing financial intermediation system with the, with the uh, financial intermediaries which have a bank charter so they can collect deposits from the public. And essentially they are a token and their financial claims against deposits at a commercial bank. So the whole traditional infrastructure stays there, stays there uh, but uh, we create these tokens that can be traded as virtual currency and can and have some advantages. It looks a lot uh, like a off-chain stable coin uh, to me. So you have a you have a you have a something that it's it's really a financial asset, which is a claim to some US dollars or some uh, euros. So these are fully collateralized token, which is just uh, as a 100% collateral deposited upon in a deposit uh, in, a, in a bank. And because it's deposited in a bank, these are regulated financial intermediaries. So, so uh, all the usual know your customer and anti-money laundering regulations will apply to the collateral. So in this sense, uh, it's, it's not fiat money in the same way that stable coin is not fiat money. So we're not creating um, we're not creating something in competition with central bank money. So yeah, a couple of comments and two questions. So the, the first comment is uh, the relationship with existing virtual uh, uh, payments. In Denmark, there's one called mobile pay, there's Venom, there's Satispay, there's probably hundreds of, uh, of these uh, uh, virtual uh, payment systems uh, that try to disintermediate uh, the basic payment systems over which MasterCard and Visa, just to say uh, what's better known, uh, at the, over which they're traveling. So essentially banks uh, decide, well, we, they're also paying a fee to Visa and MasterCard. And they say, well, we, we don't like to pay this fee. We think these people are charging us way too much. They're making a huge profit. So we're going to create a parallel system that, you know, smartphones, it's very easy to do. 
Uh, and that's what everybody in Denmark had at the time when there was the discussion in, in the central bank. So I could, I could send money electronically to any, anybody I wanted without going through the payment systems. And this system is not connected to a specific bank in the same way that Saudi Spain, Italy is not connected to a, to a, specific, uh, to a specific bank. So it looks like this uh, IDC, so it looks like these tokens. So there is a key advantage that I'll, I'll, I'll discuss in a, in a second. So essentially this makes the, it cuts out the middlemen, cuts out uh, the centralized payment systems. Uh, who saves? Uh, not sure, you know, maybe the bank saves, uh, maybe you're also saving. In Denmark, the saving is rebated 100% to you, so you don't pay a fee. If you're a merchant, you also like this because merchants are also paying a fee to MasterCard and, uh, and Visa. So what's the advantage? Uh, is that you don't need to be connected all the time to this to the centralized payment uh, system. So when you swipe your credit card, there is an instant uh, chat electronically with a centralized system saying, yes, you know, this is clear that you have the funds uh, or you have the credit if it's a credit card, uh, go, go ahead. So you don't have to do that. It's, it seems to me that we are at the paper with this uh, uh, tokenized uh, system. So if I use mobile pay, there, there is a need to have an instant, instant verification. So the funds have, have to be in my bank account somewhere. And uh, with these tokens uh, and the wallet that you would have uh, on your smartphone, there's no need for this instant verification. So you can be uh, disconnected from uh, the... Uh, from a central payment uh, uh, network. And that's the big difference. You can settle this. This can be settled with uh, outside money at a later date, whenever you want. Or in fact, maybe never. Uh, maybe these things can circulate as currency and you never convert it into, into outside or central bank uh, money. Now, it wasn't clear to me whether this means, uh, uh, I think this delayed uh, settlement means also that you can be offline Maybe that's the case, maybe maybe not. Uh, offline meaning that you are disconnected completely uh, from, from the network. But certainly you can be disconnected uh, from a, a centralized settlement system. Now, the, we, we had these technologies some centuries ago. And the way in which this technology is called, uh, was called until uh, 10 years ago was checks. Uh, checks uh, have a lot of disadvantages, but they essentially functioned like this. So if I have a, now probably no bank is issuing checks anymore. In the US, checks were used um, until much later than, uh, than here in Europe. And people would pay for, would use a check, uh, a paper check uh, to pay for uh, utility bills, uh, put it in the mail, send it off. Uh, it was crazy, but in the US, they liked it. If, um, if I write a check to somebody's payment, uh, the person receiving it uh, uh, can endorse it. So just put a signature behind and they can pass it on to somebody else. Of course, it needs to be some trust between these two people. So that's the downside of checks. Uh, but you could put as many signatures or endorsement as you wanted behind. So this check would go around. And uh, that's the, exactly the idea of a delayed settlement. You know, the, this check is presented to the bank uh, maybe a month later, maybe a year later, maybe, maybe never. In fact, the check that's never presented to a bank, uh, that uh, we, ha we have that, uh, and that's currency. So currency is essentially a check uh, that is never being cashed uh, in exchange for anything. So we all trust uh, that this currency is worth something. Uh, it's legal tender, which means we can pay taxes with it. That's, uh, that's why we all trust. Uh, we never go to the central bank saying, oh, I want you know, one ounce of gold in exchange for a million euro. Okay, so we'll uh, we'll skip the ledger. Okay, so it, uh, but checks. Uh, well, why we don't write checks anymore? It's a terrible technology because you need the trust. If you go to a party which doesn't know you directly, that will you know apply to you a haircut. They'll tell you you know this check is worth hundred euros. I'll give you seventy eight because I don't know you. There is some risk, this counterparty risk involved. Instead, by using blockchain, uh, blockchain platform and blockchain technology, you are eliminating this risk, and that's the advantage over paper checks uh, of uh, of the tokenized uh, uh, deposits. So this existed, but it was not virtual. So. We don't like it, superior uh, technology. Now there's two questions. Uh, one is, uh, 
when you read any book about decentralized finance or Bitcoin, uh, uh, there's uh, always a lot of, um, there's a long list of uh, why this decentralization is good. And, and this is something that doesn't happen with this inside the digital currency because it relies uh, on uh, uh, this, the traditional uh, banking financial intermediation system that has some advantages because, you know, then the token system doesn't have, you know, we know that it's compliant with anti-money laundering regulations and so on. We cannot use it for illicit uh, purposes because there's always a collateral upon a bank with a name. So it's getting rid of the costly payment infrastructure. So we cut out the middlemen, you know, MasterCard and the Visa, great. We can do that also with, you know, we can do it with checks, so we can do it with mobile pay or status pay, uh, uh, but they require instant uh, settlement in some way or the other. And this is something that with this IDC you don't need to do. What about uh, this uh, centralized control of banking intermediaries? The fact that five banks control 90% of all deposits, uh, you're not getting rid of it because there's still the banking system in the in the in the back. Uh, access for the unbanked uh, that doesn't apply either. That's always a big advantage touted of the cryptocurrencies. Uh, doesn't doesn't apply in this case. Uh, um, lack of transparency. You know, any anybody can check the the blockchain ledger, and the, there is a consensus. Um, mechanism there by which we know that the funds exist, that the blockchain is legitimate. Instead, with the bank, you don't re really need how they're investing their funds. That also is not solved. So it's not really solving this, what we think is all well, issues of centralized financial system and the, you know, cryptocurrencies uh, or digital currency in some way or the other and blockchain technology is great, or only, only to, a, to a limited uh, degree. Um, but what, what can happen, and, and it's pointed out in the paper, is uh, you, you, you don't need to use this uh, IDC for traditional transactions. You know, I send money to you, you can write smart contracts because there is a blockchain technology behind. Uh, and that's, that's a great innovation. Uh, by far, to, to me, it seems it's the most innovative feature. I can use multi-signature, I, I can use a whole, I can attach a whole host of conditions or new ways in which I can use my tokens in the digital wallet. Uh, mm -hmm. However, you're still working with the banking system and you need to wonder, is this incentive compatible? Is the banking system going to accept that there is a new way, cheaper way of setting up a lot of uh, what we could call financial contracts uh, or more complicated transaction where they don't collect a fee? And an easy example is the one of foreign exchange. Uh, this was about 30% of bank profits in the 1970s was coming from foreign exchange transactions. If you asked banks uh, if they liked volatility in foreign exchange, they would say yes, because we make a lot of money in writing, uh, writing contracts that insure against this volatility and the fantastic to have volatility. And, and then this, uh, this source of revenue has started to disappear. Uh, we all have access now to uh, financial intermediaries, which are non-banks, uh, uh, which make the matching between our supply of a currency and the demand for the same currency on the other, on the other side. And the fee for exchanging this currency goes down from 3% to 0.2%. So they've been disintermediated there, but they resisted this uh, and they're resisting this like crazy. So the question is, uh, how, how is the banking system going to agree to this kind of, uh, uh, of digital wallets and tokenized deposits that allow for this intermediation of a lot of other side um, services, which are fee-based, where banks uh, make uh, a lot of money? Uh, now, my conclusion is that I, I would, if this thing existed, I would use it, so I completely endorse it. Um, so I hope there will be something coming out of this paper, not only more research, but also maybe a digital wallet. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Massimo, you might want to respond yeah, please, briefly. There is one point that I wanted to, 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 to make. Uh, in a sense, uh, you showed qualities and shortcomings of stable coins not on any kind of uh, in, in, inside money, because inside money is a little bit of a pun, you know, when you see that the, the, 
the title inside money, it means obviously that we are going into inside, you know, the mechanics of money, but inside money, and that's the, the topic of the paper, is money which is issued privately on a reserve basis. You know. So you described essentially stable coins. You know. in, in, and I agree with you with qualities and, uh, um, and shortcomings. Uh, then uh, obviously we should consider that the difference is that once you have a banking license, why should you behave like a stable coin? Stable coin has to behave like a stable coin because it doesn't have a banking license. If you have, uh, if you are allowed to issue with uh, with a reserve, you you issue with a reserve. So it doesn't make sense for banks to issue stable coins. You know, in principle, if we, they were allowed to issue money in a digital form, uh, I agree with you that that there is a saving that essentially goes to the bank and comes back to you. But efficiency means also timing, you know, speed. Uh, you mentioned delaying payment. First of all, uh, with this kind of money, you can, have, you can have payments much faster. Then obviously with smart contract, you can also decide to, uh, in a sense, to, 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 um, to actually delay, delay them. Let me make another observation on the idea that it doesn't solve uh, the monopoly in a sense that the, the digital, this kind of digital money doesn't solve the monopoly as long as you, uh, you involve, you know, regulated, uh, regulated entities. Uh, it's a little bit of uh, a relative thing, you know, in a sense, in the sense that uh, uh, if we move to a CBDC that dominates the world of digital payments, uh, that's going to be totally centralized over one institution. If we had, at, at least for every nation or, or currency system, if we had gone for Libra, we would have found ourselves with a very important part of the money used by the world centralized over one, uh, one entity. You know? Uh, the idea of having uh, uh, regulated entities that may be banks that start doing this or fintechs that start, uh, uh, that essentially start uh, um, receiving, having something similar to a banking license, it's probably the maximum amount of decentralization that we will ever be able to reach beyond, obviously, the world of uh, uh, cryptocurrencies that, however, issue with no, no back, backing of any kind from, uh, uh, from institutions or, or central banks. Uh, so in a sense, probably, yes, it makes things, could make things much more decentralized. More importantly, and that's what was one of the points that, that I was making, uh, there is the possibility on the blockchain, uh, in a sense, to remove the possibility for intermediaries to actually control each one of your payments. Because in a sense, today in every system, uh, uh, even modern uh, digital money, you know, like the one uh, you, you, you mentioned, it's always in any case an intermediary that makes your transaction happen. Only the blockchain allows you the possibility in a sense of being yourself that makes the transaction. And that also shows why if we, if for some reason we want to recover that nice feature of cash, that cash you know, has got some features that uh, uh, certainly a digital currency cannot replace and maybe doesn't want to replace. So uh, certainly uh, cash is, um, is extremely private, can be used even for secret things and a digital currency is not good for this, no matter, no matter how you, 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 you twist it, uh, it remains very transparent. Secondly, the, 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 the cash can be used when technology is not available. Even, you know, on, uh, on a village, uh, in, in, uh, in some remote areas where civilization has almost never arrived, you know. It, I do remember doing that in, in villages in Burma. And uh, this is not obviously given to you by uh, block, blockchain and digital currencies, no matter who is issuing it. But there is one thing that blockchain can give you. Blockchain can give you that feature of uh, uh, cash that the cash I have in my wallet now, and I, I have some, but often I don't have any, I have some. No one, I don't have to ask anyone to spend it. I don't have to ask an intermediary. And potentially the blockchain can do that. As I was saying, 
that is going to be, in my opinion, the most delicate things when you speak to the world of uh, uh, digital in, of inter traditional intermediaries, you know, from the central bank to the international, uh, to, to the, 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 the Bank of International Settlement, to any bank. The idea that the intermediary is not needed to move digital money is, first of all, so new that still people have difficulties to understand it. And secondly, it creates the issue that I was mentioning before. You know? Somehow the fact that every uh, payment needs to go through the banking system is also a way to guarantee that when a payment is happening, you guarantee that it is happening by its nominal value. You know? Look at the, the slides I make. You know? If obviously you force the settlement, when you're moving a liability from a bank to another one, you force the settlement to happen in central bank money, by the amount of central bank money, you are guaranteeing uh, uh, that uh, uh, there will never be two kinds of money that have, uh, uh, that have a different value. Obviously, with the shortcoming that uh, once there is a pressure for because a, a kind of money is much superior to the other, and in this case, it could be money guaranteed by the state, and maybe even on a more modern te technology versus banking, uh, uh, banking money, if you do not allow the market to adapt to this different value, you end up having failures you know, and all the problems that can be associated to failures. Thank you very much also because you allowed me in a sense to explain some things that maybe got, got missed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, due to the fact that we are already heavy on overtime, I would postpone the Q&A to the next coffee break. And I would continue with the bank with uh, Michele Lanotte about the from Bank of Italy, decentralized finance, a central bank perspective. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. Okay. And uh, this one. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for inviting uh, me. I feel a little bit like uh, Martin Luther in the Vatican in this moment after these uh, two presentations, uh, because uh, obviously I will try to uh, explain why as a central bank uh, we are uh, interested in um, uh, CBDC or generally speaking on uh, DLT and crypto assets because there are some applications that are quite relevant from uh, a central bank perspective. So uh, in my presentation, I will try to uh, focus on four key points, uh, fact and figures, but will be very, very fast after uh, uh, the, um, let's say, um, discussions that we have already, thanks to um, Federico and uh, Massimo. I will try to focus on risk and opportunities. Why, when we discuss about uh, DLT, decentralized finance, CBDC, uh, there are uh, several opportunities, but also uh, several risks that we need to take into, the, into consideration when we decide how to design uh, a central bank digital currencies or how or when we decide to accept uh, cryptocurrencies as a mean of payments. And uh, uh, at the end, I will try to give you some, uh, uh, let's say a picture about the Python regime regulation, which means the uh, regulation that uh, was approved and entered into force less than three weeks ago, that in Europe define the um, constitutional architectures in order to uh, allow uh, DLTs, okay, to be used and to verify for three years under a special regimes, okay, some uh, uh, proof of concept in order to verify how uh, and uh, uh, what are the benefits and what are the risk of uh, DLTs when we apply DLTs in several fields of the uh, financial uh, sector. At the end, I will try to give you a practical example of the Bank of Italy uh, strategy. So how we are interacting with the financial markets in order to understand better the, uh, the benefits and the challenges that are inside the, uh, let's say, decentralized finance. Right? And what are the, uh, let's say, 
strategies and also the solution that we want to put in place in order to uh, be sure that we can use the, the uh, let's say, uh, the added value that we see in DLT, okay, having at the same time under control the, the risks that we have identified. So move on very quickly. Uh, why are we interested in uh, decentralized finance for two reasons? First, as a supervisor, so we want to uh, understand what are the most important trends that are in the fintech market because banks are an active part of fintech markets. And in these uh, three uh, slides, I give you just a, uh, a little bit the feeling about how it's important, uh, what is the level of spendings on the blockchain solutions between uh, 2017 and uh, 2024. So it's uh, quite uh, evident, okay, how is growing the interest of uh, uh, the industry uh, in this sector. Second, based on the latest data that I had uh, in uh, 2020, banks was the sector that was much more involved in investing in the blockchain, which again, it's quite important to understand what are the project of financial intermediaries at the same time, try to understand what are the applications because as uh, uh, we can see, uh, in a while, there are several parts in the banking business that uh, we can apply uh, blockchain and uh, their uh, solutions with a different level of uh, satisfaction from prudential point uh, of view. Uh, in uh, 2021, cross-border payments and SETMER were considered the largest, uh, let's say, sector where uh, we can apply uh, blockchain and uh, DLT. So uh, this is the rationale because uh, as a central banks, we are uh, definitely uh, quite uh, interested in the uh, solution. Last uh, thing, just to give you uh, the big uh, picture, the banking industry has become the dominant worldwide sector for blockchain technologies. So from this point of view, it's crystal clear why we are quite interested in understanding uh, uh, the impact of this technology uh, in our sector. And by the end of 2026, uh, well, this is the, the amount of uh, um, uh, market size, uh, uh, approximately uh, 22.5 billion US dollars of uh, um, uh, the value of the, the application. So having said that, uh, Observing at worldwide level, the situation is crystal clear that the United States and China are the two countries where the amount of investments uh, is the largest one, okay? Europe uh, is uh, not in a so good position. So I'm not talking about Italy, but Europe, okay? At the uh, global level, uh, we are uh, uh, not, uh, uh, let's say, uh, in a very good shape uh, compared to um, the other country. Uh, and this is uh, uh, when you see the um, level of uh, the companies that are uh, working on uh, blockchain. As I said, China is definitely, as uh, with the United States, is definitely uh, a, a lead uh, position. So if this is the, the market now, let's try to see, uh, it's a period and Massimo cannot uh, be with uh, us in this moment, that when we... Uh, analyze and we study the blockchain and DLT solutions. Uh, we have in mind as, as a policymaker uh, three main points. First, scalability, security, and decentralization. This is what we call the uh, trilemma. Is possible to combine at the same time and together these three uh, elements? So it's possible on the one side have security and decentralization, which is one of the pillars of uh, the philosophy behind uh, DLT, but at the same time, so we need to be sure that uh, scalability is uh, uh, a goal that we can achieve uh, okay, uh, in a short time period. Just to give you uh, three figures, uh, do you have an idea about how many transactions Visa can uh, settle uh, per second? Okay, is uh, 12... Uh, um, uh, thousand, uh, okay? If we uh, go and we see Ethereum, how many transactions can be validated? Uh, should be 12, if my recollection is uh, correct. If we use a 
uh, market infrastructure like Target 2 that uh, you have seen in the previous uh, uh, intervention or TIPS. TIPS is uh, a, a European market infrastructure uh, that allows uh, payments uh, in uh, real time, okay? This means that the transaction, I can move money from my bank account to your bank account in 10 seconds, okay? 24 hours, seven days per week uh, during all the year, okay? This is the technical solution that uh, is already now available at European level, okay? And in this case, we are able to settle 500 transactions per second. So when we call the about scalability, the point is, are we sure that if we allow a system based on DLT, that are we able to achieve the same level of efficiency, okay, cost and security that currently we have with the traditional, let's say, market infrastructures like Target 2 and uh, TIPS or whatever Fed uh, um, uh, now in uh, in US. So this is the point, okay? And we need to try to uh, square, in this case, uh, the, uh, the triangle. Okay, when we talk about uh, uh, DLT, blockchain, DeFi, okay? As regulators, we take into consideration all these kinds of risks that we believe are quite important and we cannot underestimate because it's crystal clear the benefits of, uh, let's say, uh, DLT have been already uh, described uh, before. And uh, in another uh, slide, I also highlight how it's important to try to take into consideration the benefits of uh, DLT. But there are uh, this list of uh, topics that uh, we believe we cannot uh, uh, disregard or better, we cannot uh, um, underestimate. Two points I want to highlight on this slide. First is the cybersecurity. Assuming that uh, one day we will have uh, a DLT system, okay, and the central bank digital currency, and we will live in a decentralized world, okay? Who is responsible in case there is a cyber attack? And in case somebody is able to steal our crypto asset from uh, our digital wallet, okay? In case there is a technical issue, an operational issue on the uh, chain, okay? Who is responsible to try to intervene and try to settle the issue? This is a point that we need to take into consideration. Second point, when we talk about uh, DLT. For the time being, unless I am wrong, and please in this case, uh, uh, I invite you to uh, object on this point. We have several DLTs. We have several different protocols. We have several different standards, okay? How uh, are we able to uh, guarantee the interoperability among all these different solutions? Because if we are saying that for the time being, and it's true, at worldwide level, we don't have, if we accept probably Visa, Amex, and uh, uh, MasterCard, okay? We don't have a common payment infrastructure system that is able to work 24 hours, seven days, 365 days per year, okay? The point is there. So how are, or how can we ensure that interoperability among Algorand, R3, or whatever you want, is uh, guaranteed because otherwise we are again in the same conditions that uh, we are living and experiencing so far. I don't have uh, the answer. I want to just to put on the table uh, uh, some question to, uh, let's say, uh, stimulate the discussion, okay? So uh, we recognize as a central banks the importance of uh, the centralized on DLT solutions. And I give you just uh, two very simple uh, uh, use cases. In this case, uh, in this slide, uh, uh, talking about uh, the capital market, one of the typical activity of the investment banks, I can use uh, the blockchain, okay, and the application of blockchain in all uh, this uh, uh, activity. I can use, for instance, in the debit market, uh, uh, the blockchain to register the digital bond, okay? And this is something that uh, it's possible uh, in Europe uh, as of the 25 of March, we have a regulation that specifically allow banks 
and all the other companies to issue their shares or their bond in tokenized form, which means that it will be possible to uh, use a DLT as a ledger when you write and you register exactly how many shares or uh, bonds you are issuing. So from this point of view, this is already uh, a reality. The same thing you can do with uh, uh, the asset management where you can issue CIUs okay, uh, in uh, a tokenized form. So from this point of view, the applications in capital market sectors are uh, uh, quite wide. Another um, sector where we believe that it's possible to use the LT in a very uh, efficient way is the uh, payment sector. And in particular, uh, we believe that uh, in the cross-border uh, payments, okay, it's possible to use DLT solution to improve the efficiency uh, of uh, the market. As you can see in these slides, that in uh, 2020, the uh, IF, um, uh, IMF ran uh, a study in order to, uh, let's say, identify uh, the opportunity uh, regarding the use uh, of the LT uh, in payments and uh, settlement. And there we started the discussion about the application of uh, DLT for uh, CBDC. So um, in particular, the large value payments uh, uh, could be a very interesting use case. And another uh, use case quite interesting that last year we developed a WeAlgorand. Algorand. Uh, we use Algorand as a DLT in order to study the implication of uh, using DLT for security and settlement systems. So just to give you an idea, if you want to buy a share of Apple, okay, today you go to your bank or your investment firms, if you are in Europe, you're knocking on the door and you ask, I want to buy a share listed on NASDAQ or on the New York exchange. And for you, everything is finished. You are not in charge of understanding how it's possible that at the end of the day, uh, you will uh, be the owner of one share of uh, Apple, okay? But all this stuff uh, is uh, settled via the banking system, okay? The one, uh, one of the most important thing is that today, in order to be sure that uh, the exchange between the money that you have to pay for uh, buying the shares on the one side and on the other side, the guy that is uh, selling the share is uh, receiving your money, is guaranteed via a so-called post-trading system, so the settlement systems. And in order to be sure that there is no fail in this kind of transaction, central banks are in the middle of uh, this uh, framework in order to ensure that each transaction in real time can be settled in appropriate way, okay? So from this point of view, if we decide to move the settlement system uh, to the current framework, okay, which is based on centralized repositories, eh? okay, the typical middleman that uh, you have uh, in uh, DeFi literature. And we move to a DLT system, we have decentralized way. We need to be sure that we are at the end of the day able to guarantee that, okay, the cash leg and the uh, bond leg is settled in appropriate way. So having said that, uh, the pilot regime regulation at European level, okay, uh, was, if I remember, um, approved in March, okay. The European Commission, the Parliament, the Council approved this uh, regulation and it's called the pilot regime. So for six years, okay, it will be possible to use the DLT solutions, okay, in Europe, and we can test and verify different application uh, in the financial sector. So it will be possible to issue uh, shares, bonds, okay, uh, in a tokenized form. The idea of the commission is uh, to have a common framework where from a legal point of view, it's crystal clear what are the obligations, what are the uh, duties, what are the rights, okay, that companies, investors, banks, or all the other actors, all the stakeholders involved in the financial sector uh, must meet, okay, in order to ensure that uh, we can use uh, in the appropriate way um, the DLT. 
crucial point, uh, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ether are not subject to DLT regulation. Why? Because uh, here the idea is to try to, let's say, create a, a, a marriage between the traditional forms of financial instruments, okay, and the new technology. Okay, we can discuss uh, probably for years if it's a good idea or not, but this is uh, what the co-legislators at European level decides. We want to verify how the LT works in the traditional uh, world. Now, as I said, uh, was it uh, 23rd of March uh, when uh, the, the law uh, was uh, passed and the DLT entered into four. I write here for three years, by three years plus three years. At the end of the day, it will be six years, uh, the, the period. So uh, in Europe, in Italy, in Germany, in France, there are several fintech companies and also banks that are trying to verify what are the implications of uh, issuing a uh, bond in a tokenized forms. The first result of this uh, uh, trial, proof of concept, says that we see a significant reduction of uh, administrative costs. Uh, in some cases, uh, what they have told us uh, that you can achieve a reduction of 30%, okay? Uh, considering the uh, administrative cost, uh, uh, the, um, the time that you spend in order to reconcile all uh, uh, the doc documents that you need to uh, prepare uh, the issue uh, of a bond. So from this point of view, the first result seems to be uh, very uh, interesting uh, regarding uh, costs and efficiency. Uh, the objective of the, of the regulation is crystal clear in the, the European framework, which means uh, ensure high level of consumer investor protection, market integrity, support access to new investment opportunities, new type of, of uh, payments. So the idea is uh, I want to have a playground where guys can play okay, the game and let's see if it's possible to build up a new technological solution that are... Uh, uh, safer according to the uh, co-legislators. Uh, without entering into uh, technical discussion, currently, as I said, if you want to buy a cell uh, a, a security, okay, you are obliged to uh, work with these uh, three kind of, uh, uh, let's say, financial institutions, okay? that are in charge of, uh, let's say, ensuring the trading and the settlement of uh, a security. This is the rules that we have in Europe, but also at the worldwide level. So uh, in order to apply the DLT at the current system, we needed to change the European law, and this is the rationale behind the, uh, the pilot regime. Now, uh, the decentralized finance, okay, uh, according to me, is, post is based on, let's say, three main pillars, okay? The first one is the infrastructure, DLT. At the European level, we decide to, uh, let's say, uh, introduce a regulation, a specific uh, law, in order to uh, identify what are the main features of the DLT and uh, legal framework for DLT. And this is the pilot regime. Then, and tomorrow morning, there will be the vote in the European Parliament. Uh, there is another regulation in order to identify the main feature of the cryptocurrencies in Europe. And this is the MICA regulation. In the MICA regulation, at the end of the day, we will have a definition of what is a crypto asset. And uh, before Roberto and also Federico highlighted a little bit the, the, the main features, we can have uh, stable coins, we can have uh, algorithmic uh, cryptocurrency, okay? We can have unbacked cryptocurrency. With unbacked, I mean uh, Bitcoin. So a cryptocurrency without a basket on an activity that backed the value, okay? And the difference of uh, this stuff that overall we call crypto asset is completely different because we can have a crypto asset where uh, it's uh, uh, mandatory to reimburse okay, the order at uh, uh, face value. There are crypto assets where the reimburse is not guaranteed at face value, but at market value. And this is unbelievably a completely different uh, situation. 
there are crypto assets that uh, we cannot consider as a means of payment, but uh, as, uh, as a, a, uh, let's say, a CA user, as a bond, okay, as an investor. So when we talk about crypto asset from technical and legal point of view, is a big family with different, uh, let's say, components with different uh, features, and the treatment is completely different. So having in mind this in Mika, we try to identify common rules regarding crypto asset and in Dora, we try to address uh, the main risk that we see in this kind of ecosystem, which is the cyber risk. And then in Mika, we have a framework where we try to identify the rules that banks or other stakeholders, the technological providers that in this ecosystem uh, play a crucial and vital role. So, and I will try to give you a, an idea in a couple of slides. So in Dora, we identify the rules to try to reduce as much as possible the risk of uh, the cyber attacks. So this is the, uh, let's say, uh, point. Just to give you uh, a flavor of what happens if in March we have this uh, uh, regulation in, uh, uh, in Europe, this morning uh, the Italian parliament is voting, okay, the transposition of the EU regulation in the Italian law. Due to the fact that today I, I just put this uh, slide, but the idea is also to have at the national level, okay, to change, the national law uh, to be in line with the, um, um, the European law. It is a, a law decree uh, published on 17 of March, number 25, but this morning there will be the final uh, vote. Okay, having said that, what is the strategy? What we want to do? One of the key points in uh, DeFi uh, for us is that the technological solution is crucial. Compared to the world where I have lived four years so far, there was a crystal clear solution. There were banks, there was the central banks, okay, the central banks and the co-legislators co at the European level decides the rules, and the financial sector was obliged to apply the rules. Now, if we are in the uh, DeFi, in the decentralized finance, I cannot apply this mindset or this framework for just a very simple reasons. If I have a bank that comes and say, I want to use Bitcoin as a means of payments for my clients, okay? What can I say? Yes, assuming that I say yes, okay. And if tomorrow morning I have a problem in the protocol or in the LT of Bitcoin, do I have a number, a phone number, to call the CFO of a Bitcoin company, assuming that uh, there is a company, okay? To talk with him and say, listen, guy, uh, there is an issue. We need to organize a meeting to try to settle the issue. I don't have, from a corporate governance point of view, a counterparty. Second point, if uh, I decide to use Bitcoin or I move to the centralized world, okay, seek at simplicity, okay, as I would say my ancestors, okay, the point is, what is the legal framework that I have to apply in case there is a dispute about, okay, a transaction? Is the Italian law, is the European law, is the US law, is the Chinese law? Due to the fact that Bitcoin or the DeFi ecosystem is everywhere, but at the same time is nowhere. This is another issue that as a policymaker, we have to take into consideration. Again, this does not imply that we are against the DeFi. I will show you from an empirical point of view why we believe that there is merit in studying the application and the use of uh, DeFi. For this reason, last year, we published a communication, a soft law, okay? And we talk with the technical providers and say, we want to organize a table with you. We want to discuss with you what are the technological solutions that you want to implement when you talk about DeFi? Because now, this morning we talk about smart contract, okay? Is in the smart contract that you decide what are the rules to do or undo a transaction. So the point is that I have to talk with the developers, with the infrastructure, with the technological providers 
to understand the logic behind the smart contract and then try to infer what could be the rule that I have to apply as a policy maker in order to ensure what? The financial stability of the financial sector. If you believe that uh, the good faith in the stability of, uh, of money, of the fiat money, the stability of the banking sector is a public good. Otherwise, it's another story, but uh, we can stop the discussion uh, at this stage, okay? And this is the rationale because for the first time, we try to, uh, let's say, start a dialogue with the counterparties that are not normally okay part uh, or uh, our interaction having said that uh, and due to the fact the smart contracts are quite important last year we signed a memorandum of understanding okay with the two italian university but the, the protocol is open to other universities due to the fact that here there are several foreign colleagues uh, this is a clear invitation we decided to uh, sign a memorandum of understanding to study the implication, the features of smart contracts in the financial sector. So with academia, but also with the technological providers, now we have a table, a stable table, where we discuss a taxonomy, the main feature of smart contract. What should be the, uh, the protocol or the main feature of a smart contract that is used in the financial sector. This is an attempt to try to develop a new way of interact with the market. Okay, for this reason, I said, we are entering in a completely different ecosystem where it's impossible to define in a precise way as we have done so far the rules. Because the speed of, uh, of the defy of this kind of world is too, too, too fast. So we cannot apply the same mindset that we have applied so far. So, uh, and due to the fact that this is important, I want to just to, I have a glass of one minute. Yeah, one minute. Okay. I want just to give you uh, a last uh, information regarding the initiative that we have uh, implemented since last year. I want to talk about Milano Hub. Milano Hub is uh, our innovation center uh, situated in Milan. And this year uh, we have launched, a, um, I will arrive exactly a call for proposal specifically on DLTs. In this moment, we are selecting uh, 10 projects. We have uh, uh, 10 uh, positions. Five are devoted to the fintech uh, companies, okay, startups or, or uh, say large companies that working in the fintech uh, uh, sector. Three places are uh, in the innovation hub uh, are devoted to the financial sector. Two places are devoted to research and developments, which means are projects stemming from university or place like uh, uh, Collegio Carlo Alberto, okay? Uh, this year we received uh, 57 uh, applications, which means uh, projects, okay? Now we have, uh, uh, we are in the process of uh, assessing uh, uh, these projects regarding again DLT's applications, okay? At the end, we will uh, identify 10 uh, potential solutions that for six months will work with us, with the people of the Bank of Italy to develop the project, okay? Uh, in this year, 15% uh, uh, of the project came from other countries, okay? The attempt is to try to promote as much as possible the interaction with other jurisdictions because we believe that this kind of uh, projects uh, needs uh, cross fertilization. So, and the point is uh, last year we have a, a call for proposal based on uh, artificial intelligence. 80 persons of the Bank of Italy worked for. Uh, six months with the 10 companies selected, and there were also companies and university, okay, to develop the solution. And this year we'll do exactly the same. As I said, it's 14, sorry, non 15. Okay, uh, having said that, last thing, due to the fact there is Massimo, last year, in order to verify uh, the benefits of uh, the uh, DLT with Algorand, we ran an exercise, okay, uh, in order to verify this is possible to, uh, let's say, do this marriage between the DLT solutions and the market infrastructure. So stuff like target uh, to or tips, as I said before. And at the end of the day, 
we arrive to the conclusion, yes, it is possible, because in that case, the idea was this, the, the, the transaction rate was very simple. We try to uh, replicate a transaction when one guy, bank A, buy a bond, uh, uh, bank B must pay, okay? In this case, the cash lag was on our market infrastructure and the bond was uh, registered on the Algorand uh, DLD. I don't want to say there was a success because uh, at the end of the day, the result was very, very positive. There is a, a paper where we describe, uh, publish it on our uh, website, is the second solution, tips algorand just in time uh, looking, where we uh, have uh, published all the technical details uh, in order to demonstrate that it's possible also from a central bank perspective, try to reconcile uh, the two words. So at the end of this discussion, the main message is, I don't believe there is a, a solution uh, that is completely positive and the current status is completely negative. Probably there are some merits that we see in DLTs, okay? Uh, it will be completely stupid if it decides to, uh, let's say, turn on the other uh, side and say that there is nothing, okay? The, the challenge is to work together to try to see how it's possible to, uh, let's say, on the one side, uh, increase the level of efficiency without uh, uh, taking into consideration that financial stability is, is a public good that we need to uh, guarantee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michele. Mm. Um, yeah, I guess we have time for one or two quick questions, if there are some. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for the presentation. And I was wondering, um, as far as I know, the China, China has started a CBDC. Yeah. So I, I, I was wondering, how did they solve uh, the problems that you uh, described? Uh, or did they bypass it? Or is was it a non-problem because of the more centralized banking system? Thank you. I would say that the answer is in the last part of your questions, but there is a point that maybe, yeah, thank you for the question, uh, a point that maybe it's better to uh, clarify a little bit. Uh, on top of uh, when we talk about CBDC, okay, there is a, a main issue that uh, we need to, uh, to settle is the level of uh, privacy. Because based on the way that you design the CBDC, you have a total control. You know everything about uh, that transaction and the people that are using CBDC to do something. Or on the other way, you want to guarantee the same level of uh, anonymity that you have with cash. So this is a crucial point that uh, when you decide uh, how to implement and develop the CBDC, you have to do. This is the first point. For, uh, the inf based on the information that I have, so from this point of view, it's my personal view. In China, the solution that has been implemented tends to go to the other direction. So a clear control, okay, like George Orwell would say, you know, big brother, on the level of transactions. Last year, when at European level we started the discussion on CBDC, there was a focus group uh, at European level. More than 80,000 uh, people were interviewed. And at the first, uh, let's say, there was a ranking on the, uh, of the uh, main feature of the CBDC. You know, one of the questions, what do you think uh, or how uh, do you want the CBDC? What are the main features of the CBDC? And at the first place in the ranking was, okay, privacy. The answer was very simple, privacy. We want to have an instrument that is able to guarantee the same level of privacy that we have with the cash. So having in mind this, okay, 
uh, when we talk about CBDC, we need to do this. Uh, just to uh, try to finalize the, uh, the answer. Uh, during the Olympic Games, okay, in the Olympic Village, uh, um, let's say, uh, participants uh, to the Games were obliged to use the uh, CBDC. There, there was, this was the only <laughs> way to settle a transaction <laughs> in the village. It was the first, uh, let's say, trial to, uh, to to verify the implication. Uh, based on my recollection, I guess that now in China, roughly 300 million some persons use CBDC. Okay, so it's a, a huge number. Uh, but now we will see what will happen, okay, and if they continue to go in that direction. It is extra clear that if they go in that direction, my personal view, I don't think that the other jurisdiction, okay, in a way or another way will, be obliged to go in the direction in order to offer the same possibilities to uh, their citizens. And then there was uh, one more question, yes. In, in the presentation, you mentioned the um... the DLT as a technology that can be applied in many ways to uh, wholesale settlement systems, uh, various uh, securities. Uh, um, but my, my question is about using a DLT for uh, retail payment. Uh, so something looks like uh, this inside digital currency or maybe CBDC. And uh, the question is the following. What, what is uh, uh, the assessment of the Bank of Italy um, uh, of the inefficiency that exists in the current payment systems. That is, uh, how much do we think uh, that, say, Nets uh, is overcharging all of us and making huge profits, uh, and how much instead is just the cost of doing uh, of doing business? And I'm mentioning this because in some central banks, like at the Fed, uh, there's uh, certainly the position that there's nothing wrong with digital currency. It's not clear why as the central bank or the government should offer a digital currency solution as opposed to the private sector offering a digital currency solution? That, hello, let's try to answer because there are several questions uh, in one. The first point, uh, the level of efficiency of the payment systems. Uh, surely I guess that uh, we can do much more at European level okay in order to increase the level of efficiency of uh, uh, the payment system in particular retail level retail uh, level okay so from this point of view uh over the last uh, years uh, uh, we have had uh, several improvements but probably it's not sufficient and the demonstration is uh, uh, ahead of us because uh, in this moment, at European level, we are discussing a regulation in order to oblige the financial system to use as much as possible what we call the Eastern payments, as I said before. So a payments that at this stage, just to give you an idea, in Eastern payments um, costs 0 0.2 cent euro. Okay, this is the cost for the Bank of Italy. The Bank of Italy is responsible for all the Euro area, okay? And uh, through our infrastructures, okay, we set all the payments, retail payments, okay, Eastern payments at the European level, okay? For all the, the European system. So the cost is 0 0.2. It's published on the, uh, the website of the Bank of Italy from this point of view. So uh, to come to your question, yes, we need to do much more. And this is the rationale because the European Commission published at the beginning of this year a regulation uh, that requires a financial uh, institution to offer this kind of instruments, okay, at the same price that you have uh, for a normal, okay, uh, uh, instruments, first, second. And you are obliged to, uh, as a bank to offer this kind of uh, payment solution uh, via all the possible uh, commercial channel, which means uh, when you go to the branch, when you are paying via internet, if you use Satispay, mobile pay, or whatever solution or application that you are doing. So to answer to your question, yes, we can do much more, okay. And the 
crystal clear evidence is that we need to continue to discuss at European level to improve the level of efficiency of the retail payment system. Second question, the, uh, what is the rationale to have a retail uh, CBDC uh, currently? My personal answers, I don't have a personal, uh, I don't have an answer just for one reason. If we use the instant payment solutions, okay, probably you don't need a CBDC. Because honestly, it's difficult to understand what is the difference, okay? But uh, from, uh, let's say, a central bank point of view, could be interesting to give you, as, uh, let's say, a member of the European Union, the choice to choose between Amex, Visa, MasterCard, Eastern payments, okay, traditional uh, uh, payments, or CBDC, or uh, a cryptocurrency. So just to give you an idea, a couple of days ago, I uh, counted that mm, some uh, uh, payments gateways offers more than 30, 30 different payment solutions. So for the time being, we have uh, several uh, option to settle our transaction if I have to pay a coffee, okay? So probably there is no need to uh, develop also a CBDC uh, a retail level, but okay, this doesn't, uh, avoid that uh, it's uh, an additional option that uh, you have, then it's up to you to decide if you like or uh, uh, dislike uh, this solution. So from this point of view, honestly, I don't see uh, a big issue. The, the real question is, uh, assuming that we will have a retail CBDC, the consumers, so the households or companies, uh, are ready or they want to, uh, let's say, uh, use uh, this uh, solution, this is the, uh, the point. Because I can offer this stuff, but if people are not interested because they believe that Satispay or Amex, it's more, more efficient and less expensive, at the end of the day, they will not uh, use this solution. And our um, last session is... Uh... The PZ price. So among the applicants, the uh, PZ price consisted of a monetary price as well as a discussion by Julien Pratt. And the winner is Antoine uh, Dirichheim. So congratulations. And you have uh, like the rest 25 minutes. Thank you very much uh, to, for the invitation and to give me an occasion to see uh, the north of Italy. I must say I went to the south of Italy uh, not that long ago and I felt very tall and very poorly dressed. And walking around in the town here, I just feel poorly dressed. So <laughs> it's really a horrible city. Everybody is way too good looking. Um, all right. So this is a paper that uh, has been worked with um, Luciano Somoza, fellow PhD students, who is currently making his fortune in uh, Monaco. So that's why he cannot be here. Uh, and it's, uh, it was his uh, job market paper. So... This set of slides has been designed for this purpose. So usually you have to convince people why to talk about crypto, which we, we don't necessarily have to do it here. So in practice, it's a, you, you have it everywhere and you have a lot of disagreement about fundamental value. Uh, I personally joined the view of the man group uh, chief at this time who has my favorite financial time headlines of all time. When you say crypto has no inherent worth, but it's good to trade, which I think uh, whether it's true or not about crypto, it's summarized certainly the point of view of a lot of actors in the market who do trade this asset. Uh, and the reason uh, we believe it's a very important topic to discuss uh, as economists and to try to treat it as an asset class, whether we want it or not, because a lot of economists just want to dismiss it, uh, is a small story that Luciano told me many times uh, about uh, a friend of, uh, of his who had 20,000 euro in Italy and wanted to invest it, send it to a banker, the banker proposed a portfolio she was about to accept, and then remember he, she had a friend doing a PhD, so sent her the portfolio, and the guy had put 25% in cryptocurrency which is a bad idea, uh, which means that as economists, I think that show we have to study it as an asset because some people in the financial market are doing it and we should probably check the portfolios of our friends at, because if they just follow the bankers, they might have some weird uh, investment choices. So what do we know from the literature? We know that uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the theory is struggles in practice to try to explain the Bitcoin phenomenon. So there is some uh, nice theory papers that try to explain it from that transaction point of view, but it's very rarely used in practice for transaction right now. Uh, the best argument for transactional value. So 
I, I, I see my uh, discussion is smiling. We already had a long argument in the break about that, so it will continue. Um, we uh, we had uh, um, if you if you look at the amount, the clearest stuff would be um, of course people who want to escape the states or criminality in uh, in Western countries. Uh, but this is a small amount of the of the transaction, so it's still hard to discuss. Uh, and given that we cannot necessarily find or agree with a, um, a fundamental value for Bitcoin, the big question comes is, why does it start moving together with the market? Because at the start, when Bitcoin was pushed as an asset, one of the big arguments was it was a great diversification tool because it's not supposed to have a fundamental value that is uh, correlated with the market. And that was true up to fairly recently. Uh, so uh, as you can see, this is the rolling window of 60 days and we compute the correlation on, so on three months, uh, 60 business days. Uh, and you can see this moving around and it jump up and stay relatively high up uh, after March, 2020, which is a bit of a puzzle. We will try to uh, to explain what drive this correlation. What did Bitcoin start, seems to start behaving like a tech stock? So key takeaway uh, of uh, this paper is that the retail investor drive the correlation. How do we discuss this? We start with a very, very simple toy model. That's not a contribution. That's just a way to formalize the arguments uh, that show that uh, without fundamental driver, an informed investor trading can generate uh, a correlation. And we discuss, we have an extension of the model that allows us to discuss what could happen if the market's integrated. That's the more important, interesting con contribution, but that's only... Uh, if I somehow manage to not uh, eat up times. Uh, so then we empirically show that uh, retail investor uh, traded crypto and classical asset at the same time. So we see that what they tend to do is they tend to wake up in the morning and if they're in a good mood, they go and buy stock and buy crypto. If they're in a bad mood, they go and they sell both assets. So this creates some kind of price pressure as we will discuss. Uh, this behavior started in March 2020 at the same time as the equity correlation. We can show that empirically and uh, appeared with higher cor correlation and assets with um, that are favored by uh, these traders tend to uh, exhibit a stronger pattern of correlation. So here's the agenda for the rest of the talk. First, we will discuss the toy model and formalize it a bit. Uh, second, we will present our novel data set, clearly the strongest point of the paper. Uh, and uh, then we will discuss the uh, two-step of empirical evidence. So I'm supposed to have this crash course on Kyle for people who don't know it. Of course, I can assume that most people here are familiar, but so just the, the, the intuition is a model about uh, information. You have an asset uh, with a fundamental value that is determined by some law, here yeah, normal law. And you have three agents, uh, the informed agents who happen to know the price of the asset, the uninformed agents that is basically moving randomly, and uh, the market maker who observed the total order flow of both the uninformed and the informed agents. And he tried to guess which fractions came from the uh, informed agents to try to uh, adjust the price accordingly. And this is a sequential equilibrium that uh, is solved in most good PhD program anyway, uh, and uh, which arrived with this very simple uh, equation that most people know I will not spend too much time um, on this. In our extension, we propose a version where we have two assets with three strong assumptions, which we believe describe reality. So we have two risky assets, the stocks and the cryptocurrencies. And big assumption number one, the fundamental value aren't correlated. So I give this little speech about my personal belief on the lack of fundamental value, uh, but the paper itself is agnostic to this fact. We just need the two assets to have uncorrelated fundamental value, which is a fairly undisputed point at this stage, at least. We have two market makers. So that's a very key uh, point uh, right now, which is, again, reflecting reality. It's very different agents that will operate in both markets. Uh, and uh, this is the bonus if we have time. We show that when we relax this assumption, which will be a good way to think of what will happen if market matures, uh, something very uh, unintuitive happens. And we have uninformed uh, investor who trade in both assets. We'll discuss after that in the data how we can motivate, uh, motivate this assumption. Uh, and uh, there is some kind of correlation between their order flow. So equation wise, this is like this. So now, uh, the uh, fundamental value of the asset, you see the important point is that they have no correlation. So you have the zero in the diagonal matrix. Uh, this is assumption one. Uh, you have uh, assumption three is the row in the correlation matrix uh, of the uh, uninformed trading volume. So that's the degree of correlation uh, that you have between the two assets, uh, between the trading volume of the uninformed agents. And as we said, the market makers, they're individual, so they don't observe the big vector X, they observe just one of the two, two different agents. 
If you solve it, it's fairly trivial to solve. The equation looks very similar to what we've seen before. The key point is this. So the main model prediction is fairly simple. If you observe a correlation between the price of the two assets, this implies a correlation uh, in the order flow. This a row that goes in the same direction. So if you observe a positive correlation in the asset, you must observe a positive correlation in the order flow. Then we have some side prediction that comes from the reality of the data, uh, which is that this uh, should at some point uh, start in March 2020. We should observe a stronger price correlation when the crypto retail investor are more active. So this is on the assumption that this is very much validated by our summary statistics as well as the literature uh, that retail investors are on average not exactly informed. They tend to lose a lot of money. Uh, and uh, observing um, that uh, this correlation is stronger on the particular assets that are favored by crypto investors. So those are all the prediction of the models that obviously if I list here is that I strongly believe I can defend in the data. So moving to the data, they, in Switzerland with this bank called Swissco, it's a fairly old bank, it's a, a survivor of the dot-com bubble. Uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, actually a very Swiss story. It's a, it's a guy who was an engineer his whole life, and when he retired, decided to start a bank, which is hard to make a more Swiss story than this. Uh, and uh, it has a lot of success. It's the main bank used by people if they want to trade directly their, 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 their money. And they have a particularity that, to the extent of our knowledge, is absolutely unique, which is that uh, because of some practical in the Swiss law, they, ob they offer to the client cryptocurrency wallet directly. So that means in the same data sets, we have agents trading a part of their wealth and they can put money in traditional uh, assets and cryptocurrency. So you can observe for what they substituted, you can observe everything. Uh, and uh, thanks to uh, mutual friends of uh, Fabio and I, and in Malamud, uh, we were able to be put in contact uh, with these people who were uh, generous enough to offer the data at the time. I say at the time because now the CEO is very pissed at me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because he validated, well, a guy validated the paper and they, they, everybody was unhappy. And then the Financial Times took my summary stats and wrote a paper called uh, Crypto Casino Confirmed, <laughs> which was cited heavily online. Uh, the guy got fired, the guy who validated my paper, and they don't want me to have access to the data anymore. But they still are okay with me publishing it. So at least I came out okay. <laughs> So if we move to some rest, you will maybe understand why I cannot set foot in this bank and uh, why, <laughs> while uh, the poor guy who validated the stuff is now fired. Uh, we they give us a, subsample, a random subsample of clients, 77,000 uh, between 2017 and 2020. Uh, and we split the sample in two. We define an agent as crypto oriented if at some point in the uh, whole um, trading period we have, the agent has at least 1% of his wealth or at least assets in Swiss courts uh, invested in crypto. And you can see the summary set for the two groups. So first thing to note is that uh, Switzerland is a rich country uh, and Swiss court is an old bank. So it's not exactly what you would expect on the typical Robin Hood traders. The agents are fairly uh, old with a median age, uh, I mean age of 54. Uh, and they have a uh, amount of money that will look uh, incredibly high to anybody who hasn't visited Switzerland and see the price of a coffee. Uh, the um, split uh, between the two is also what you would expect. So the sample is heavily male, uh, as is well known in the literature. Those people uh, may like to trade a bit more. They tend to overvalue their skills as a trader. And uh, the crypto-oriented people are similar to the image of the crypto bro you have. They're younger, they're more male, uh, and they're slightly less uh, wealthy. Uh, and if you look at the average volatility of their portfolios, they're also less risk averse or at least in the real stuff. So now we can move to the uh, empirics and what we want to uh, to see in the data. So the first stuff we do is we take as a dependent variable the stock turnover. So that is in a, in a given month, the amount of uh, the, the total trading volume of a given agent. And uh, we divide that by the uh, mean value of his equities uh, in uh, during the month. And uh, on the other side, we have a boolean to say whether or not he is a crypto user at this stage. So if at some point he's a crypto user and then he goes down a bit, we still consider him a crypto user, but that's for a very small portion of the sample. Uh, we have the crypto turnover. So that's defined exactly as the stock turnover, the bank asset as a control, as well as uh, the investor and time fix effects. So that's a staggered different if setup, but obviously being a crypto user is highly endogenous. So we don't claim uh, causality here, just correlation. We do a few, a few um, 
a few configuration. And if I can direct your attention to the last column, um, I, we have here uh, the most interesting, um, well, the, the, the interesting the results we wanted, let's say. So first, if you look at the Boolean, you have a negative coefficient that is highly statistically significant of 37%. So that means that when an agent here starts trading crypto, he starts to become less active on equity. So there's some kind of substitution of attention. And we'll see we have some other numbers to back out this story that they start to be less focused. The second number, which is the most important one, uh, is the crypto turnover. Yes, they trade less on that day, uh, but uh, there is... Um, uh, they, they trade less as soon as they start doing crypto, but on any day where they trade a lot of crypto, they also trade a lot of the other assets. So there is a positive correlation between the activity of a month in one asset class and the other one. Uh, or at least a correlation. We'll show after that that it's uh, it's indeed positive. Uh, as a small anecdote, if you look at the um, coefficient on number five, and the, you see that here it's positive, which is a good puzzle I want to put to my students uh, to understand regression. Why Why is this coefficient positive? Uh, and it's obviously because it's endogenous in, in this column, we don't control for the client fixed effects. So those people trade on average more and this is captured by this, uh, this coefficient. Now to keep, uh, to, 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 to add some argument to our story about attentions, we now define a new variable which is a percentage of short-term trade. So we define a short-term trade as, as anything that is at least half reversed in the next, in the month. So I take a hundred position, hundred stock in Apple and I sell them at least half of them in the next month, that's will be defined as a short-term position. And we see that when you become a crypto user, this diminishes again. So the idea is that once you start trading crypto, uh, your attention move from your classical favorite stock to trade, probably Tesla, uh, to, um, to this. There is then a very uh, funny side results, which I think is the main reason the CEO doesn't want to talk to me anymore. Uh, which is the one that uh, the financial time liked, which is that, as we know from the literature, these people are bad at trading uh, and they tend to lose money when they're active. So there's a nice side bonus of starting to get into cryptocurrency is that you don't touch your uh, assets, uh, your, your equity again. So what we have here on the left-hand side of the regression is the uh, sharp ratio of uh, the agent's portfolio excluding the crypto. So we look at your portfolio, we renormalize it, we assume that you're all wealth and you do all the control we need to do. And what you see is that when they start uh, trading um, cryptocurrencies, the sharp ratio increase significantly on the total asset on average by uh, 0.15. And uh, that's because they stop uh, believing they're very smart and timing the markets and uh, therefore they are doing better. So that's obviously not exactly a great ad for Swisscode, uh, which is making money on fee every time somebody trades. Uh, all right, so these numbers for us show that there is some kind of substitution in the mind of the retail investors. There's this switch uh, from assumptions uh, for attention and their trading seems to be correlated, which is our assumption number three. So we're very happy about it. But then we need, because we observe a positive correlation, we need to check that uh, this is indeed uh, a positive correlation. It's not a, some kind of rebalancing wealth. No. So, Sorry, I, I, I move a bit fast. Please slow me down if there's a problem uh, or anything is unclear. So now we have on the um, on the left hand side the net uh, trading volume in stock. So positive um, positive uh, number of dollars bought in stock minus negative, uh, and uh, we look at uh, the correlation between that and the positive. So crypto pose is uh, when they buy cryptocurrency and crypto neg is when they sell it. And you see that on the, all the configurations we can do, we have the numbers in the right side, which is that again, they tend to buy both asset class or sell both asset class on uh, the same given uh, time period. Which still doesn't explain this result because if this happens since forever, why does the correlation only start now? The argument is that retail trading boomed uh, during March 2020 and during COVID. So if uh, you look at this graph, this is the correlation between the net volume in stock and the net volume in crypto weighted by uh, the total vo the volume over the period. So it's multiplied by the volume on that period divided by the sum of the volume over the four years. And you can see that if you do this rough measure, uh, you will see that there's basically no uh, no trading volume in, uh, on these particular assets outside of 2020 and it suddenly jump, uh, which is consistent with uh, prediction too. Now, as we are economists, just saying, oh, this happened is not a satisfying answer. We want to understand why. 
And uh, again, it's a story of liquidity and attention. So what happened in 2020, uh, especially in March 2020, well, COVID lockdowns everywhere. In practice, lockdown didn't mean people went bankrupt right away. It's also mean people got received cash and had no way to spend it. So there's some interesting in the paper we cite. I'm sorry, I have a bad memory right now, so I'm not sure which one is which. But uh, there's uh, some uh, some studies showing that when the um, the uh, check signed by Mr. Trump, the one point two thousand dollar check, uh, arrived home, you can see order of the blo in the blockchain following them of exactly one point two thousand and a lot of them. So a lot of people just took this money and directly invested it into crypto. Because what happened, you stock at home, the government sent you money, in Switzerland it was partial unemployment, in the US it was direct checks, and you have essentially no way to, um, to, uh, to, to spend it. So you can invest it, and you also have a lot of time on your hand. You have a lot of liquidity, a lot of time, uh, and you uh, go and become active. One last um, summary stat that showed this attention story and argue in favor. This is for more data. This is the uh, median number of login uh, in, any, in any given month. Uh, for the uh, agency return investor at Swissquote. And you can see that it's multiplied by almost you know, 1.5 after the, uh, the event. So people are stuck at home and they spend more time on their uh, favorite trading app, or in the case of Switzerland, the only one legally available. Now, we want to check uh, the last prediction we made with our model, which is that if this is the case, uh, it should happen a bit more on stock that are favored by uh, the um, by the retail investors. What do we do? We take all the stock, the 3,000 most traded stock, US stock in the period. So if you look at what Swiss code people do, they have a strong US bias despite being uh, Swiss. So they do trade a few Swiss assets, but the majority of the trading is actually on, uh, on US assets. We rank the stock depending on the relative uh, weight uh, of the crypto trader. So we, we look at uh, the, basically the per preference, how much these people like to train it, only at the one that like on the one that like crypto. And we rank this uh, in five quintile. So how do you read this table? You have from left to right the quintile of least favorite, most favorite by the crypto trader. Uh, and you have the industries of the stock, and I sum the um, the total, so it go to 100%. You can see that uh, there is some kind of trend. It's not exactly smooth and linear, but a bit across quintile, and they seem to prefer uh, technology uh, in overall, of course, but even a bit more for the for the high quintile, healthcare and consumer. So technology, why? Because if you are crypto nerds, you tend to uh, like uh, tech in general. You can view it as some kind of, you know, to some extent, uh, when you speculate on crypto, you speculate on buying a technology. You believe in the future of a technology. To some extent, it's not that different to buy a, into Tesla. Uh, if you, uh, uh, why healthcare? Well, healthcare, it was during the time of COVID. So vaccine were no news. That's what the big attention. And the last big one is consumer discretionary because that's what these people know about. They buy Coca-Cola because that's a product they understand. Uh, they won't necessarily go into utilities. In general, they tend to, to like value stock. Uh, sorry, growth stock. So what we do is now this regression where we have on the left-hand side, a correlation, the correlation between an individual asset and the Bitcoin. And uh, we run this regression on a few control and the total volume of Bitcoin. So that's the overall volume of Bitcoin. Uh, and we do it for every quintile. And we have a bit of a trend where you see that the parameter is uh, growing uh, across quintile, but it's not exactly uh, neat, which is actually good because a nice story, a nice contrast story you can tell us is oh it's all about uh, retail uh, about institution actually it's not about retail investor it's institutions that got into the game and started to do this trading. That's possible, but that's hard to reconcile with this last result. So here we run the same regression, but we have two volume of Bitcoin. We have the volume of uh, all the uh, Bitcoins, um, the overall volume on. Uh, on the blockchain, and we have the volume of the Bitcoin from Swiss code, which we know is from retail investors. And you can see that uh, most of the predictive power is captured by uh, the uh, volume at Swiss code. And we have now a nice linear uh, growth of the coefficient across quintile, which means that the effect of um, the, the causation of or correlation of, cor of correlation here uh, is stronger for the stocks that are preferred by uh, the uh, the retail investors. So here you have just a, a graphical visualization mm -hmm. of these uh, main results. And this is consistent with prediction three and four. So 
empirical summary, this is what we show in, in the data. The cryptocurrency captured the attention of retail investor and drove it away from, uh, from the equity. Retail investor trade the same asset in the two in the same direction. So that's the main role we had in the model. We can we can see it. Uh, we can see that there is a change in behavior in March 2020, which is not necessary that this correlation started to be stronger or anything, but the volume jumped, uh, and uh, the effect uh, is stronger uh, on um, on stock that are preferred by crypto investors. So now, because uh, I managed to do something nobody else did today, which is finished before. Uh, I think, yeah. The previous session was awesome. Ah, you're right, you're right. Everybody is tired, including the presenters, so that's fine. Uh, so the, um, the, the last idea is what happened when we uh, relax this assumption. So this result that sounds trivial when we discuss the theory model, where we say, oh, look, if you have the positive uh, noise, voice noise correlation in the noise trading, this should induce into some kind of correlation with a model of price pressure. It's actually not clear because we're not in a model of price pressure with a model of information. So trading volume of an informed is only something that affects price in the sense that it allows an inform, uh, informed agents to hide bad. So what happens uh, if the uh, market become integrated? That is, if there's one market maker that is trading both assets and therefore has the full information set. So you can see the math is still fairly trivial. Uh, and uh, basically the effect is reversed. So if you have a positive correlation uh, of the uninformed volume, this will create a negative correlation uh, in the asset. And the intuition is fairly easy to get. Uh, if um, I'm a, a market maker trying to guess if there is some informed trade uh, on the um, on, on my asset, on, on the stock, I can look, oh, there's a high volume on crypto today. That means there's a large number of noise. So that helps me estimate the number of, the amount of noise on the, on the second, um, the second volume, uh, which therefore could in theory mean that uh, while our paper is uh, fairly um, skeptical about uh, cryptocurrency as a diversification tool, at least, uh, this is not necessarily the, the forecast of the paper in the long term. Uh, and uh, those, uh, those are the main takeaways that I just sum up, so I will not necessarily repeat them. Uh, and that is it. Thank you very much for your attention and your patience to say this late. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. And the discussion is Julian Pratt. Thank you. So I'm gonna I'm gonna be fast on huh? the uh, the way the slide. They're they're coming up. Version. Did I send you version? Um, Thank you. So that's all being done by distance. So let's see. Ah, uh, it's not you. Okay, I send them. So, just from the Gmail. So I think it's good. The Gmail automatically. Automatically ah, okay. behind the glass. Okay. <laughs> okay. I sent a version like five minutes ago. Ten minutes ago. Five minutes ago. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. All right. So let's be let's be fast. So okay. So the advantage of um, having selecting your paper for the price is that I can say I like it without <laughs> without being sounding funny. You know, like I'm credible on that, which also means I can be tough with the discussion. I guess. So the motivation of the paper is, uh, so it was very clear is that Bitcoin has emerged as a um, new class of new investment, uh, new kind of asset for institutional investor. And one of the rationale for that is that you can diversify your portfolio uh, by putting some crypto, especially some Bitcoin in it, right? And first your paper claims that it's not true anymore. So that's the first thing that, okay, that's, that's known, but, uh, Okay, you, you work on it. And but what's what's maybe not that known is that there is a clear break. And the second thing is that you offer an explanation, which is based on retail investors trading strategy, which run counter to the um, common wisdom where it was more like, okay, now you have an institutional investor coming in and you get correlation. And actually you say it's not no, it's not that. It's you know, like these retail investors are correlating their trade and it creates some correlation. So it's based on the Kyle's model, which is maybe the most famous model in you know, micro market structure for one of the two or three classical models. Uh, let me, uh, a quick refresher on Cal's model for those who are not familiar. So you have in, uninformed retail traders that submit random market orders. So they, they don't make sense. They're just purely noise traders. Then you have one informed trader that observes the fundamental value and some, submit the optimal order, taking into account the impact of his order on the market price. And then you have a market maker with rational, okay? Competitive, so maybe because it's maybe it's, it's, 
I mean, it's facing competition, so he used competition. He sets the optimal price given the information revealed by the sum of the order flow. So the problem of the market maker is that he's facing a signal extraction problem. He doesn't know what is coming from the informed guy and from the noise guy, noise traders. Okay, so that's the general model. Now, to this model, you had three assumptions. The fundamental value of the stocks and Bitcoin are uncorrelated uh, because basically Bitcoin uh, yeah, moves around for whatever reason that has nothing to do with anything else, which we will debate later on. Uh, second, market making in crypto and traditional finance are segmented. It's very important. So like the information on the crypto market and on the standard market, they are not correlated. They can, okay, so the market makers, they operate in separate worlds, totally separate. And then the trading flow in, for investors are correlated uh, in some ways because they engage in cross asset trading. So they might be negatively correlated or positively correlated. Right now, for so both stories are possible. Now, what is interesting is that you will observe covariance between the market and, and Bitcoin prices only if the correlation of the uninformed traders or their flow is positive. Okay. So then the point of the paper is okay, we have this. Now let's test it. And we, so because if it, we, it could have been negative and we'll have negative correlation between the price. So let's test if, if we can see that in the data. So first, let me give you the intuition. Intuition is super simple. That's the price, let's say, of the standard the stock market. That's the price of Bitcoin. You can see that U1 and U2 are the order of the noise trader. You can see they are linear in this order. Why? Because in both markets, they cannot tell what is X1 and X2 are informed trading. So when X1 is higher, the price should go up because it reveals positive information about the stock. But you cannot tell when you are the market maker. So you're going to put less weight that if you could on X1 that if you could separate it, but which means you'll go also put a little bit of the same weight on U1. So the two prices are, if the noise traders, they have correlation between their trades. So U1 is correlated with U2. You see that the prices are correlated because the market maker cannot tell whether it's positive information about their assets. That's it, no? Am I fair enough? That's the idea, which is nice. I mean, cool, nice explanation. Uh, what I find a bit strange, a very stupid comment. You don't discuss this intuition at the point where you derive it in the paper. I might be wrong, but so I think just say it when you do it, not like a few pages after. And then the nice part is that then you went to Swiss code data, which are unique because you have data on a, from the same people, data on crypto and traditional market, which is not so easy to get. Uh, given the story of the guy who gave it to you, I think it's going to be even harder now. And uh, and and then you have this, so you have this nice graph. You see that the correlation jump up. Okay, and it ups, it's happening exactly at the same time in your data where these guys start to correlate their trade. That's kind of striking. Uh, it's very convincing. And uh, actually, another stupid comment: you don't plot it like this in your paper. You plot first. You you don't put these two graphs side by side. So it's, and I think, I mean, you, I think it's more striking like this than the way you do it in just presentation. Then you have a story. What is the story? We had a lockdown. So people had time to start playing, as you know, in a way. And they had money also because they, they had a stimulus and they were locked at home and they didn't know what to do with this money. Okay. And so you have this shock and then this correlation and then suddenly, okay. So they start to trade, uh, to use this money to play on both markets. And now, given your model, it should correlate the two assets. So I'm not going to discuss uh, the econometrics. Okay, so let me, yes, on fundamental value. So you said Bitcoin has no fundamental value or what? Not really. But then you say you have informed traders. So just a stupid question. What are they informed about? The equity. The? The equity. Yes, but they also have, you also have an X2 on the Bitcoin market, no? Sure, but I don't have the parameters. So you can measure. Yeah. Okay, so that's one thing I will... Very stupid question, but you know, there's no fundamental. What is, yeah, but I mean, yeah, okay, we can talk about it, but yeah, because if it's only noise trading, it doesn't make sense either. But and then the model, so I'm not going to bug you with like identification. You talked about it, there are clear issues with uh, you said they pay more, more attention, but maybe they pay more attention because they are making more money. I don't know, okay, uh, because the price went through the roof. But uh, I'm sure the referee will, uh, will ask you all this stuff. Uh, so one thing you could avoid, like to get, one thing you could do is you calibrate your model, no? Like really take your model seriously and go structural. And, uh, and maybe you could say, what do I need as a change in my model? Because your model is simple to generate the structural break. And is the change in parameters realistic or just crazy? So I think maybe you could take your model more seriously, not seriously, but like, you know, 
test it directly instead of having like reduced form equation to test it. I don't know. I mean, it's a suggestion. And could you have a, now can you, because you said there is no fundamental factor driving Bitcoin. I'm, I'm debating that. So I'm not sure it's true. One story could be that there was a fundamental factor driving both that change around that time. And I can think COVID appeared. Maybe people were anticipating uh, a big uh, stimulus from the central banks. The interest rate were clearly going down and both being risky assets. Their value went up together and they became correlated. So can you use your model to disentangle the two? Maybe not, but a structural approach will help you in that direction. Okay. And then, okay, for the funny, the more like, say, let's get to it, the more interesting part, the more. <laughs> so Bitcoin or not Bitcoin. So you are very skeptical about Bitcoin. So you have, uh, and which is fine. I mean, I mean, uh, I am too, to be honest. So, which is fine. Uh, so, but you have statement maybe that goes a little bit too far. So here yeah, you said that Bitcoin is the first large scale application of decentralized certification algorithm. I mean, this, this is really on not being proper, uh, this is too weak because Arbor and Storneta is not decentralized, just, just keeping track of a database. So it's it's not, Bitcoin is, is really a breakthrough. So for instance, that's, I don't, this I think is really undervaluing what Bitcoin is in scientifically. And then you said the only source of fundamental value is that it's a means of payment for illegal transaction, which some people defend, but I, they can be other stories, okay? Uh, like a store of value, uh, digital gold or whatever. And uh, so you have this statement, which are, well, okay, that's just subjective. But this one, maybe not, we can discuss about that. But where I get, where I think it's more problematic is about two things. First, your last section says that if the market maker become rational, the correlation would become negative. So you conclude like this, and which is precisely contradicting your main point, right? In a way. So um, isn't it, so when you say it's the end of it, we don't know. And so for instance, so can I click, can you click on the last link? Maybe you can do it. So, okay, so, uh, so when you say it's the end, so that's what I'm debating about whether it's the end or not. It might, your period, I agree with your story, but it might be a very specific, can you go down, a very specific period. And actually, go down, there is a graph here. So you have a graph that I just found in the press. So I think you stop around here, no? March, can you go down a little bit so that we see the date? You know, where, yes, you stop around here, no? So maybe not, I need to see the full graph. Then. I don't know. <laughs> like, yeah, thank you. I think you stop around here, no? March 22, which is kind of the peak, and now it went down again. So it's true, your story, I think, might, I think is probably true. Whether at the end of it, uh, it's debatable, okay? Because I think in the last period, what we have seen is that people have perceived Bitcoin as an edge against the risk in the banking sector. So, yeah, so I will be careful in extrapolating and saying it will never become less correlated in the future. But, mm -hmm. Thank you. Antoine, you have uh, five minutes to uh, add, respond and answer some questions. So, uh, a quick answer. First, thanks a lot for the great, uh, great, uh, great discussion. I think a lot of the point, especially the, the structural one, is a great one. Uh, disentangling between uh, this uh, fundamental value or not, and perhaps fundamental being a better angle, is probably a very good direction to think about. Uh, now, for as you said, for the fun part. Uh, on the uh, value of crypto, my point is there might be some fundamental value, but it's buried until a billion of speculation. So, for example, if you look at what happened uh, to cryptocurrency during the downfall of Sam Bankman Fried and the explosion of the uh, of the whole exchange, it went up. The, the 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 movements just on an anecdotal basis doesn't look correlated with what should be fundamental value. Uh, if you take the, 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 this graph, for example, sadly, I'm, I'm personal non grad at Swiss code, but my bet is that the trading volume is going down because now you have inflation tightening up. People are, for the same reason, people are canceling their Netflix account. They're probably canceling their crypto, you know, speculation, these kind of purely uninformed uh, agents. Uh, you're completely right to point out that the, the end of the paper is a direct contradiction to the main message. And the specific points uh, you made about the sense of 
I think I have no counter argument. We clearly went too far here. It's, uh, you know, Obias coming in. I will correct the writing. Thank you very much for pointing it out. Um, I think a, a, a slightly more nuanced message will be more correct. Um, our paper only need the true assumption we need is that there is no collation in the fundamental value. And I think here the hurdle is on the opponent of to my idea to come up with at least an hypothesis of why it will be correlated. Uh, so far, I haven't heard any convincing idea because all the the fundamental value that are put forward by the agents or by, by the defender of it uh, should be uncorrelated. The last point I will make is that to me, it's the end of the myth of the crypto correlation because even if it goes down again, the fact that something as fickle as the habits of people bored on the internet can give correlation to your asset makes it a bad edge. If I told you gold has you know, stable value, unless people stop brushing their teeth, then it falls to the ground. You will not have as much gold in your portfolio. I think to me, the fact that this can happen should already be an argument against putting it as an edge for your S&P 500 in your portfolio. Even if it's not the case anymore, it can clearly happen again. So you need that big burden of proof that it will not happen again before we'll start trusting it as an asset class, or at least as a diversification asset class, a diversification to the S&P. So two minutes for questions. Okay, let's go left to right then, I guess. Sure. So I guess I'm more coming from the So when I think about diversification, I really think about is this thing and how I can diversify the space. So perhaps I missed that in the presentation. I was wondering if you actually look at the correlation uh, depending on what kind of weight you go. Large cap, small cap, high cap. Um, so you think about the differentiation because you could argue that it's not correlated with the large cap and that's correlated with large cap. So on, on on the 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 first comment, sorry, the memory for goldfish. Uh, this uh, oh yeah, uh, so the the, the the more Nasdaq effect. Actually, we have the results showing that it's not the case, and we we didn't show it uh, because we wanted a straightforward story, and we computed it actually, hoping to see that they they, they did have a stronger correlation. So there's a bit of it across the quintile that we make up here, but there is not a clean cut across industry or across any any pattern. So uh, we can probably bring that result back. Uh, in a way to argue that this is indeed a, a full anti-diversification effect. The risk on risk off, I, I simply didn't think of it. I think it's a good idea uh, on how to, to, to sell a bit more economics around this narrative. So thank you. I, I really like it. So we, have, we are out of time, but there are many questions. So if there is only one line questions, <laughs> okay, so not more than one line questions, I then think the I would like you to, at the very beginning. would you collect them? Okay, but really only one line questions. If it's more, then we leave it to a discussion. Okay. Small discrepancy. One line. I'm not, <laughs> one line. Against, I have nothing against Swiss code um, data or against Swiss code, but if I would have done the exercise, I would have gone across the on-chain data and really identified what are retail and non-retail wallets. Then again, the fact is that if you're a Swiss retail investor, yeah. you invest in. You, you may mention the stat statement that you invest in American stocks. Yeah. If you invest in the SME, you're investing in Nestle, and there is no wall there. So the, no, no Swiss investor will only invest in the SME. They've been invest, everybody. Sure. Yeah. So that that's essentially is I think a moot point. And another thing is that that is not a one line question. Eh? <laughs> I'm sorry, Adam, because it's, we also need it's to a take very long line. Questions. Okay. So okay. we we'll, we go to the next one. <laughs> it's, it's qualified. <laughs> I warned you before. <laughs> <laughs> All right, We're counting uh, the words. So I'm uh, I'm pre warned. All right, all right. <laughs> no, uh, uh, basically two things. So the 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 question was that don't, don't worry, That's I suspicious. keep it in a one liner. <laughs> <laughs> the question was simply if the stocks you are observing, which are correlated with that, would be meme stocks, uh, stocks, right? Because they're also going cross industries, and that would for me absolutely make sense if we see their correlation, because that are these 
type of assets to go for that. And then the remark I had was then uh, basically about your model, because there's a recent paper by Patterson, which looks at a, at a kind of a theoretical model, how to model, um, how to look at social media users. And uh, this we can probably discuss after the session ends, so that yeah. I'm not breaking the rule. So the the the, the, the Peterson paper, I actually don't know it. I will be very happy to to have a look at it. Thank you very much. Uh, the uh, other question, fucking goldfish memory. I'm sorry. <laughs> In stocks. Meme stocks. Thank you very much. Uh, so the um, the meme stock, we actually looked into it. Uh, the 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 early version of the paper was something a bit different, where we tried to see uh, to disqualify one by one the line of what people claim the asset was for and what they do. So we look, you know, people say it's gold. Do they trade it as gold and this kind of stuff? Uh, but the, the 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 reaction to this paper was very mild, so we we changed it to this. Uh, but to, at this stage, we checked the meme stock and we didn't see any big correlation there. Uh, between uh, between those meme stocks. That uh, that being said, when did meme stocks start to be a real big thing? Oh, sorry, I'm going to be disqualified too. No oh. discussion. <laughs> All right. Can we have Fabio for the last one? Super short. Uh, that's, oh, you mean because of that's um, a fantastic one line question. That is a one line question. That's a great one. Oh, but I don't see the. Because if you plug the number to to one, it's going to go to. Uh... Sure. Yeah. No. No. You're right. Yeah. 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 No. I see the formula. You're right. Uh, true. Or to be fair, it's to go back. It implies that from noise trader alone, this is the maximum that can happen. Yeah. yeah. Sure. And again, back to the uh, structural angle and uh, and try to have a more rigorous approach to this. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> if I give up my yeah, ideology, I can't get around it. That's the idea. No, no, you're right. I, I, I'm joking, but that's a very good point. Thank you very much. Yeah. Perfect. So, <laughs> so yeah, this is. Uh, I would like to end it here. Thank you very much. I appreciate. I, I really don't want to cut this, you know, but it's kind of also my job, so I cut it. So I will leave the rest to Lorenzo. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthias, for the, being a great chair.